Chapter Twenty Five of *The Side of the Angels* by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty Five. But after Lois had gone, Rosie came to life again. That is, she entered once more the conditions in which her mind was free to tread its round of grief. Lois kept her out of them. Her father and mother did the same. Household duties, the task of the hothouse, and the necessity for eating and sleeping and speaking, did the same. She turned from them all, with a weariness as consuming as a sickness unto death. She had done so from the instant when, crouching behind the vines of the cucumber-house, with all her senses strained, she perceived by the mere rustling of the leaves that Claude was making his way down the long green aisle. She knew then that it was the end. If there had been no other cause of rupture between them, the girl who kept ten or twelve servants would have created it. Rosie knew enough of Claude to be aware that love could not bear down the scale against this princeliness of living. There would be no such repentance and reaction on his part as she had experienced with Thor. Once he was gone, he was gone. It was the end. The soft opening and closing of the hothouse door as he went out reached her like a sigh, a last sigh, a dying sigh, after which nothing. Rosie expected nothing, but she waited. She waited as watchers wait round a deathbed for the possibility of one more breath, but none came. She stirred then and rose. She rose mechanically, brushing the earth from her clothing, and began again the interrupted task of picking the superfluous female flowers and letting them flutter downward. It was when she had come to the end of her third row, and was about to turn into the fourth, that the sense of the impossibility of going on swept over her. "'Oh, I can't!' She dropped her arms to her side. "'I can't! I can't!' She meant only that she couldn't go on just then. But in the back of her mind there was the conviction that she would never go on again. She continued to stand with her arms hanging and head drooped to one side, closed in by vines, with flowers of the hue of light around her like a halo, and bees murmuring among them. It was not merely that she was listless and incapable. The world seemed to have dropped away. She was marooned on a rock, with an ocean of nothingness about her. Everything she wanted had gone, sunk, vanished. It, it had come within sight, like mirage to the shipwrecked, only to torture her with what she couldn't have. It was worse than it had never shown itself at all. Love had appeared with one man, money with the other. Love and money were two of the three things she cared for. The poor, shiftless family was the third. Since the first two had gone, the last must follow them. Quite consciously and deliberately, Rosie lifted her hands with a little lamentable effort, letting them drop again, and so renounced her burden. She crept back to the spot where she had risen, and lay down. There was a kind of ritual in the act. It was not now a mere stricken physical crouching, as when she had turned away from Claude. It was something more significant. It was withdrawal from work, from life, from all the demands she had put forth so fiercely. Renouncing these, Rosie also renounced Claude. It was a proof of the degree to which she had dismissed him, that, when, a half-hour later, she heard a rustling in the vines behind her, it never occurred to her that he might have come back. She knew already that he would never come back. The fatalism of her little soul left her none of those uncertainties which are safeguards against despair. She raised her head and looked, but she saw exactly the person she knew she would see. Antonio grinned and announced dinner. The sight of his young mistress, half-sitting, half lying on the ground, struck him as droll. Rosie got up and brushed herself again. She knew it must be dinner-time. The fact had been at the back of her mind all through these minutes of comforting negation. But she should have been in the house laying the table while her mother cooked the meal. It was the first time in years that she had rebelled against a duty. It was not exactly rebellion now. It was something more serious than that. She realised it as she stood where she was, with hands hanging limply, and said to herself, I've quit. Nevertheless, she emerged slowly from the jungle of vines, 
and followed Antonio down the long, rustling aisle. There was a compulsion in the day's routine to which she felt the necessity of yielding. She had traversed half the length of the greenhouse before it came to her that it was precisely to the day's routine that she couldn't return. Anything was better than that. Any fate was preferable to the round of cooking and cleaning and seed-time and harvest, of which every detail was impregnated with the ambitions she had given up. She had lived through these tasks, and beyond them, out into something else, into a great emptiness in which her spirit found a kind of ease. She could no more go back to then than the released soul could go back to earth. In the yard, she stood looking at the poor, battered old house. Inside, her father, who had probably by this time returned from town, would be sitting down to table. Antonio, to save the serving of two sets of meals, would be sitting down with him. Her mother would be bringing something from the kitchen, holding a hot platter with a corner of her apron. If she went in, her mother would sit down too, while she herself would do the running to and fro between the table and the pantry or the stove. She would snatch a bite for herself in the intervals of attendance. Rosie revolted. She revolted not against the drudgery which was part of the matter of course of living, unless one kept a girl. She revolted against the living itself. It was all over for her. In proof that it was, she turned her back on it. Her moving away was at first without purpose, if her feet strayed into the familiar path that ran down the hill between the hothouses and the apple-trees, it was because there was no other direction to take. She hadn't meant to go up through the wood to Duck Rock before she found herself doing it. The newly leafing oaks were a shimmer of bronze green above her, while she trod on young ferns that formed a carpet such as was never woven by hands. Into it were worked white star-flowers without number, with an occasional nodding trillium. The faint, bitter scent of green things too tender as yet to be pungent rose from everything she crushed. She was not soothed by nature, like Thor Masterman. She had too much to do with the raising of plants for sale to take much interest in what the earth produced without money and without price. If it had not been that her mind was as nearly as possible empty of thought, she wouldn't have paused to watch an indigo bunting, whose little brown mate was probably nearby, hop upward from branch to branch of a solitary juniper, his body like a blue flower in the dark boughs, while he poured forth a song that waxed louder as he mounted. She observed him idly, and passed onward, because there was nothing but that to do. Her heart was too dead to feel much emotion when she emerged on the spot where she had been accustomed to keep her trysts with Claude. Her trysts with Claude had been at night, she had other sorts of association with this summit in the daytime. All her life she'd been used to come here burying. Here she came to with Polly Wilson and other girlfriends, when she had any, for strolls and gossiping. Here, too, Jim Breen had made love to her, and Matt's companion of the grocery. The spot being therefore not wholly dedicated to memories of Claude, she could approach it calmly. She sat down on the familiar seat that circled the oak tree and gave the best view over the pond. The oak tree was the last and highest of the wood. Beyond it there was only an upward-climbing fringe of grass, starred with sunkfoil and wild strawberry, and then the precipice. It was but a miniature precipice that broke to a miniature sea, but it gave an impression of grandeur. Sitting on the bench, with one's head against the oak, one could, if one chose, see nothing but sky and water. There was nothing but sky and water and air. In the noon stillness there was not even a boat on the lake, nor a bird on the wing. The only sounds were those of a hammering far over on the thorny estate, the humming of an electric car, which at this distance was no more disturbing than the murmur of a bee, and the song of the indigo bunting, fluting now from the treetop. To Rosie it was peace, peace without pleasure, but without pain, as nearly as might be that absorption into nothingness for which she yearned as the Buddhist seeps absorption into God. She rested, not suffering, at least not suffering anything she could feel. She was beyond grief. The only thing she was not beyond 
was the horror of returning to the interests that had hitherto made up life. As for Claude, she could think of him, when she began doing so, with singular detachment. The whole episode with him might have been ended years before. It was like something which no longer perturbs, though the memory of it is vivid. She could go back and reconstruct the experience from the first. Up to the present she had never found any opportunity of doing that, since each meeting with him was so soul-filling in itself. Now that she had the leisure, she found herself using it as the afternoon wore on. Being on the spot where she had first met him, she could reenact the scene. She knew the very raspberry barn at which she had been at work. She went to it and lifted it up. It was a spiny, red-brown, sprawling thing, just beginning to clothe itself with leaves. It had been breast-high when she had picked the fruit from it, and Claude had stood over there, in that patch of common brakes which then rose above his knees, but was now a bed of delicate, elongated sprays leaning backward with incomparable grace. She found the heart to sing. Her voice, which used to be strong enough, yielding her but the ghost of song, as the notes of an old spinet gave back the ghosts of music long ago dead. O oh, murk, murk is the midnight hour, and loud the tempest's roar. A wayful wanderer seeks thy tower, Lord Gregory, ope thy door. She could not remember having so much as hummed this air since the day Claude had interrupted it, but she went on unfalteringly, to the lines at which he had broken in. At least be pity to me shown, if love it may nay be. She didn't falter, even here. She only allowed her voice to trail away in the awed pianissimo into which he had frightened her. She stopped then, and went through the conversation that ensued on that memorable day, and of which the very words were imprinted on her heart. "'Isn't it, Rosie? I'm Claude.' She hadn't smiled on that occasion, but she smiled to herself now, a ghost of a smile to match her ghost of a voice, because his tone had been so sweet. She had never heard anything like it before, and since— only in his moments of endearment. But she went home at last. She went home because the May afternoon grew chilly, and in the gathering of shadows beneath the oaks there was something eerie. Expecting a scene or a scolding, she was surprised to find both mother and father calm. They had evidently exchanged views concerning her, deciding that she had better indulge her whims. When she refused to eat, they made little or no protest, and only once during the night did her mother cross the passage to ask fretfully why she didn't go to bed. On the following day there was the same silent acknowledgement of her right to refuse to work, and of her freedom to absent herself. Rosie was quite clear as to what had taken place. Antonio had betrayed the fact of Claude's visit, and her parents had scented a hopeless love affair. Rosie was indifferent. Her love affairs were her own business— she owed neither explanation nor apology to anyone. So long as her parents conceded her liberty to come and go, to nibble rather than to eat, and not to speak when spoken to, she was content. They conceded this all through that week. In her presence they bore themselves with timid constraint, and followed her with stealthy eyes that watched for every shadow that crossed her face. But they let her alone. She was as free as wind all Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. During those days she continued to live in the exultation of the void. There was nothing to fear any more. The worst had happened to her that could happen, and so, in a manner of speaking, she was safe. Never since she had begun to think had she been so free from misgiving and foreboding as to what each new day would bring forth. No day could bring forth anything that could hurt her. By Saturday the nerves of sensation began to show signs of recovering themselves and returning to activity. In thinking of Claude and living through again her meetings with him, there were moments like pangs of longing, of passion, of despair, as the case might be, that went as quickly as they came. But they didn't frighten her. If they were premonitions of a state of anguish, why, there had been so much anguish in her episode with Claude that there couldn't be much more now. If anything, she welcomed it. It would be more as if he was back with her. The void was peaceful, but the void, filled with suffering on his account, would be better still. Anything, anything but to be forced to go back. 
but on Monday it was the urgency of going back that confronted her. She had come down in the morning to find her breakfast laid in just the way she liked it. Tea, a soft boiled egg, buttered toast, and as a special temptation to a capricious appetite, a dab of marmalade. She sat down to the table unwillingly, sipping at the tea and nibbling at the toast, but leaving the egg and the marmalade untouched. In her mother's bustling to and fro, she felt the long-delayed protest in the atmosphere. It came while her mother was crossing the room to replace some dishes on the dresser. "'Now, my girl, buck up. Just eat your breakfast and set to work and stop your foolish fancies. If you don't look out, you'll get yourself where I was, and I guess it'll take more than Dr. Hillary to pull you out.' She added as she returned to the kitchen. "'Your father told me to get you busy on the cucumbers. There's a lot to be picked. He's been spanning them and finds them ready.' Rose made use of her privilege of not answering. When she had eaten all she could, she took a basket and made her way toward the cucumber house she had not entered since she had left it, with the words, I've quit. It was like going to the scaffold to drag her feet across the yard. It was like mounting it to lift the latch of the paintless door and feel the stifling, pollen-laden air in her face. Nevertheless, habit took her in. Habit sent her eyes searching among the lowest stretches of the vines, where the cool green things were hanging. Habit caused her to stoop and span them with her rough little hand. When her father's thumb and fingers met around them, they were ready to be picked. They were ready when her own came within an inch of doing so. But she raised herself with the rebellious impulse of her whole person before she had picked one. She had picked hundreds in her time, she had picked thousands. She couldn't begin again. With the first one she gathered, the yoke of the past would be around her neck once more. She couldn't bear it. I can't. I can't. With the words on her lips, she slipped out by the door at the far end of the hothouse and sped towards her refuge on Duck Rock. She had never felt it as so truly a refuge before. Neither had she ever before needed a refuge so acutely. She needed it today because the memory of Claude had at last become a living thing and every sentient part of her that could be filled with grief was filled with it. Grief had come suddenly. It was creating a new world for her. It was no longer a peaceful void. It was a world of wild passions, wild projects, wild things she would do, wild words she would speak if ever she had the chance to speak them. She would go in search of him. She would find his father and mother. She would appeal to Thor. She would discover the girl with ten or twelve servants who had come between them, she would implore them all to send him back. She would drag him back. She would hang about his neck till he swore never again to leave her. If he refused, she would kill him. If she couldn't kill him, she would kill herself. Perhaps if she killed herself, she would inflict on him the worst suffering of all. She thought about that. After all, it was the thing most practical. The other impulses were not practical. She knew that, of course. She could humiliate herself to the dust without affecting him. Up to today, she had not wanted him to suffer. But now she did. If she killed herself, he would suffer. However long he lived, or however many servants the woman he married would be able to keep, his life would be poisoned by the memory of what he had done to her. Her imagination revelled in the scenes it was now able to depict. Leaning back with her head resting against the trunk of the old oak, she closed her eyes and viewed the dramatic procession of events that might follow on that morning and haunt Claude Masterman to his grave. She saw herself leaping from the rock. She saw her body washed ashore, her head and hands hanging limp, her long wet hair streaming. She saw her parents mourning and Thor remorseful, and Claude absolutely stricken. Her efforts rested there. Everything was subordinate to the one great fact that by doing this she could make the sword go through his heart. She went to the edge of the cliff and peered over. Though it was a sheer fifty feet, it didn't seem so very far down. The water was blue and lapping and inviting. It looked as if it would be easy. She returned to her seat. She knew she was only playing. It relieved the tumult within her to pretend that she could do as desperately as she felt. It quieted her. Once she saw that she had it in her power to make Claude unhappy, something in her spirit was appeased. She began the little comedy all over again, 
from the minute when she started forth from home on the momentous day to fill her pan with raspberries. She traced her steps down the hill and up through the glades of the bluff wherever the ripe raspberries were hanging. She came to the minute when her stage directions called for Lord Gregory, and she sang it with the same thin, silvery piping which was all she could contribute now to the demand of the drama. It was both an annoyance and a surprise to hear a footfall and the swish of robes, and to turn and see Lois Willoughby. Beyond the fact that she couldn't help it, she didn't know why she became at once so taciturn and repellent. "'Oh, she'll come again,' she said in self-excuse, and with vague ideas of atonement, after Lois had gone away. Besides, the things that Lois had said in the way of solicitude, sympathy, and God, made no appeal to her. If she felt regret, it was from obscure motives of compassion, since this woman, too, had missed what was best in love. She would have returned to her dream, had her dream returned to her, but Lois had broken the spell. Rosie could no longer get the ecstasies of reenactment. Reenactment itself became a foolish thing, the husk of what had once been fruit. It was a new phase of loss. Everything went but her misery and her desire to strike at Claude. That, and the sense that whatever she did, and no matter how elusive she made herself, she would have to go back to the old life at last. She struggled against the conviction, but it settled on her like a mist. She played a game with the raspberry vine. She sang Lord Gregory. She peered over the brink of the toy precipice, but she evoked nothing. She stood as close to the edge of the cliff as she dared, whipping and lashing and taunting her imagination by the rashness of the act. Nothing came, but the commonplace suggestion that even if she fell in, the boat which had appeared on the lake and from which two men were fishing would rescue her. The worst she would get would be a wetting and perhaps a cold. She wouldn't drown. Common sense took possession of her. The thing for her to do, it told her cruelly, was to go back and pick the cucumbers. After that there would be some other job. In the market garden business jobs were endless, especially in spring. She could set about them with a better heart, since, after all that had happened, Archie Masterman couldn't refuse now to renew the lease. He wouldn't have the face to refuse it, so common sense expressed itself, when his son had done her such a wrong. If she had scored no other victory, her suffering would at least have secured that. It was an argument of which she couldn't but feel the weight. There would be three more years of just managing to live, three more years of sowing and planting and watering and watching, at the end of which they would not quite have starved, while Matt would have had a hole in which to hide himself on coming out of jail. Decidedly it was an argument. She had already shown her willingness to sell herself, and this would apparently prove to be her price. Wearily, when noon had passed and afternoon set in, she got herself to her feet. Wearily she began to descend the hill. She would go back again to the cucumbers, she would take up again the burden she had thrown down, she would bring her wild heart into harness and tame it to hopelessness. Common sense could suggest nothing else. She went now by the path because it was tortuous and less direct than the bee-line over fern. She paused at every excuse, now to watch a robin hopping, now to look at a pink lady's slipper abloom in a bed of streamwort, now for no reason at all. Each step cost her a separate act of renunciation. Each act of renunciation was harder than the other, but successive steps and successive acts brought her down the hill at last. I can't, I can't. She dragged herself a few paces farther still. I can't, I can't. She was in sight of the boulevard, where a gang of Finns were working, and beyond which lay the ragged, uncultivated outskirts of her father's land. Up through a tangle of nettles and yarrow, she could see the zigzag path which had been the rainbow bridge of her happiness. She came to a dead stop, the back of her hand pressed against her mouth fearfully. "'If I go up there,' she said to herself, "'I shall never come down again.' She meant that she would never come down again in the same spirit. That spirit would be captured and slain. She herself would be captured and slain. Nothing would live of her, but a body to drudge in the hot house to earn a few cents a day. 
Suddenly, without forming a resolution or directing an intention, she turned and sped up the hill. At first she only walked rapidly, but the walk broke into a run, and the run into a swift skimming along through the trees like that of a roused partridge. And yet she didn't know what she was running from. Something within her, a power of guardedness, or that capacity for common sense which had made its last desperate effort to get the upper hand, had broken down. All she could yield to was the terror that paralysed thought. All she could respond to was the force that drew her up the hill with its awful fascination. "'I must do it. I must,' were the words with which she met her own impulse to resist. If her confused thought could have become explanatory, he would have said, "'I must get away from the life I've known, from the care, from the hope, from the love. I must do something that will make Claude suffer. I must frighten him. I must wound him. I must strike at the girl who has won him away with her ten or twelve servants.' and there's no way but this. Even so the way was obscure to her. She was taking it without seeing whither it was to lead. If one impulse warned her to stop, another whipped her onward. "'I can't stop! I can't stop!' she cried out, when warning became alarm. For flight gave impetus to itself. It was like release. It was a kind of wild glee. She was as a bird whose wings have been bound and who has worked them free again. There was a frenzy in sheer speed. The path was steep, but she was hardly aware of so much as touching it. Fear behind and anguish within her carried her along. She scarcely knew that she was running breathlessly, that she panted, that once or twice she stumbled and fell. Something was beckoning to her from the great, safe, empty void, something that was nothing, unless it was peace and sleep, something that had its abode in the free spaces of the wind and the blue caverns of the sky and the kindly lapping water, something infinite and eternal and restful, in whose embrace she was due. At the edge of the wood she had a last terrifying moment. The raspberry bime was there, and the great oak with the seat around it, and the carpet of sink foil and swild strawberry. She gave them a quick frightened look, like an appeal to impede her. If she was to stop, she must stop now. But I can't stop, she seemed to fling to them over her shoulder, as she kept on to where beyond the highest tip of Greenswood the blue level of the lake appeared. The boat with the two fishermen was nearer the shore than when she had observed it last. They'll save me, oh, they'll save me, she had time to whisper to herself, at the supreme moment when she left everything behind. There followed a space which in Rosie's consciousness was long, she felt that she was leaping, flying out into the welcoming void, and that the promise of rest and peace had not deceived her. But it was in the shock of falling that sanity returned, and all that the tense little creature had been and tried to be and couldn't be and longed to be and feared to be and failed to be broke into a cry at which the fishermen dropped their rods. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 26. For, would you mind if I went away for a little while? He looked at her across the luncheon table, but her eyes were downcast. Though she endeavoured to maintain the non-committal attitude she had taken up at breakfast, she couldn't meet his gaze. If you went away, he echoed blankly, "'Why should you do that?' "'I've been to see—' "'She found a difficulty in pronouncing the name. "'I've been to see Rosie. "'She's rather upset.' "'Under the swift lifting of her lids "'he betrayed his self-consciousness. "'I suppose so.' "'He kept to the most laconic form of speech "'in order to leave no opening to her penetration. "'And I thought if I could take her away— "'Where would you go?' "'Oh, anywhere, that wouldn't matter. "'To New York, perhaps.' That might interest her, but anywhere so long as— He got out his consent while making an excuse for rising from the table. The conversation was too difficult to sustain. It was without looking at him that she said, as he was leaving the room, Then I'll go and ask her at once. I dare say she won't come, but I can try. It will give me an excuse for going back. I feel worried at having left her at all. Between three and four that afternoon she entered her husband's office hurriedly. It was Mrs. Dearlove who received her. "'Do you know where Dr. Masterman is? Do you know where he expected to call this afternoon?' 
Bradstone consulted a card hanging on the wall. He was to have seen Mrs. Gibson, number 10 Susan Street, sometime through the day. Lola made no secret of her agitation. Have they a telephone? Oh, no, hardly. Only a poor charwoman. woman. Was he going anywhere at all where they could have a telephone? Mrs. Dearlove, having mentioned the possibilities, Lois rang up house after house. She left the same message everywhere. Four was to be asked to come directly to his office, where she was awaiting him. It was after four when he appeared. She met him in the little entry, and, taking him by the arm, drew him into the waiting-room. "'Come in, Thor, dear, come in.' She knew by his eyes that he suspected something of what she had to tell. "'Caught me the long ears,' he tried to say in a natural voice, but he could hardly force the words beyond his lips. "'It's Rosie, Thor,' she said instantly. "'She's all right.' He dropped into a chair, supporting himself on a round table strewn with illustrated papers and magazines for the entertainment of waiting patients. His lips moved, but no sound passed them. Long, dark shadows streaked the pallor of his face. She sat down beside him, covering his hands with her own. "'She's all right, Thor, dear, now, and I, and I don't think she'll be any the worse for it in the end. She may be the better. We can't tell yet, but—but but you haven't heard it in the village, have you?' He shook his head, perhaps because he was dazed, perhaps because he didn't trust himself to speak. "'That's good,' she spoke breathlessly. "'I was so afraid you might. I, I wanted to tell you myself so that you wouldn't you wouldn't get a shock. There's no reason for a shock. Not now, Thor. It's only, it's only just what I was afraid of, what I spoke of at lunch. She, she, she did it.' He found strength to speak. "'She did what?' Lola continued the same breathless way. She threw herself into the pond, but she's all right. Jim Breen and Robbie Willett were out on a boat, fishing. They they saw her. They got to her just as she went down the second time. Jim Breen dived after her and brought her up. She she wasn't unconscious very long, and fortunately Dr. Hill was close by, at old Mrs. Jukes's in Schoolhouse Lane. So she's home now, and all right, or, or nearly. I arrived just as they were bringing her ashore. She was breathing then. I went on before them to the house. I, I told Mrs. Fay and Mr. Fay. I saw them put her to bed. "'She's all right, and, and then I came here to tell you, Thor.' "'He struggled to his feet, throwing his head back and clenching his fists. "'I swear to God that if I ever see Claude again, I'll, I'll kill him.' "'Without rising, she caught one of his hands and pulled him downward. "'Sit down, Thor,' she said in a tone of command. "'You mustn't take it like that. "'You mustn't make things worse than they are. "'They're bad enough as it is. "'They're so bad, or at least so hard for, for some of us.' that we must do everything we can to make it possible to bear them. He sat down at her bidding, but with elbows resting on the table, he covered his face with his hands. She clasped her own and sat looking at him. That is, she sat looking at his strong knuckles and at the shock of dark hair that fell over the fingertips where the nails dug into his forehead. She felt a great pity for him, but a pity that permitted her to sit there, watchful, detached, not as if it was Thor, but someone else. There would be an end now to silences and concealments. She saw that already. He was making no further attempt to keep her in the dark. In the shock of the moment, all the barricades he had built around his secret life had fallen like the walls of Jericho. She had nothing to do but walk upward and inward and take possession. All was open. There was neither shrine nor sanctuary any longer. It was no privilege to be admitted thus. Anybody would have been admitted who sat beside him as she was sitting now. But in the end the paroxysm passed, and his hands came down. "'I know it's hard for you, Thor.' The eyes he turned on her were full of such unspeakable things that she stopped. She was obliged to wait till he looked away again before she could go on. "'I know it's hard for you, Thor. It's hard for, for us all. But my point is that bitterness or violence will only make it worse. You must remember... I feel that I must remind you of it, that you're not the, not the only sufferer. He bowed his head into his hands again, but without the mad anguish of a few minutes earlier. Where so much is intolerable, she pursued, what we have to do, each one of us, is to see how tolerable we can make things for everyone else. He raised his head for one quick, reproachful glance. Do you mean tolerable for, for Claude? Yes, I do mean for Claude. "'We shan't have to punish him.' "'He gave her another look. "'Then what have we got to do?' 
nothing that isn't kind and, and well thought out beforehand. That's really the important thing. When one can't move without hurting someone, isn't it better not to move at all? It was the old doctrine of tarrying the Lord's leisure, against which his instincts were still in revolt. His indignation was such that he could partially turn and face her. Do you mean to say that we should let him abandon her, now? She laid her hand on his arm. Oh, Thor, dear, it isn't for us to let or prevent or anything. We can't drive other people, and it's only to a slight degree that we can lead them. Even I know that. What we can do best is to follow and pick up the pieces. He shook his head blankly. I don't understand. What good would that do? She rose, saying quietly, I shall have to let you think it out for yourself. As he remained seated, his forehead resting on his hand, she passed behind him. With her arm thrown lightly across his shoulders, she bent over him till her cheek touched his hair. "'Thor, dear,' she whispered, "'we've got our own problems to solve, haven't we? "'We can't solve Claude's and Rosie's too. "'No one can do that but themselves. "'Whatever happens, whether he comes back and marries her or whether he doesn't, "'no help would ever come of your interference, or mine. "'If we'd only understood that before—' "'You mean if I had?' "'Well, Thor, darling, you haven't. "'You see, human beings are so terribly free.' I say terribly on purpose, because you can't compel them to be wise and prudent and safe, even when they're making the most obvious mistakes. We must let them make them, and suffer, and learn. She bent closer to his ear. And it's what we must do, Thor, dear, you and I. We've made our mistakes already, though perhaps we didn't know it. Now we must have the suffering and, and the learning. She brushed her lips lightly across his hair and left him. As she walked through the square, and past the terminus of the tram-line, and on into the beginning of County Street, she was obliged to keep repeating her own words. Nothing that isn't kind and well thought out beforehand. Having counselled him against bitterness and violence, she saw that her immediate task was not to swallow her own words. Bitterness was beyond suppression, and violence would have been so easy. Well thought out beforehand, she emphasised. Whatever I do, I must keep to that. If I don't, God knows where we shall be. In pursuance of this principle, she turned in at her father-in-law's gate. He and Mrs. Masterman must also be warned. Rosie's rash act would touch them so closely that unless they were informed of it gently, something regrettable might be said or done. As to that, however, her fears proved groundless. Masterman himself opened the door for her she went up the steps. "'Saw you coming,' he explained. "'Just got out from town. "'He'd has been telling me the most distressing thing, "'the most damnably theatrical, idiotic thing. "'Perhaps you've heard of it.' "'I know what you mean. I've been there. "'I was there when they brought her ashore. "'It may have been idiotic, as you say, "'but I don't think it was theatrical.' "'You will when you know. "'Ina,' he called up the stairs after they entered the hall, "'Lois is here. Come down.' Mrs. Masterman entered the library a minute later with both hands outstretched. "'Oh, my dear, what a comedy this is!' It was not often that her manner forsook its ladylike suavity. "'What a comedy! But of course you don't know. Nobody knows, thank God. But we must tell you.' She turned to her husband. "'Will you tell her, Archie, or shall I?' "'If it's about Claude and Rosie Fay,' Lois said when they got seated, "'I know all that. Thor told me.' He told me yesterday because, well, because I've been taking an interest in Rosie for some months past, and when I went to see her yesterday afternoon, old Mr. Fay wouldn't let me. He said there'd been trouble or something between Claude and Rosie. Oh, he's been so romantic, poor boy, he interrupted, and so loyal you'd hardly believe. He's been taken in completely. He did want to marry her, that's true. There's no use denying it. He told his father, and he told me. Oh, you've no idea. We've been so worried. But he must have found her out. Simply found her out. Lois weighed the wisdom of asking questions, or of learning more than Thor chose to tell her. But in the end it seemed reasonable to ask. Found her out? How? Ina threw up her pretty hands. Oh, well, with a girl of that sort, what could you expect? Claude's been completely taken in. or oh, he was. He's so innocent, poor boy. He wouldn't believe... 
not even when I told him. I tried to stand by him. I really did. Didn't I, Archie? When he said he wanted to marry her, I said, uh, said I, if she's a good girl, Claude, and loves you, I'll accept her. I really did, Lois, and you can imagine what it cost me. But I could see at once. Anyone who wasn't infatuated as Claude was would have seen at a glance. The girl must be, well, something awful. Lois spoke warmly. Oh, I, I don't think that. My dear Lois, I know. What's more, Thor knows too. And I must say I can't help blaming Thor. He's backed Claude up and backed him up when all the while he's known what she was. Lois felt obliged to speak. I don't think he's known anything, anything to her discredit. Oh, but he has, I assure you he has, and what amazes me about Thor, simply amazes me, is that she shouldn't see it in the right light. Archie did as soon as I told him, didn't you, Archie? And I didn't tell him, Eden ran on excitedly, till I saw what a trouble dear Claudie was in. When Claudie began to see for himself, I betrayed his confidence to the extent of telling his father, but, but not before. You could hardly blame me for that, could you? his own father. And when I did tell Archie, why, it was so plain that a child could have understood. The question, what was plain, could not but come to Lois's lips, but she succeeded in withholding it. She even rose with signs of going. It was Archie who responded to his wife, taking a man's view of that which seemed to her so damning. We must make allowances, of course, for its being a cock-and-bull story to begin with. Girls like that never know how to tell the truth. "'We couldn't treat it as a cock-and-bull story so long as Claude believed it,' the mother declared, in defence of her right to be anxious. "'And Thor believed it too. I know he did. And I do blame Thor for not telling Claude. A boy so inexperienced that a girl couldn't be getting money from some other man and go on getting it after she was married, unless there'd been something wrong.' Lois felt as if her blood had been arrested at her heart. "'Money from some other man?' "'Money from some other man,' Mrs. Masterman repeated firmly. "'I told Claude at the time that no man in his senses would settle money on a girl like that "'unless there had been a reason, and a very good reason too. "'A very good reason too,' I said. "'But Claude's as ignorant of the world as if he was ten years old. "'He really is. He, she took him in completely.' "'Being too consciously a gentleman to say more in disparagements of a woman's character "'than he had permitted himself already,' Masterman remained in the library while his wife accompanied Lois to the door. The latter had said good-bye and was descending the steps when Ida cried out in a tone that was like a confession. "'Oh, Lois, you don't think that poor girl had any reason to throw herself into the pond, do you?' At the foot of the steps Lois turned and looked upward. Ina was wringing her hands, but the daughter-in-law didn't notice it. As a matter of fact, Lois was too deeply sunk into thoughts of her own to have any attention to spare for other people's searching of heart. Having heard the question, she could answer it but absently, and as though it were a point of no pressing concern. She hadn't the reason you were thinking of. I feel very sure of that. I've, I've asked her mother, and she says she knows it. Mrs. Masterman was uttering some expression of relief, but Lois could listen to no more. In her heart there was room for only one consideration. Money. Money she was saying to herself as she went down the avenue beneath the leafing elms. He was going to give up that. But Ina returned to the threshold of the library, where her husband, standing with his back to the empty fireplace, was meditating moodily. Uh, Archie, she faltered, you do think that girl was any seeking notoriety, don't you? He raised his head, which had been hanging pensively. Certainly, don't you? She tried to speak with conviction. Oh, yes, of, of course. That is, Archie analysed, she was going in for cheap tragedy in the hope that her sensation would reach Claude. That was her game, quite evidently. I dare say it was a put-up job between her and those two young men. Took very good care, at any rate, to have them alongside. But if Claude should hear of it... I must see that he doesn't. Wiring him tonight to go on to Japan after he's seen California. Let him go to India, if he likes, round the world. Anything to keep him away. And you and I, he added, had better hook it till the whole thing blows over. She looked distressed. Hook it, Archie? Close the house up and go abroad. Haven't been abroad for three years now. Little motor trip through England and back toward the end of the summer. 
Fortunately, I've sold that confounded property. Good price, too. Hobson of Hobson and Davies. Going to bill for residence. Takes it from the expiration of the lease, which is up in July. He'll clear out the whole gang, then, so that by the time we come back, they'll be gone. What do you think? Might do Devonshire and Cornwall. Always wanted to take that trip. A few weeks in Paris before we come home. The suggestion of going abroad came as such a pleasing surprise that Mrs. Masterman slipped into a chair to turn it over in her mind. Then Claude couldn't come back, could he? Expressed the first of the advantages she foresaw. He'd have nowhere to go. Oh, you'll not be in a hurry to do that, Archie said confidently. And I do want some things, she mused further. I had nothing to wear for the darling's ball, nothing. And you know how long I've worn the dinner dresses I have. I really couldn't put on the green again. She was silent for some minutes, when another of those queer little cries escaped her, such as had broken from her lips when she stood at the door with Lois. But, oh, Archie, I want to do what's right. What's right, Archie? He looked at her from under his brows, as his head again drooped moodily. What's what? What's right, Archie? Latterly, oh, I don't know, but latterly, she passed her hand across her brow, sometimes I feel like I get to be afraid, Archie, as if we weren't, as if we hadn't, as if something were going to happen to, to overtake us. Crossing the room, he bent back her pretty head and kissed her. N nonsense, he smiled unsteadily. "'Nerves, dear. Don't wonder at it, with all we've been through one way and another. "'That's what we'll do. Close the house up and go abroad for three months. "'Inconvenient just now with the upset of the business, but we'll, we'll do it. "'Get out of the way. See something new.' "'There now, old girl,' he coaxed, patting her on the shoulder. "'Brace up and shake it off. Nothing but nerves.' "'He added as he moved back toward his stand by the fireplace. "'Get him yourself.' "'Do you, Archie? Like that? Like, like what I said?' He had resumed his former attitude, his feet wide apart, his hands behind his back, his head hanging, when he muttered, "'Lie the devil!' She was not sure how much mental discomfort was indicated by the phrase, so she sat looking at him distressfully. Being unused to grappling with grave questions of right and wrong, she found the process difficult. It was like wandering through morasses in which she could neither sink nor swim, till she found herself emerging on solid familiar ground again, with a reconciling observation. Well, I do need a few things. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 27 it was not till Rosie was well enough to go listlessly back to work, and the mastermans had sailed, that Lois found her own emotions ripe for speech. During the intervening fortnight she and Thor had lived their ordinary life together, but on a basis which each knew to be temporary. While he kept his office hours in the mornings and visited his patients in the afternoons, and she busied herself with household tasks, or superintended the gardener in replanting the faded tulip beds with flocks and sweet peas and dahlias, while she sewed or did embroidery in the evenings and listened to him reading aloud, or, since the nights were growing warm, they sat silent on an upper balcony or talked about the stars. Each knew that the inner tension would never be relaxed till it was broken. If there was any doubt of that, it was on Thor's side. Because she said nothing, there were minutes when he hoped she had nothing to say. Unaware of a woman's capacity for keeping the surface unruffled while storm may be raging beneath, he beguiled himself at times into thinking that his fears of her acuteness had been false alarms. If so, he could only be thankful. He wanted to forget. If he had had a prayer to put up on the subject, it would have been that she would allow him to forget. So, as day followed day, regularly, peacefully, with an abstention on her part from comment that could give him pain, he began to indulge the hope, a hope which he knew in his heart to be baseless, that she had nothing to remember. When he was called on at last to face the realities of the case, the moment was as unexpected to him as it was to her. She had not meant to bring the subject up on that particular evening. She had made no programme, not because she was uncertain as to what she ought to say, but because the impulse to say it lagged. 
In the end it came to her without warning, surprising herself no less than him. For were you going to give money to Rosie Fay? The croaking of frogs seemed part of the silence in which she waited for his answer. The warm air was heavy with the scents of lilac, honeysuckle, and syringa. As they stood by the railing of the balcony that connected the exterior of their two rooms, she erect, he leaning outward with an arm stretched towards the sky, a great white lilac, whose roots were in the early days of the Willoughby farm, threw up its tribute of blossoms almost to her feet. The lights of the village being banked under verdure, the eye sought the stars. Thor loved the stars. On moonless nights he spent hours in contemplation of their beckoning mystery. From Auriga and Taurus in January, he followed them round to Ares and Perseus in December, getting a beam on his inward way. Just now, with the aid of a pencil, he was tracing for his wife's benefit the lines of the rising virgin. Lois could almost discern the graceful recumbent figure, winged, noble, lying on the eastern horizon, Spiker's sweet silvery light or tremble in her hand. She was actually thinking how white for a star was Spiker's radiance, when the word slipped out. Thor, were you going to give money to Rosie Fay? He suppressed the natural question concerning her sources of information, in order to say, as quietly as he could, if, if Claude had married her, I was going to, to help them out. She resented what she considered his evasiveness. That isn't just what I asked. Even so, it tells you what you want to know, doesn't it? Not everything I want to know. Why should you want to know everything? Because... It struck her that her reason could be best expressed by shifting her ground. Thor, dear, exactly why did you want to marry me? The change in tactics troubled him. I think I told you that at the time. You told me you came to me as a to a... to a shelter. And as to a home, I said that too, Lois. Yes, she agreed slowly. You said that too. A brief interval gave emphasis to the succeeding words. But did you think it was enough? I couldn't judge of that. I could only say what I had to say, truthfully. Oh, I know it was truthfully. It's it's just the trouble. Y you see, Thor, she went on unsteadily, I thought you were telling me only some of what was in your heart, and it was all. I'm not certain that I know what you mean by all. What I felt was so much. He added reproachfully, It's surely a great deal when a man finds a woman his refuge from trouble. That's perfectly true, Thor, and there's no one in the world who wouldn't be touched by it. But in the case of a wife, she can hardly help thinking of the kind of trouble he's escaping from. But so long as he escapes from it. She interrupted quickly, Yes, so long as he does. But when he doesn't? When, instead of leaving his trouble outside the refuge, he brings it in? He took an uneasy turn up and down the balcony. Look here, Lois. Have you any particular motive in bringing this up now? Yes, Thor. It's the same motive I had a few weeks ago, only that I haven't been sure of it till tonight. I want you... She hesitated, but urged herself on. I want you to let me go away. Go away? he cried sharply. Go away where? I don't know yet. Anywhere. There are one or two visits I might make, or uh, I could find a place. That part of it doesn't matter. But when you wanted to go away a few weeks ago, it was to, to take her. I shouldn't need to do that now, because she's better. In a way, she's all right. All right. Then it changed. It was to make a show of not being afraid to mention Rosie that he said, "'Changed in what way?' "'Well, you'll see.' She decided that for his own sake it was kindest to be cruel, and so added, "'Changed to a healthier frame of mind. She's very much ashamed of what she tried to do, and wants to begin again on a, on a less foolish basis. So,' she continued, reverting to her former point, "'my going away wouldn't now have anything to do with her.' It would be on my own account. I want to... to think. Think about what? Well, chiefly, about you. He knew they were nearing the heart of the question, and so went up to it boldly. To wonder whether or not I... love you, is that it? 
No, not exactly. She allowed a second to pass before letting slip the words. Rather the other way. The other way? How? She spoke very softly. Whether or not I love you. Oh. His tone was as soft as hers, but with the ejaculation he moved his big hands about his body like a man feeling for his wound. I thought you did. Yes, I thought so too, till, till lately. Perhaps I do even now. I don't know. It's what I want to get away for, to, to think, to see. I can't do either when you're so near me. You, you overwhelm me, you crush me. I don't get the free use of my mind. He turned again to pace the narrow limits of the balcony. If you ever did love me, Lois, he said in a voice which he hardly recognised because of the new thrill in it, I've done nothing to deserve the withdrawal of your affection. She answered, while still keeping her eyes absently on Spiker's white effulgence, I know you haven't, Thor, dear, but that's not the point. It's rather that I have to go back and and revise everything, form new conceptions. He paused, standing behind her. I don't think I get your idea. No, probably not. You couldn't without knowing what it all used to mean to me. Used to mean? Yes, Thor. Used to mean in a way that it doesn't now, and never can any more. There was pain in his voice as he said, That's hard, Lois. Damnably hard. I know, Thor, dear. I wouldn't say it if I hadn't made up my mind that I must, that I ought to. I've had a great shock, which has been in its way a great humiliation. But I could go on keeping it to myself if I hadn't come to the conclusion that it's best for you to know. Men are so slow to fathom what their wives are thinking of. Well, then, tell me. She turned slowly round from her contemplation of the stars, a hand on each side grasping the low rail against which she leaned. The spangles on a scarf over her bare shoulders glittered iridescently in the light streaming from her room. Of Thor she could discern little more than the whiteness of his face and of his evening shirt-front from the obscurity in which he kept himself. A minute or more elapsed before she went on. "'You see, Thor, I didn't fall in love with you first of all for your own sake. It was because... because I thought you'd fallen in love with me. That's a sort of confession, isn't it? It may be something I ought to be ashamed of, and perhaps I am a little. But you'd understand how it could happen if you were to realise what it was to me that a man should fall in love with me at all. He tried to interrupt her, but she insisted on going on in her own way. I wasn't attractive. I never have been. During the years when I was going out, I never received what people called attentions, not from anyone. I don't say that I didn't suffer on account of it. I did. But I'd begun to take the suffering philosophically. I'd made up my mind that no one would ever care for me. And I was getting used to the idea when... when you came. Because her voice trembled, she pressed her handkerchief against her lips, while Thor stood silent in the darkness of the far end of the balcony. And when you did come, Thor, dear, it couldn't but seem to me the most amazing thing that ever happened. I didn't allow myself to think that you were in love with me. I, I didn't dare at first. It made me happy that you should think it worth while just to come and see me, to talk to me, to tell me some of the things you hoped to do. That in itself. She broke off again, losing something of her self-command. In the stress of physical agitation, she drew the spangled scarf over her shoulders and stepped forward into the shaft of light that fell through the open French window of her room. But finally, Thor, I came to the conclusion that you must love me. I couldn't explain your kindness in any other way. Believe me, I didn't accept that way till, till it seemed the only one. When I did, well, it wasn't merely pride and happiness, I felt it was something more. A sob in her throat obliged her to interrupt herself again, while the croaking of frogs continued. And so, Thor, dear, love came to me too. It came because I thought you brought it. But now that I see you didn't bring it, you can understand why I should be in doubt as to 
as to whether or not it really did come, since he recognised the futility of making an immediate response, they stood confronting each other in silence. She took another step nearer him. But what I'm not in any doubt about at all is the scorn I feel for myself for ever having cherished the delusion. If I'd been a woman with with more claim, let us say, to being loved... Lois, for God's sake, don't say that. But I must say it, Thor. It's at the bottom of all I mean. I was weak and foolish enough to think that in spite of the things I liked, a man had given me his heart when he hadn't. Lois, I can't stand this. Please don't go on. But I have to stand it, Thor. I have to stand it day and night, without ever getting away from the thought of it. I have to go back and puzzle and wonder and speculate as to why you did what you've done to me. I see things this way, Thor. There was a time when you thought you might come to care for me. You really thought it. And then something happened, and you were not so sure. Later you felt that you couldn't, that you never would. But the something that happened happened the wrong way for you, and Papa broke down as he did, and I was in the danger of being poor, and you were kind and generous, and you weren't very happy as things were. You told me so, didn't you? And, and in short, you, you, you thought you might as well. You knew I expected it, or had expected it once, and so, so you did it. Tell me, Thor, dear, am I so very far wrong? Wasn't it like that? He raised his head defiantly. And if I admitted that it was like that, what then? Oh, nothing. I should merely ask you the same thing, to let me go away. Away for how long? She reflected. Till I could establish a new basis on which to come back. I don't know what you mean by a new basis. I dare say I don't mean anything very different from the compromise most people have to make a little while after marriage, only that in my case the necessity comes more as a shock. You see, thought, you're not the man, not the man I thought you were. I must have a little while to get used to that. He stirred uneasily. You find I'm, I'm not so good a man. Oh, I don't say that. I, I don't say that at all. You're just as good, only you're not... She went up to him, laying her hands on his shoulders. Oh, you don't understand. I love the other Thor. I'm not sure that I love this one. I don't know. Perhaps I do. I can't tell till I get away from you. Let me go. It may not be for long. She stepped back from him toward the window of her room, through which she seemed about to pass. He was obliged to speak in order to retain her. "'Look here, Lois,' he began, not knowing exactly how he meant to continue. She turned with a foot on the threshold, her hand on the knob of the open window door. The pose, set off by the simplicity of the old black evening dress she was in the habit of wearing when they were alone, displayed the commanding beauty of her figure to a degree which he had never observed before. He remembered afterwards that something shot through him, something he had associated hitherto only with memories of little rosy Fay. But for a minute he was too intensely preoccupied for more than a subconscious attention. She was waiting, and he must say something to justify his appeal to her. "'It's all right,' were the words he found. "'I'm willing. That is, I'm willing in principle, only—' He stammered on. "'And I don't want you to go roaming the country by yourself.' Why not let me go? I, I could go away for a while, and, and you could stay here. He warmed to the, the idea as soon as he began to express it. This is your home rather than mine. It's your father's house. You've lived in it for years. I couldn't stay here without you, while you're used to it, without me. I'll go. I'll go, and not come back till you tell me. There. Will that do? The advantages of the arrangement were evident. She answered slowly, "'It might. But what about your patients?' "'Oh, Hill would look after them. He said he would if I wanted to attend the Medical Congress at Minneapolis. I told him I didn't, but—' but He tapped the rail to emphasise the timeliness of the idea. "'But by George, I'll do it. You'd have three weeks at least, and as many more as you ask for.' She gave the suggestion a minute's thought. "'Very well, Thor. Since the Congress is going on, and your time wouldn't be altogether thrown away—' 
You see, all I want is a little quiet, a little solitude, perhaps, just to realise where I am and to see how to begin again, if we ever can. She closed one side of the window, softly and slowly. Her hands were on the other baton when he uttered a little throaty cry. "'Aren't you going to say good-night?' Standing on the low step of the window, she was sufficiently above him to be able to fold his head in her arms, to pillow it on her breast, while she imprinted a long kiss on the thick, dark mass of his hair. Having released him, she withdrew, closing the window gently and pulling down the blinds. Outside in the darkness, Thor turned once more to where the Virgin, recumbent, noble, outlined and crowned with stars, Spiker the wheat ear in her the hand hanging by her side, rose slowly toward mid-heaven. Irrelevantly there came back to his memory something said months before by his uncle Sim, but which he had not recalled since the night he heard it. "'You may make an awful fool of yourself, Thor, but you'll be on the side of the angels, and the angels will be on yours.' "'Ha!' <laughs> he snorted to himself. "'That's all very fine. But where are the angels?' And again he sought the stars. End of chapter twenty seven. Chapter twenty eight of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter twenty eight. It was Jim Breen who told Lois that Jasper Fay's tenancy of the land north of the pond was definitely ended. "'What a nice fern-tree, Mrs. Masterman,' he had asked briskly. Two or three beauties for sale at Mr. Fay's place. Look dandy in the corner of a big room. Beet palms and rubber plants like a rose will beat a bit uh, Got a nice cheap one at Mr. Fay's.' Lois wondered. "'Is Mr. Fay setting off?' "'Well, not exactly. Father's selling what he don't want to cart over to our place. "'Didn't you know? Father's bought out Mr. Fay's stock. "'Mr. Fay's got to beat it by July 9th.' "'As Lois looked into the honest face, "'she made the reflection with a little jealous pang "'that Rosie Fay was just the type that men like Jim Breen fell in love with. "'There was something in men like Jim Breen, in men like Thor Masterman, "'the big, generous, tender men, that impelled them toward piteous little creatures like Rosie Fay, driven probably by the protective yearning in themselves. It placed the tall women, the strong women, the women whose first impulse was to give to others rather than to get anything for themselves, at a disadvantage. In response to the information just received, she said anxiously, "'Why, Jim, tell me about it.' He drew from the wagon a wooden flat filled with zinnia plantlings, like so many little green rosettes. "'Hadley B. Hobson owns that property now, Mrs. Masterman,' he said cheerily, depositing the flat on the ground. "'Going to build, didn't you know? I have a handy place there. Had architects and landscape gardeners prowling round for the last two weeks. An old man Fay won't allow one of them on the grounds. You'd die laughing to see him chasing them off with a spade or a rake or whatever he has in his hand. His property till July nine the ninth, he says, and he wouldn't let so much as a crow fly over it if it belonged to Hadley B. Hobson. You'd die laughing.' "'I don't see how you can laugh when he's in such trouble, poor man.' "'Oh, well,' Jim drawled optimistically. "'He won't do so bad. "'He can always have a job with father. "'Father's mingled with him ever since the two of them are young. "'If Mr. Fay hadn't been so moonstruck, "'he'd have had just the same chance as father had.' "'Lois chose a moment which seemed to be discreet, "'in order to say, "'I know Rosie quite well. "'I've seen a good deal of her during the past few months.' "'Rosie's all right, Mrs. Masterman,' Jim answered suddenly and a trifle aggressively. "'I don't care what anyone says. She's all right.' "'I know she's all right, Jim. She's one of the most remarkable characters I've ever met. I often wish she'd let me help her more.' "'Well, you hold on to her, Mrs. Masterman,' he advised, with a curious pleading quality in his voice. "'You'll find she'll be worth it. And if a girl was up against it, she is.' "'I will hold on to her, Jim. "'It's all rot what people are saying, "'that she'd gone melancholy "'because she took that fool jump into the pond. "'I know how she did it. "'She'd get to the point where she couldn't help it, "'where she just couldn't stand any more, "'with the business all gone to pieces "'and Matt coming out of jail and everything else, 
"'Who wouldn't have done it? "'I'd have done it myself if I'd been a girl. "'She got worked up, Mrs. Masterman, "'and when girls get worked up, well, they'll do anything. "'I believe the shock's done her good, "'sort of cleared her mind, like.' "'Lois tried to be tactful. "'Then you see her? "'We'll... on and off.' "'He grew appealing and confidential. "'I don't mind telling you, Mrs. Masterman,' "'he began, as if in acknowledging an indiscretion. "'I went with Rosie once. "'Went with her for over a year.' "'Did you, Jim?' "'He leaned nonchalantly against Maud's barrel-shaped body, "'his face taking on an expression of boyish regret. "'And I'd have gone on going with her "'if, if Rosie hadn't... hadn't kind of dropped me.' "'Oh, but, Jim, why should she?' "'Well, I can understand it. "'Rosie's high-toned, you know, Mrs. Masterman, "'and she's got a magnificent education. "'I guess you wouldn't come across them more refined, "'not in the most tip-top families. "'Pretty. My lord, pretty isn't the word for it. "'And I think she grows prettier. "'And work. Why, Mrs. Masterman, "'if that girl was at the head of a plant like ours, "'there wouldn't be anything for father and me to do "'but sit in a chair and rock.' "'I'm glad she's willing to see you,' Lois ventured. He sprang to his seat behind Maud. "'Well, I guess she needs all the friends she's got.' Lois ventured still further. "'I'm sure she needs friends like you, Jim.' There was a flare in his eyes. He fumbled for the reins. "'Well, she's only got to stoop and pick me up. Get along, Maud. Gee!' In obedience to his pull, Maud arched her heavy neck and executed a sideways movement uncertainly. "'She knows I'm there.' he continued, as the wagon creaked round. "'Been there ever since she dropped me. "'Gee, Maud, gee, what are you thinking of?' "'I never gone with anyone else, Mrs. Masterman. "'Not really gone with them. "'Rosie's been the only one so far. "'Well, good-bye, and you will hold on to her, Mrs. Masterman, now, won't you?' "'Indeed I will, Jim, and, and you must do the same.' "'He threw her a rueful look over his shoulder as Maud paced toward the gate.' "'Oh, I'm the, on the job every time.' The visit gave her a number of themes for thought, of which the most insistent was the power some women had of drawing out the love of men. For the rest of the day her gardening became no more than a mechanical directing of the setting out of seedlings, while she meditated on the problem of attractiveness. How was it that women of small endowments could captivate men at sight, and that others of inexhaustible potentialities she was not afraid to rank herself among them, went unrecognised and undesired. If Rosie Fay had been content with the honours of a local belle, she could have had her choice among half the young men in the village. What was her gift? What was the gift of that great sisterhood, comprising perhaps a third of the women in the world, to whom the majority of men turned instinctively, ignoring or partially ignoring the rest? Was it mere sheep stupidity in men themselves that sent one where the others went, without capacity for individual discernment? Or was there a secret call that women like Rosie Fay could give, which brought them too much of that for which other women were left famishing? She put the question that evening to Dr. Sim Masterman, who had dropped in to see her, as he not infrequently did after his supper, now that Thor was away. Indeed, his visits were so regular as to make her afraid that with his curious social or spiritual second sight, he suspected more in Thor's absence than zeal for the science of medicine. Why do men fall in love with inferior women, become infatuated with them? He answered, while sprawling before the library fire, his long legs apart, his fingers interlocked over his old tan waistcoat. No use to discuss love with a woman. She can't get hold of it by the right end. "'Oh, but I thought that was just what she could do, "'one of the few capabilities universally conceded her.' "'All wrong, my dear. "'A man occasionally understands love, but a woman never. "'Oh, so rarely that it hardly counts. "'Gets it backward, wrong end first, nine women out of ten. "'She looked up from her saying. "'I do wish you'd tell me what you mean by that. "'Clear enough. "'Love is in the first place the instinct to love someone else.' and only in the second place the desire to be loved in return. Ten to one the woman puts the cart before the horse. She's thinking of the return before she's done anything to get it. She don't want to love half as much as to be loved, and so she finds herself left. Lois went on with her saying again, but she was uneasy. 
She thought of her confession to Thor. Could it be that there was something wrong with her love as well as with his? It was to see what he had to say further that she asked, "'Finds herself left in what way?' "'Make themselves too sentimental,' he grumbled on. "'In love with love. "'They like that expression. "'It does them harm. "'Sets them to wool-gathering with the heart. "'Makes them think love more important than it is.' "'It's generally supposed to be rather important.' <laughs> "'Rather's the word. "'But it's not the only thing of which that can be said, and more. "'Women reason as if it was. "'Make their lives depend on it. "'Mistake.' If you can get it, well and good. If not, well, there's compensation. She lifted her head, not less in amazement than in indignation. Compensation for having to do without love? Heaps. And may I ask what? Oh, no use telling you. Wouldn't believe me. Be like telling a man who's fond of his wine that he'd be just as well off with water. She said musingly, Yes, love is the wine of life, isn't it? "'Wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and can also play the deuce with it.' She sat for some time smiling to herself with faint amusement. "'Do you really disapprove of love, Uncle Sim?' she asked at last. He yawned loudly and stretched himself. "'What'll be the good of that? I don't disapprove of it any more than I disapprove of the circulation of the blood. Force in life, of course. Treasure to be valued and peril to be controlled.' To play with it requires skill. To utilise it calls for wisdom. She had again been smiling gently to herself when she said, I doubt if you can ever have been in love. Got nothing to do with it. Not obliged to have been insane to understand insanity. Matter of fact, best brain specialists have always kept their senses. Oh, then you rate love with insanity. Ah, it depends on the kind. Some sort's not far from it. Obsession, brainstorm, supernormal excitement, passing commotion of the senses. Comes as suddenly as a summer tempest, thunder and lightning and rain, and goes the same way. Oh, but would you call that love? You bet I call it love. Love the poets write about. Grand passion. Whirls along like a tornado. Makes a noise and kicks up dust and all over in an afternoon. That's the real thing. If you can't love like that, you can't love at all, not in the grand manner. The going just as vital as the coming. The very essence of it, that it shouldn't last. That's why Shakespeare kills his Romeo and his Juliet at the end of the play, and Wagner, his Tristan and his as old. Nothing else to do with them. People of that kind go through just the same set of hijinks six or eight months later with someone else. And in poetry that wouldn't do. Romantic lovers love by crises and never pass twice the same way. People who don't do that, and lots of them don't, needn't think they can be romantic. They ain't. But surely there is a love. Of the nice, tame, housekeeping variety, of course. And it bears the same relation to the other kind as a glass of milk to a bottle of champagne. Mind you, I like milk. I approve of it. In the long run it'll beat champagne any day, especially where you respect babies. I'm only saying that it doesn't come of the same vintage as Verve Clicquot. Women often wish it did, and when it doesn't, they make things uncomfortable. No use. Can't make a Tristan out of good, honest, faithful William Dobbin, nohow. The thing with the fizz is bound to go flat, and the thing that stands by you to be relied on all through life won't have any fizz. Feeling at liberty to reject these vapourings as those of an eccentric old man who could know little or nothing on the subject, Lois reverted to the aspect of the question which had been in her mind when she started the theme. "'You still haven't answered what I asked, as to why men fall in love with inferior women, and often with a kind of infatuation they hardly ever feel for the good ones.' He took longer than usual to reflect. "'Part of man's dual nature.' Paul knew a good thing about that. Puts the new man in contrast to the old man, the inner man in contrast to the outer man, the spiritual man in contrast to the carnal. The old outer carnal man falls in love with one kind of person, and the new inner spiritual man with another. Depends on which element is the stronger. The higher falls in love with the higher type, the lower with the lower. But suppose neither is stronger than the other, that the 
equally balanced and and in conflict. One of the commonest sights in life. Known fellows in love with two women at the same time, with a good wife at home, mother of the children and all that, and another kind of woman somewhere else. True in a way to them both. Struggle of the two natures. Lois was distressed. Oh, but that kind of thing can't be love. Can't be? It is. Ask anyone who's ever felt it, who's been dragged by it both ways at once. He'll tell you whether it's love or not, and each kind the real thing, while it lasts. It was the expression, while it lasts, that Lois most resented. It reduced love to a phase, to a passing experience that might be repeated on an indefinite number of occasions. It was more than a depreciation. It had the nature of a sacrilege. And yet, no later than the following day, she received a shock that showed her there was something to be said in its favour. She had gone nominally to see Rosie, but really to verify for herself Jim Breen's report of the collapse of Jasper Fay's little industry. She found it hard to believe that after Claude's conduct toward Rosie, her father-in-law could have the heart to bring further woe upon a family that had already had enough. Nothing but seeing for herself could coerce her incredulity. She had seen for herself. Over the little place which had always been neat, even when it was forlorn, there was now the stamp of desolation. The beds which had been seeded or planted a month before, and which should now have been weeded, trimmed, and hoed, were growing with an untended recklessness that had all the proverbial resemblance to moral breakdown. In the cucumber house, the vines had become rusty and limp, sagging from the twines on which they climbed in debauched indifference to sightliness. The roof of the hot house that had contained the flowers had a deep gash in the glass which it was no longer worth while to mend. There was no yellow brown plume from the furnished chimney, and the very windows of the old house with the mansard roof had in their stare the glazed, unseeing expression of eyes in which there is death. Inside, Mrs. Fay was packing up. Battered old trunks that had long been stored in some mouldy hiding place stood agape. A packing case held the place of honour in a forbidden best room into which Lois had never looked before. Mrs. Fay had little to say. Tears welled into her cold eyes with the attempt to say anything. Outside, Fay himself had nothing to say at all. Lois had accosted him, and though he had ceased to regard her as an enemy, he stood grimly silent as his only response to her words of consolation. "'I know things will come all right again, Mr. Fay. They must. They look dark now, but haven't you often noticed that after the worst times in our lives we're able to look back and see that the very thing that seemed most cruel was the turning point at which a change for the better began?' You must surely have noticed that, a man with so much experience as you. He looked vaguely about him, standing in patience, till she had said her say, but giving no indication that her words had anything to do with him. The change in his appearance shocked her. Everything in his face had taken on what was to her a terrible significance. The starry mysticism had vanished from the eyes, to be replaced by a look that was at once hunted and searching, vindictive and yet woebegone. The mouth was sunken, as the mouths of old men become from the loss of teeth, and the thin lips, which used to be kindly and vacillating, were drawn with a hard, unflinching tightness. The skin that had long been grey was now ghostly, with the shadowy, not quite earthly hue of things about to disappear. She had talked to him for some minutes before he woke to animation. At sight of two young men, surveyors' clerks perhaps, who had set up in the roadway what might have been a camera on a tripod, or more probably a theodolite, through which they were squinting over the buildings and the slope of the land. He left her, abruptly. With a hoe in his hand, he crept forward, taking his place behind a clump of syringa that grew near the gate, ready to strike if either of the lads ventured to put foot on his property. It was the situation at which, according to light-hearted Jim Breen, he would have died laughing. But Lois had difficulty in keeping back her tears. She found Rosie in the hothouse, of which the interior corresponded to the gash in the roof. All the smaller plants had been removed, disclosing the empty, ugly, earth-stained, water-stained wooden stagings. 
Only some half-dozen fern-trees remained of all the former beauty. But even here Rosie was at work, sitting at the old desk, which, deprived of its sheltering greenery, was shabbier than ever, making out bills. There was still money owing to her father, and it was important that it should be collected. Over and over again she wrote her neat, account rendered, while she added as a postscript in every case, Please remit, going out of business. And yet, if there was anything on the dilapidated premises that could cheer or encourage, it was rosy. With the enforced rest and seclusion following on her fruitless dash to escape, her prettiness had become more delicate, less worn. Shame at her folly had put into her greenish eyes a pleading timidity, which became a quivering babyish tremble when it reached the lips. The contrast which the girl thus presented to her parents, as well as something that was visibly developing within her, enabled Lois to affirm that which hitherto she had only hoped or suspected, that the wild leap into the pond had worked some mysterious good. Like her father and mother, Rosie had little to say. The meeting was embarrassing. There were too many unuttered and unutterable thoughts on both sides to make intercourse easy or agreeable. All they could achieve was to be sorry for each other, in a measure to respect each other, and to make up by an enforced, slightly perfunctory goodwill for what they lacked in the way of spontaneity. Lois took the chair on which Rosie had been seated at the desk, while Rosie leaned against a corner of the empty staging. It furnished the latter with something to say to be able to tell the new plans of the family. Her father had taken a job with Mr. Breen. It wouldn't be like managing his own place, but it would be better than nothing. He had also rented a tenement in a three-family house on the Thorley estate, to which they would move as soon as possible. It was important to make the change so as to be settled when Matt came out of jail. Both Rosie and her mother were glad that he wouldn't be free till the 10th of July, because the lease terminated on the 9th. He would return, therefore, to absolutely new conditions, and there would be no necessity of going over any of the old ground again. As far as they were concerned, Rosie and her mother, the sooner they went, the better they would like it, since they had to go. But, poor father, Rosie said with a catch in her voice, won't leave till the last minute has struck. Even then, she added, I think they'll have to drive him off. This place has been his life. I don't think he'll last long after he's had to leave it. Having given sympathetic views on these points as they came up, Lois rose to depart. She had actually shaken hands and turned away when Rosie seemed to utter a little cry. That is, her words came out with the emotion of a cry. Mrs. Masterman, I, I want to ask you something. Lois turned in surprise. Yes, Rosie, what? With one hand, Rosie clung to the staging for support. The back of the other hand was pressed against her lips. She could hardly speak. Is, is, is Claude staying away on my account? Before Lois could answer, Rosie added, "'Because he... he needn't.' Lois wondered, "'What do you mean by that, Rosie? "'Only that... that he needn't. I, "'I don't care whether he stays away or not.' Lois took a step back toward the girl. "'You mean that it doesn't make any difference to you what he does?' She shook her head. "'No, not now, not... not any more. "'That is, you've given him up?' Rosie sought for an explanation. "'I haven't given him up. I only see.' "'You see what, Rosie?' "'Oh, I don't know. It's, it, it's like having had a dream, a strange, awful dream, and waking from it.' "'Waking from it?' Rosie nodded. She made a further effort to explain. "'After I, I did what I did that day at Duck Rock, everything was different. I—' "'Can't describe it. It was like dying and coming back. It was like... like waking. "'Do you mean that what happened before seemed... unreal?' "'She nodded again. "'Yes, that's it. It was like a play.' "'But she corrected herself quickly. "'No, it wasn't like a play. It was more than that. "'It was like a dream, an awful dream, but a dream you like, a dream you'd go through again. "'No, you wouldn't go through it again. It would kill you.' "'She grew incoherent.' Oh, I don't know, I don't know. It's it's gone, just gone. I, I don't say it wasn't real. It was real. It was a kind of frenzy. It got hold of me. It 
got hold of me body and soul. I couldn't think of anything else while it lasted. Lois was pained. But, oh, Rosie, love can't come and go like that. Can't it? Then it wasn't love. But he contradicted herself again. Yes, it was love. It was love while it lasted. While it lasted. While it lasted. The phrase seemed to be on everyone's lips. There was distress in Lois's voice as she said. But if it was love, Rosie, it, it ought to have lasted. And Rosie seemed to agree with her. Yes, it ought to have, but it didn't. It went away. It, no, it didn't go away. It just... it just wasn't. She wrung her hand, struggling with the difficulties she found in explaining herself. After that day at Duck Rock, it was like... it was like the breaking of a spell that was on me. Everything was different. It was like seeing through plain daylight again after looking through coloured glass. I didn't want the things I'd been wanting. They were foolish to me. I saw they were foolish and, and impossible. But it wasn't as if they had died. It was as if I had and come back. It was on behalf of love that Lois felt driven to make a protest. And yet, Rosie, if you were to see Claude again... No, 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 the girl cried excitedly. I don't want to see him. He needn't stay away. Not on my account, but I shan't see him if I can help it. It would be like dying the second time. All the same, he needn't be afraid of me, and his family needn't be afraid of me. I want to, I want to forget them all. Enlightenment came slowly to Lois, because of her unwillingness to be convinced of the heart's capriciousness. That love could be likened to brainstorm, obsession, the tornado whose rage dies out in an afternoon, was a wound to her tenderest beliefs. That the natural man must be taken into consideration as well as the spiritual also did violence to what she would have liked to make a serene, smooth theory of life. She stood looking long at the girl, studying her subconsciously, before she was able to say, calmly, "'Very well, Rosie dear, I'll let Claude know. I can get his address and I'll write to him.' But another surprise was in store for her. She was near the door leading from the hothouse when she became aware that Rosie was behind her and heard the same little gasping cry as before. "'Mrs. Mustman, I want to ask you something.' Lois had hardly looked round when the girl went on again. "'You know father and mother. They think the world of you, mother especially. Do you suppose they'd mind very much if I... if I turned?' Lois was puzzled. "'If you did what, Rosie?' "'If I turned?' "'If I turn Catholic?' "'Oh!' "'The reformed tradition was strong in Lois. "'She was prepared to defend it by argument and with affection. "'For a minute she was almost on the point of stating "'the historical Protestant position "'when she was deterred by the thought of Dr. Sim. "'What would he have said to Rosie? "'She remembered suddenly something that he once did say. "'If you can seize any one aspect of the Christian religion, do it. For the least of them all will save you. Remembering this, Lois withheld her arguments, asking the non-committal question, Why should you think of doing that? Rosie flushed. Oh, I don't know. I've been... She hung her head. I've been pretty bad, you know. I've told lies, and I... I tried to kill myself and everything. And you think you'd get more help that way than any other? Oh, I don't know. I went twice lately, not here, in town. It frightened me. I, I liked it. Had Lois dared, she would have asked if Jim Breen had inspired this sudden change. But she said merely, Oh, I don't believe your father and mother would feel badly in the end. Not if it brought comfort to you, Rosie dear. Is it that you want me to talk to them, to help you out? Rosie nodded silently, and with face averted in a kind of shame. "'Very well, then, I will.' "'She felt it due to her own convictions to add, "'Perhaps I can do it all the better, "'because because my personal opinions are the other way. "'They'll see I'm only seeking whatever may make for your happiness.' "'There was silence for a few seconds before she said, in conclusion, "'And, oh, Rosie dear, I do hope you'll be happy, after all, "'all that's been so hard for you.' "'Rosie was too strong and self-contained to cry.' but there was a mist in her eyes as they shook hands again and parted. 
That night Lois wrote to her husband, "'You ask me, my dear Thor, if I see my way yet, and frankly I can't say that I do. I begin, however, to wonder if there's not a reason for my remaining puzzled and so long in the dark. I begin to ask if I know what love is, if anybody knows what it is. Do you? If so, what is it? Is it the same thing for everyone, or does it differ with individuals? Is it a temporary thing, or a permanent thing, or does it matter? Is it one of the highest promptings we have, or one of the lowest? Or is it that primary impulse of animate nature which, when developed and perfected, leads to God? Is there a spiritual man and a carnal man, each with a love that can conflict with the love of the other? Is the one man on the side of the angels, as Uncle Sim would say, and the other man on that of the flesh, till the stronger gains the victory? Or is there something in love of the nature of obsession? Does it come and go like the tornado, as violent in its passage, but as quickly passed? For, darling, I begin to be afraid of love. If we are to start again, I want it to be on some other ground, a new ground, a ground we don't know anything about as yet, but which, perhaps, we shall discover. End of chapter 28《Chapter Twenty Nine of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty Nine. Forley Masterman pondered on the words Lois had written him as he tramped along the bluffs above the Mississippi, with the towers and spars of Minneapolis looming like battlements through the haze of an afternoon at the end of June. He had left the conference on new methods of treating the thyroid gland which was being held in St. Paul, in order to think his position out. Having motored over from his hotel in Minneapolis, he preferred to tramp it back. The glorious wooded way on the St. Paul side of the river was in itself an invitation to his strong, striding limbs, while the wine of western air and the stimulus of western energy quickened the savage outdoor impulse so ready to leap in his blood. The song of mating birds quickened it too, and the romance of the river gliding through the gorge below, and the beauty of the cities eyeing each other like embattled queens from headland across to headland, and through the splendour of the promise of a gold and purple sunset. It was a great setting for great thoughts, inspiring ideas so large that when he reached his hotel he found them too big to reduce easily to paper. "'You ask me what love is, and say you don't know. I'm more daring than you in that I think I do know,' I know two or three things about it, even if I don't know them all. For one thing, I know that no one can do more than say what love is for himself. You can't say what it is for me, or isn't, or must be, or ought to be. That's my secret. I can't always share it, or at any rate share it all, even with the person I love. But neither can I say what it is, or isn't, or should be, or must be, for you. You have your secret. No two people love in the same way, or get precisely the same kind of joy or sorrow from loving. Since love is the flower of personality, it has the same infinite variety that personalities possess. We give one thing, and we get back another. Do not some of our irritations, I am not speaking of you and me in particular, arise from the fact that giving one thing we expect to get the same thing back, and all the while no one else has that special quality to offer. The flower is different according to the plant that produces it. When the pine tree loved the palm, there was more than the distance to make the one a mystery to the other. Of the two things essential to love, the first, so it seems to me, is that what one gives should be one's best, the very blossom of one's soul. It may have the hot luxuriance of the hibiscus, or the flame of the wild azalea in the woods, or no more than the mildly scented flowerless bloom of the elm, or the linden that falls like manna in the roadway. Each has its beauties and its limitations, but it is worth noticing that each serves its purpose in life's infinite profusion, as nothing else could serve it to that particular end. The elm lends something to the hibiscus, the hibiscus to the elm. Neither can expect back what it gives to the other. Perfection is accomplished when each offers what it can. 
which brings me to the remaining thing I know about love, that it exists in offering. Love is the desire to go outwards, to pour forth, to express, to do, to contribute. It has no system of calculation and no yardstick for the little more or the little less. It is spontaneous and irrepressible and overflowing, and loses the extraordinary essence that makes it truly love when it weighs and measures and inspects too closely the quality of its return. It is in the fact that love is its own sufficiency, its own joy, its own compensation for all its pain, that I find it divine. The one point on which I can fully accept your Christian theology is that your God is love. Given a God who is love, and a love that is God, I can see him as worthy to be worshipped. Call him then by any name you please, Jehovah, Allah, Krishna, Christ. You still have the essence, the thing. Love to be love must feel itself infinite, or as nearly infinite as anything a human can be. When I can't pour it out in that way, when I pause to reflect how far I can go or reach a point beyond which I see that I cannot go any further, I do not truly love. Having written this much, he laid down his pen and considered. He had said nothing personal, unless it was by implication. It was only after long meditation that he decided to leave the matter there. The prime question was no longer as to whether or not he loved her, but as to whether or not she loved him. That was for her to decide. It was for her to decide without his urging or tormenting. He began to feel not only too sensitive on the subject, but too proud to make appeals to which she would probably listen out of generosity. Since he had been in the wrong, it was for her to make the advances. And so he ended his letter and posted it. The discussion continued throughout the correspondence that ensued, while he migrated from Minneapolis to Milwaukee, from Milwaukee to Denver, and from Denver to Colorado Springs. It was partly from curiosity of travel that he zigzagged in this way across the country, and partly to make it plain to Lois without saying it that he waited her permission to come home. That he should be obliged to return one day without her permission, if not with it, was a matter of course, but it would make the meeting easier if she summoned him. As a hint that she could do so and have no fear, he asked her in a postscript to one of his letters to tell him, when she next wrote, what was happening to Rosie Fay. To this she replied as simply and straightforwardly as he had put the question, imparting all that Jim Breen had told her, and whatever she had gleaned for herself, adding as a seeming afterthought in the letter she wrote next day, If Rosie could bring herself to marry Jim, it would be the happiest of all solutions, and make things easier for Claude. I think she will. If so, it won't be so much because her heart will be caught in the rebound, as that the poor little thing is mentally and emotionally exhausted, and glad to creep into the arms of any strong good man who will love her and take care of her. Just to be able to do that much will be enough for Jim. I see a good deal of him, so I know. Every time he brings an order of new plants, we have a little talk, always about Rosie. His love is of the kind you wrote about the other day, it has no yardstick for the little more or the little less in the return. Perhaps men can love like that more easily than women do. Uncle Sim seemed to hint one evening that there is generally a selfish strain in a woman's love, in that what it gets is more precious to it than what it gives. I wonder. Four received these two letters together on returning to Colorado Springs from a day's visit to that high wilderness in which John Hay sought freedom from interruption in writing his Life of Lincoln. He understood fully that Lois was deliberately being cruel in order to be kind. The very spacing out of her information over two separate days was meant to impress him, and at the same time to spare. Things would be easier for Claude, she said, when she meant that they would be easier for him. But for him it was a matter of indifference. That is, it was the same kind of matter of indifference that pain becomes in a limb that has grown benumbed. For reasons he could hardly explain, that part of his being to which Rosie Fay had made a pathetic appeal couldn't feel any more. It was like something atrophied from overstrain. There was the impulse to suffer, but no suffering. 
Moreover, he was sure that, though these nerves might one day vibrate again, they could never do so otherwise than reminiscently. To the episode he felt as a mother might feel to the dead child she has never been able to acknowledge as her own. It was something buried and yet sacred. Sacred in spite of the fact that it never should have been. As an incident in his life it had brought keen joy and keener pain. But he had already outlived both. He had outlived them as apparently Rosie had outlived them herself. Not by the passage of time, but by an intensity of experience which seemed to have covered years. He came to this conclusion not instinctively, not all at once, but by dint of reflection, as he sat on the broad terrace of the hotel, watching the transformation scene that takes place in the Rockies during the half-hour before sunset. His pipe was in his mouth, Lois's letters lay open on the little table he had drawn up beside his chair. Other tourists bore him company, scattered singly or in groups, smoking and drinking tea. A mild suggestion of Europe, a suggestion of Cap Matin or of Cannes, was blocked by the domes of the great range, and by the shifting interplay of magic lights where his eye was impelled to look for the broad still levels of Mediterranean blue. There was a wonder in the moment which the yearning in his spirit was tempted to take as symbolic, and perhaps prophetic, of his future. Where all day long he had seen nothing but hard ridges packed against one another, without water, without snow, without perspective, without a shred of mist, without a hint of mystery, without anything to set the mind to wondering what was above them or beyond them, the dissolving views of late afternoon began to throw up a succession of lovely ranges pierced by valleys, glens, and gorges. Where the eye had ached with the harsh red of the rocks spread with the harsh green of the scant vegetation, Soft vapours rose insensibly, purple, pink, and orange, changing into nameless hues as they climbed into the great clefts and veiled the rolling domes and swathed the pinnacles and furrowed the deep passes and put the horizon infinitely far away. The transmutation from conditions in which nature herself seemed for once to be barbaric, alien, hostile to civilised man, painted with Cheyenne war paint and girdled with a belt of scalps, to this breaking up of glory into glory, of colour into colour, and of form into form, rising, mingling, melting, fading, rising and mingling again, melting again, fading again, passing swiftly in a last brief recrudescence from the gold into green, and from green into black, with a hurried eclipse and the sudden tranquillity of night, the transmutation which produced all this was to Thor hopeful, and in its way inspiriting, in the last rays of light he drew out his fountain pen and the scribbling book he kept for notes by the way, writing quickly without preamble or formality. "'Thanks for telling me about Rosie. It is as it should be, as will be best. Jim saved her. Nothing so good could ever happen to her as to marry him. As for me, there are two things, Lois, that I can truthfully affirm. I can declare them the more emphatically because I have had time to think them over.' to think you over, and myself. If I ever had a doubt about them, I haven't now, because leisure and solitude have enabled me to see them clearly. The first is that I have given you my best, and the second that I have given it without any restriction of what I have been aware. If there was anything I withheld from you in which you think you should have had, I can only say that it was not of the nature of my best. What it was I make no attempt to say, nor would it do any good to try. Whatever it was, I wish neither to deprecate it nor to deny it. It was something that swept me, like the tornado of which one of your letters speaks, but it passed. It passed, leaving me tired and older, <laughs> very much older, and with an intense desire to creep home. As a physicist, I know nothing of a carnal man and a spiritual man, so that I cannot enter into your analysis. But I do know that there are higher and lower promptings in the human heart, and that in my case the higher turned to you. As compared with you, I am only as the ship compared to the haven in which it would take refuge. The ship is good for something, but it needs a port. Again he decided to leave his appeal suspended here, and on the next morning began his preparations 
for gradually turning homeward. End of chapter 29Chapter 30 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 30. It was William Sweetapple, the gardener's boy, who informed Lois that Claude had come back, throwing the information casually over his shoulder as he watered the lawn. See Mr. Claude today, um? Oh, no, you didn't, Sweetapple, Lois contradicted. Mr. Claude is in the West. He may be in the West now, um. "'But he wasn't at twenty-five minutes past two this afternoon.' Sudden fear brought Lois down a step or two of the portico, over the Corinthian pillars of which roses clambered in early July profusion. In white, in a broad-brimmed winter-halter hat, from which a floating green veil hung over her shoulders and down her back, her strong, slim figure seemed to have gained in fulfilment of herself, even in the weeks that Thor had been away. "'Where did you see him, sweet apple? Or think you saw him?' Sweet Apple turned the nozzle of the hose so as to develop a crown of spray with which he bedewed the roses of all colours grouped in a great central bed. I didn't think em. It was him. Well, where? See him first going to the woods leading up to Dot Rock. That was when I was on my way to Lawyer Petley's. Did you see him twice? See him again as I come back. He was down in the road by that time, looking up toward Old Man Fay's, at Libby Obson's place that is to be. Old man Fay's got a quit. Found him moved already. You knew that, didn't you, um? It was because Lois was really alarmed by this time that she said, Oh, you must have been mistaken, sweet apple. Mo oh, just as you say, um, sweet apple agreed. But I see him. It was him. She withdrew again, reseating herself in the shade of the semicircular open porch protecting the side door, where she had been writing on a pad. Though so near the roadway, a high growth of shrubs screened her from all but the passers up and down Willoughby's Lane. At this time of the year they were relatively few, many of the residents of County Street having already gone to the seaside or the mountains. Lois enjoyed the seclusion thus afforded her, and the tranquillity. The garden and her poorer neighbours gave an outlet to her need for physical activity, while in the solitude of the house, and in that wider solitude created by the absence of all the Willoughby's and Masterman's, Something within her was being healed. It was being healed, but healed in a way that left her changed. The change was manifest in what she said, when, with the pad on her knee again, she began to write. I am deeply moved, dear Thor, by your last letter from Colorado Springs, and would gladly say something adequate in response to it. When I can, I will, if I ever can. As to that, the decisive word must be with time. I cannot hurry it. I can give you no assurance now. Now I feel... But why should I repeat it? An illusion once dispelled can rarely be brought back. Still less can you replace it by reality. What we are looking for is a substitute for love. You may have found it, but I have not. I can accept your definition of love as a giving out, a pouring forth, a desire to do and to contribute. But it is precisely here that I failed to respond to the test. There is something in me stagnated or dammed up. My heart feels like a well that has gone dry. I have nothing to yield. I understand what Rosie Fay said to me the day when I talked to her on Duck Rock. I'm empty. I've given all I had to give. It was less blameworthy on her part than on mine, because she, poor little thing, had given so much and I so little. And yet my supply seems to be exhausted. It must have been thin and shallow to begin with. As I feel at present, it would take a new creation to replenish it. With regard to my calling forth what is best in you, dear Thor, well, anyone would do that, or anything. You're one of those who have nothing but the best to offer. Do you know what Uncle Sim said of you last night? Thor is always on the side of the angels, and though he makes mistakes, they'll rescue him. They will, dear Thor, I'm sure of it. They may rescue us both. Even as at present, I don't see how. Having written this much, she paused to, to ask what she should say further. Should she speak of his coming home? No. Since the address he had given her indicated that he was on his way, it was best that he should take the responsibility of his own return. 
Should she tell him that Sweet Apple thought he'd seen Claude? No, it would alarm him without doing any good. If Claude was back, he was back. Besides which, Sweet Apple might be wrong. So she signed her name with her usual significant abruptness, sealing the envelope and addressing it. Her hesitation came in putting on the stamp. Somehow the letter seemed too cold to send. She didn't want it to be cold, only to be sincere. Sincerity during these weeks of solitude had become a sort of obsession. She couldn't tell him that she had forgiven him as long as resentment lingered in her heart, and yet she was anxious not to wound him more than she could help. Wounding him, she wounded herself more deeply, for in spite of everything, his pain was hers. Slowly she tore the letter open again, to a sunset chorus of birds of whose song she had just become conscious. From tree to tree they fluted to one another and answered back, now with a reckless, passionate warble, now with a long, liquid love-note. It was the voice of the rich world that lay around her, a world of flowers and lawns and meadows and upland woods and cool, deep shades and mellowing light. But it was also the voice that had accompanied her into the enchanted land on that winter's day when Thor had kissed her wrist. The day seemed now immeasurably far away in time, and the enchanted land had been left behind her. But the voice was still there, fluting, calling, reminding, entreating, with an insistence that almost made her weep. She wrote hurriedly in postscript, "'If there was ever anything I could do for you, dear Thor, "'perhaps what I used to feel would come back to me. "'If it only would. "'If I could only be great and generous and inexacting as you would be. "'I want to be, Thor, darling. I long to be. "'But I am like a person paralysed whose limbs no longer answer to his will. "'I pray for recovery and restoration. "'But will it ever come?' "'As encouragement to Thor,' She was no more satisfied with this than with what she had said earlier, but it expressed all she could allow herself to say. Anything more would have permitted him to infer such things as he had permitted her to infer, an accident that must have no repetition. She ended the note definitely, getting it ready for the post. She was still engaged in doing so when, the crunching of footsteps causing her to lift her head, she saw Claude. Having come round to the side portico on a hint from Widom Sweetapple, he stood at a little distance, smiling. He was smiling, but as a dead man might smile. Lois could neither rise nor speak from awe. Claude himself could neither speak nor advance. He stood like a spectre, but a spectre who has been in hell. The very smile was that of the spectre who has no right to come out of hell, and yet has come. Lais was not precisely troubled. She was terrified. If Claude had only spoken a word or taken a step forward, it would have broken the spell that held her dazed and dumb. But he did nothing. He only stood and smiled that awful smile which expressed more anguish than any rictus of pain. He stood just as he came into sight on turning the corner of the house, with the many colours of the rose-bed at his left hand. It was exactly like this, she had always imagined, that disembodied spirits or astral forms made their appearances to portend death. She got possession of her faculties at last. Claude! She could just whisper it. He continued to smile as he advanced and came up the steps, but it was not till he was actually beside her that he said, in a voice which might also have been that of a dead man, You didn't expect me, did you? She remembered afterwards that they neither shook hands nor exchanged any of the usual forms of greeting, but at the minute it didn't seem natural that they should. Her own tone was as strained as his, as she answered awesomely, "'No. Sit down, Claude. When did you come?' Throwing his hat on the floor, he dropped wearily into a deck-chair and closed his eyes. With the sharp profile grown extraordinarily white and thin, the dead man expression terrified her again. She wished he would raise his head and look at her, look more like life. All he did was to open his eyes heavily as he replied, Got back yesterday. It was less from interest than from the desire to get on the plane of actual things that she asked, Where are you staying? I slept at the house last night. 
old Mags, the caretaker, has the keys, so I made him let me in. But are you going to stay any time? Might as well. Don't see why not. There was so much to say, and so much she was afraid to say, that she hardly knew with what to begin. Weren't you, she ventured timidly, weren't you having a good time? His answer, as he lay back with eyes closed again, was another of his smiles, only dimmer now with a faint, bitter sweetness. She knew it was like asking a man if his pain is better when it is killing him. Nevertheless, the ground of common, practical things was the only one to keep to, so she went on. But you won't like sleeping at the house every night with no one in it. Don't you want to come here? He shook his head. No, thanks. Mrs. Maggs will make my bed and give me breakfast. That's all I need. Get the rest of my meals in town. But you'll stay to dinner now, won't you? He lifted himself up in his chair at last, his face taking on its first look of life. Thor be there? Why, no. Thor's away. In the West. Didn't you know? He started nervously. Away in the West? Not looking for me? She tried to smile. Of course not. He went to attend the Medical Congress in Minneapolis. He's on his way home now. When do you expect him? Oh, not at once. I don't know when. He's taking his time. He studied her a while with eyes that seemed to read her secret. What for? Not to see the country, I suppose. My last letter was from Colorado Springs. He dropped back into the chair with a tired sigh of relief. All right, I'll stay to dinner. Thanks. She allowed him to rest, asking no more questions that she could help, till dinner was over and they had come out again on the portico, so that he might have his cigar in the cool, scented evening air. She was more at ease with him, too, now that she could no longer see the suffering in his pinched, emaciated face. Claude, why did you come home? He withdrew the cigar from his lips just long enough to say, Because I couldn't stay away. Why couldn't you? Because I couldn't. Don't you think it would have been well to make the effort? What was the good of making the effort when I couldn't keep it up? But you kept it up for a while. Not after... after I heard. Heard about Rosie? He made an inarticulate sound of assent. What did you hear? I heard what she did. How? Who told you? And that chump Biddy Cheever wrote me. How did he know it had anything to do with you? Oh, I was fool enough to tell him about her once, and so he caught on to it. Put two and two together, I suppose, when he heard that... She seized the opportunity to make the first incision toward getting in her point. That she threw herself into the pond? Did he say that Jim Breen dived after her and brought her up? He answered indifferently. He said someone did. He didn't say who. It was Jim. He saved her. As the statement evoked no response, she continued, Claude, what did you come home for? Again he withdrew his cigar from his mouth, looking at her obliquely. To marry her. She allowed some time to elapse before saying, Claude, I don't think you will. Oh, yes, I shall. What makes you so sure? Because I am. I'm not, or rather, if I am sure, it's the other way. He sprang up, seizing her by the arm, over which there was nothing but a gauze scarf by way of covering. Lois, for God's sake, what do you mean? You know something. Tell me. She hasn't gone away with Thor, has she? She too sprang up, shaking off his hand as if it had been a serpent. You fool, don't touch me. She'll marry Jim Breen. She'll be in love with him in a week or two. It was all over in an instant, but the blaze in her eyes seemed literally to knock him down. He fell back into the deck chair again though he sat astride on it with his feet on the floor, covering his face with his hands. "'I beg your pardon, Lois,' he muttered humbly. "'I don't know what I'm saying.' "'No, you don't,' she agreed, speaking breathlessly because the leaping of her heart was so wild. "'But that's hardly an excuse for taking leave altogether of your senses.' He continued to mutter into his hands. "'I'm crazy. I'm drunk. I'm stark mad. I'm... Oh, Lois, if you knew what I've been through, you wouldn't mind.' The hot anger that had rolled over her with a wrath such as she had never felt before began to roll away again, 
leaving her sick and shivering. It was an excuse for going to the house to find a cloak, and for getting the minute's respite necessary to self-control. To regain it, to overcome that throb of her being, of which the after-effect was a faintness unto death, she was obliged to walk steadily, holding her head high. She was obliged, too, to repent of the tigress impulse with which she had turned on Claude, flinging in his face that for which she had meant to prepare him by degrees. The fact that it had seemingly passed over his head was no palliation to the outrage. As she mounted the stairs and went to her room, she repeated her own formula. Nothing that isn't kind and well thought out beforehand. What she had said had been neither well thought out nor kind, but the temptation had been overwhelming. For the instant, it had seemed secondary that Thor hadn't taken Rosie to the West, since Claude, who knew so much more of the inner history of the episode than she did herself, had thought such an action possible. More clearly than ever before, she saw that some appalling struggle for the possession of the little creature must have taken place, and that it had been going on during those months when life was apparently so peaceful, and she had been living in her fool's paradise. It was not till she had lost the fight that Thor had come to her in the snowbound woods, with the twitter of birds and the deep music of the treetops accompanying those half-truths she had been eager to believe. She herself had been fatuous and vain in assuming that he could love her, but if there was little to say for her, there was nothing at all to be said for him. He had been the more false for the reason that, as far as he went, he had been sincere. It was his very sincerity that had tricked her, Less than that at any time since the day when he had stammered out his futile explanations did she feel it possible to pardon him. But there was something else. Now, if she chose, she could know. In his present state of mind, Claude would betray anything. She had only to question him, to throw the emphasis adroitly here or there, and the whole story would come out. It was like having a key come into her hands, a key that would unlock all those mysteries which were her terror. She was still irresolute, however, as to using it, after she had taken an old opera cloak from a wardrobe, thrown it over her shoulders, and gone downstairs again. She found Claude as she had left him, astride on the deck chair, his face in his hands, the burning end of the cigar that protruded between his fingers making a point of light. The abject attitude moved her to pity in spite of everything. She herself remained standing, her tall figure thrown into dim relief between two of the right Corinthian pillars of the portico. By standing, it seemed to her obscurely, she could more easily escape if any such awful revelation as she was afraid of were to spring on her against her will. She could almost feel it waiting for her in the depths of the heavy-scented darkness. For the minute, however, the folly of Claude's return was the matter immediately to be dealt with, to get him to go away again was the end to be attained. It was with this in view, as well as with a measure of compassion, that she said, "'You poor Claude, you have been through things, haven't you?' The answer came laconically. "'Been in hell.' "'Yes, that's what I thought,' she agreed simply. "'I thought it the instant you came round the corner this afternoon. "'But why? For what reason, exactly?' He lifted his haunted face, stammering out his recital in a way that reminded her of Thor. She could see that he had profited by his mistake of a few minutes earlier, and that just as Thor had tried to tell Claude's story without involving his own, so Claude was endeavouring to spare her by doing the same thing. Being able to supply the blanks more accurately now than on the former occasion, she found a kind of poignant, torturing amusement in fitting her knowledge in. He began with his first meeting with Rosie, describing the scene. He had not taken the adventure seriously, not any more than he had taken a dozen similar. Girls like that could generally be thrown off as easily as they were taken on, and they bore you no ill will for the change. As a matter of fact, a new flirtation generally began where the old one ended, which made part of the fun for the girl as for the man. He was speaking of respectable girls, Lois was to understand, village girls, shop girls, and others of the higher wage-earning variety, who didn't mind showing a spice of devil before they married and settled down. Lots of them didn't, and were no worse for it in the end. It had not occurred to him that Rosie would be different from others of the class, or that she would take in deadly earnest what was no more than play for him. When he had made this discovery, he had tried to withdraw, 
but only with the result of becoming involved more deeply. Over the processes by which he was led finally to pledge himself, he grew incoherent, as also over the signs which caused him to suspect that Rosie was playing fast and loose with him. His muttering as to, somebody else was in love with her, and who was ready to put up money, threw her back on memories of his uneasy questions concerning Thor on the evenings after the return from the honeymoon. It was with a sense of the key slipping into the lock that she said, "'And that made you jealous?' "'As the devil. "'It was because he did it that I knew I couldn't give her up, "'that I'd never let her go.' "'There was sincere curiosity in her tone as she asked the question. "'But, Lord, why did you?' "'Because she lied to me.' "'Oh, and had you never lied to her?' "'He mumbled something about that not being the same thing. "'She swore to me that there'd never be any put-up job between her and... and she helped him out. The, the other person. She could hear the key grating as it turned. And was there? He made the impatient circular movement of his head, as though his collar chafed him, with which he was familiar. He was gaining time in order to use tact. Oh, I don't know. There was, there was something. Whatever it was, she denied it, when all the while they were... She felt obliged fully to turn the key. She knew how perilous the question might be, but it was beyond her to keep it back. They were what, Claude? They were trying to catch me in a trap. It was like the door into the Hall of Mysteries opening, but only to make disclosures dimmer and more mystifying still. The postponement of dreadful certainties enabled her, however, to say with some slight relief, But this, this other person... "'Couldn't have been very fond of her himself if he, if he gave her up to you.' "'He bowed his head still lower into his hands, muttering towards the floor. "'Oh, I don't know. I, I don't care now. "'Anyhow, she lied to me, and—' "'He lifted his haggard eyes again. "'And I jumped at it. I, I saw the way out, and I jumped at it. "'I told her, I, I told her I'd, I'd go and marry someone else.' "'Did you mean Elsie Darling?' "'He nodded speechlessly.' It was to come back again to the point which her anger had caused her to miss that she went forward and laid her hand on his shoulder kindly. "'I would, Claude, if I were you,' she said in a matter-of-fact voice. "'She'd make you a good wife.' "'No one will make me a good wife now,' he said hoarsely. "'I'm going to marry Rosie. I'll marry her if it puts me in the gutter. I'll marry her if I never have a cent.' She went back to her place between the pillars, leaning against one of them. "'But, Claude,' she reasoned, "'would that do any good? "'Would it make either of you happy "'after all that's been said and done?' "'He seemed to writhe. "'I don't care anything about that. "'I've got to do it.' "'You haven't got to do it "'if Rosie doesn't want it. "'It's got nothing to do with her.' "'She looked at him in astonishment. "'Nothing to do with her? "'What do you mean?' "'He tried to explain further.' He had not primarily come back to atone for the suffering he had inflicted on Rosie, or because his love for her was such that he couldn't live without her. He had come back to propitiate the demon within himself. The demon or the god, he was not sure which it was, for it possessed the attributes of both. He had come back to escape the chastisement his soul inflicted on itself, because without coming back he could no longer be a man. He had come back because the furies had driven him with their whip of knotted snakes, and he could do nothing but yield to their hounding. If Lois thought that travelling in the West was beer and skittles when hunted and scourged by yourself like that, well, she'd better try it and see. What she must understand already was that Rosie and happiness had become minor considerations. He would sacrifice both to regain a measure of his self-respect. He had never supposed, and he didn't suppose now, that Rosie would be happy in marrying him, but that was no longer the point. The demon or the god must be appeased, no matter what cost to the victim. He made these explanations not straightforwardly or concisely, but with rambling digressions that took him over half the Middle West. He described, or hinted at, all sorts of scenes, peopled by gay young businessmen and garnished by pretty girls, in which he could have enjoyed himself had it not been for the enemy in his heart. It wasn't merely that he had thrown over Rosie with a cruelty that made her try to kill herself, and still less was, was it that he couldn't live down his love when once he set about it. 
it was that the Claude who might have been was strangled and slain, leaving him no inner fellowship but with the Claude who was. Reviving the Claude who might have been was like reviving a corpse, and yet there was nothing to do but make the attempt. "'I'm a gentleman, what?' he asked, raising his white face pitifully. "'I must act like a gentleman, what?' "'Yes, but if it's too late, Claude, for that particular thing—' "'Oh, but it isn't. It won't be. Not when she sees me.' "'It might be. And if she doesn't want it, Claude, I don't see why you— "'Don't see why, because you're not me. If you were, you would. A woman hasn't a man's sense of honour, anyhow.' She let this pass with an inward smile in order to say, "'But, Claude, suppose you can't do it?' He twisted his neck with his customary chafing, irritated movement. "'I'll do it, or croak.' "'Oh, but that's nonsense.' "'To you, not to me. You haven't been through the mill that I've been ground up in. You don't know what it is to have been born, born a gentleman, and to have blasted yourself into human remains. That's what I am now, not a man, say nothing of a gentleman, just human remains, too awful to look at.' She tried to reason with him. "'But, Claude, you mustn't exaggerate things "'or put the punishment out of proportion to the crime. "'Admitting that what you did to Rosie was dishonourable, "'but brutal, if you like. "'Oh, it isn't that. "'It's what I did to myself. "'Can't you see?' "'She saw, but not with the intensity of Claude himself. "'Sitting down at last, she let him talk again. "'He'd felt something shattered in him,' so he said, "'at the very minute when he had turned to leave the cucumber house "'on the day of the final rupture.' He knew already that he was a cad, and that he was doing what only a cad would have done, but he had expected the remorse to pass. He had known himself for a cad on other occasions, and yet had outlived the sense of shame. That he should outlive it again he had taken for granted, though he knew that this time he couldn't do it without suffering. He was willing to take the suffering. He was not especially unwilling that Rosie should take it too. In her way she had been as much to blame as he was. Though he didn't question the sincerity of her love for him, she had plotted and schemed to catch him, because from her point of view he was a rich man's son, and even so had had moments of disloyalty. He found it not unreasonable to expect her to share the responsibility for what had overtaken her. But she, too, would outlive the pain of it, and follow his example in marrying someone else. Lois felt her opportunity to have fully come. "'I think she will.' "'She'll marry Jim Breen, if you'll only leave her alone.' "'Oh, rot!' "'The tone expressed the degree of importance he attached to this possibility. "'He went on again, discursively, incoherently, "'covering much of the same ground, "'but with new and illuminating details, "'details of which the background was still a jumble of suppers and dances and journeys, "'but in which the god, or the demon, gave him no rest.' His distaste for diversion having declared itself from the day of his starting for Chicago, he had whipped up an appetite to counteract it. Availing himself of the freedom of a young man, plentifully applied with money for the first time in his life, he had made use of all the resources with which strange and exciting cities could furnish him to get back his zest in light-heartedness. The result was not in pleasure, but in disgust, and a horror of himself that grew. It grew from the beginning like some giant, poisonous weed. It grew while he was in Chicago. It grew with each further stage of his journey, in St. Louis, in Cincinnati, in Los Angeles. It was in Los Angeles that he had received Billy Cheever's letter with the news of Rosie's mad leap, and he knew for a certainty that the only thing to be done was to turn his face eastward. Whatever happened, and whoever suffered, he must redeem himself. Redemption had become for him a need more urgent than food, more vital than life. Though he didn't use the word, though his terms were simple and boyish and slangy, Lois could see that his stress was that which sent pilgrims to the Holy Sepulchre and drove Judas to go and hang himself. Redemption lay in marrying Rosie and restoring his honour and bringing the thought who might have been back to life. Indeed, it was difficult to tell at times which of the two were slain, whether the Claude who might have been, or the other Claude, so distraught and involved were his appeals. But, beyond marrying Rosie and keeping his word, being a gentleman, as he expressed it, his outlook didn't extend. Any damn thing that liked could happen, 
when that atoning act had been accomplished. There were so many repetitions in his turns of thought that Lois ended by following them no more than listlessly. Not that she had ceased to be interested, but her mind was occupied with other phases of the drama. She remembered what she had so often heard, that in the Mastermans there was this extraordinary strain of idealism of which no one could foresee the turn it would take. She knew the traditions of the great-grandfather, whose heart had broken on finding that America was not the regenerated land he hoped for. Tales were still current in the village of old Dr. Masterman, his son, who, through sheer confidence in his fellow men, never paid anyone he owed, and never collected money from anyone who owed it to him. Archie Masterman, in the next generation, was supposed to have taken the altruistic tendency by the throat in himself, and choked it down. But Uncle Sim was a byword of eccentric goodness throughout the countryside. Now the impasse was manifest in Claude, in this revulsion against his own failure, in this marred and broken vision of a something to which he had not been true. And as for Thor... But here she was tortured and frightened. Who knew what this strange inheritance might be working in him? Who could tell how big and tender and transcending it might become? That it would be transcending and tender and big was certain. If poor, frivolous, futile Claude could feel like this, could feel that he must redeem his soul, though any damn thing that liked should happen as the price of his redemption, in Thor the yearning would outflank her range. Might not the secret of secrets be that? Might not that which she had been seeing as treachery to herself be no more than a conflict of aspirations? If Claude, with his blurred distortion of the divine in him, served no other purpose, he at least threw a light on Thor. Thor too was a masterman, Thor too was born to the vision, to the longing after the nationally perfect that had become legendary since the time of the great-grandfather, to the sweet neighbourly affection that ran through all the tales of that man's son, to the sturdy righteousness of Uncle Sim, to the standards of honour for which poor Claude had fallen as angels fall, and to God only knew what high prompting strangled and vitiated in his father. Thor was heir to it all, with something of his own to boot, something strong, something patient, something laborious and loyal, something long-suffering and winning and meek, that might have marked the leader of a rebellious people, or a pagan, sceptic Christ. Her mind was so full of this ideal of the man against whom, and also for whom, her heart was hot, that she made no effort to detain Claude, when, after long silence, he picked up his hat and slipped away into the darkness. End of chapter 30《Chapter Thirty One of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Thirty One. He slipped away into the darkness, but only to do what he had done on the previous evening after making arrangements with old Mags. He climbed the hill north of the pond, not so much in the hope of seeing Rosie or any one else, as to haunt the scenes so closely associated with his spiritual downfall. It was a languorous, luscious night, with the scent of new-mown hay mingling with that of gardens. If there was any breeze, it was lightly from the east, bringing that mitigation of the heat traditional to the week following Independence Day. As there was no moon, the stars had their full midsummer intensity, the scorpion trailing hotly on the southern horizon, with Antares throwing out a fire like the red rays in a diamond. Beneath it, the city flung up a yellow glow that might have been the smoke of a distant conflagration, while from the hilltop the suburbs were a sparkle. As, standing in the road, Claude looked through the open gateway down over the slope of land, the hothouse roofs and the distant levels of the pond gleamed with a faint ghostly radiance like the sheen of ancient tarnished crystal. The house was dark. It was dark and dead. It was dark and dead and haunted. Everything was haunted. Everything was dark. Even the furnace chimney looming straight and black against the stars was plumeless. But in the silence and stillness there was something that drew him on. He crossed the road and went a few paces within the gate. He had not ventured so far on the previous evening, 
and during the day he had dared no more than to look upward from the boulevard below, after that pilgrimage to the Duck Rock on which William Sweetapple had surprised him. Now, in the darkness and quietness, he stood, not searching so much as dreaming. He was dreaming of Rosie, dreaming of her with a kind of cheer. After all, he would be bringing joy to her as well as getting peace of spirit for himself. It wouldn't be so hard. She would meet him as she used to meet him here, as she used to let him come and visit her. And then the atonement would be made. The process would be simple, and he should become a man again. The conviction was so sweet that he lingered to enjoy it, penetrating a few steps farther into the spacious dimness of the yard. It was the first minute of inward ease he had known since he had turned his back on it. Now that he was once more on the spot, the Claude, who was a devil of a fellow, something of a sport, but a decent chap all the same, began again to run with red blood where there had been nothing but a whining, shrivelling apostate. It was like rejuvenescence, like a recreation. Suddenly something moved. It moved at first in the shadow of the house, and then out in the starlit spaces. It moved stealthily and creepily, and with a grotesque swiftness. Its action seemed irregular and uncertain, like that of some night-marauding animal, till Claude perceived that it was stalking him. He waited long enough to get a view that was almost clear of a crouching attitude, crouching attitude of a beast when it means to spring, whereupon he turned and fled. That is, he turned and walked away swiftly. He would have run had it not been for his renaissance self-respect. He couldn't bring himself to run from poor old Fay, even though his nerves were tingling. He tried to reassure himself by saying that it was no more than a repetition of that dogging to which he had been subjected before, and that it would discontinue once he was off the premises. But when he turned to glance over his shoulder, it seemed to him that the sinister footsteps glided after him. That, he reasoned, might have been no more than fancy. Dark lights were rare on this rather lonely road, and the enormous shadows they flung lent themselves to the startling of sick imaginations. Nevertheless, as he walked, Claude continued to look back over his shoulder, always with renewed impressions of a creepy thing trying to track him down. Having entered the obscurity of their own driveway, he broke at last into a light, soundless trot, which was not slackened till he reached the relative protection of the door. But by morning he had regained a measure of tranquillity. Knowing what he had to do, he was resolved to do it promptly. With sunlight and summer, and the sense of being home again to brace him up, the Claude, who was a devil of a fellow, seemed in a fair way to be reborn. Waiting after breakfast only long enough to be discreet, he took his way up the hill again. He was confident by this time, and the more so because of his being beyond the need of concealments. There would be no more shrinking into the odorous depths of the hothouse, or hesitancies or equivocations. He would walk up and avow himself, to father and mother, as well as to Rosie. The hero in him was coming to his own at last. The gash in the hothouse roof which he could see from a distance was what he noticed first. In his two nocturnal visits this had not been apparent. Now that he saw it, he stood stock still. It was something like a gash within himself, a gash in his courage, perhaps, or a gash in the dream of a reconstituted self. He knew vaguely that his father had refused the renewal of the lease, and that at some time in the near future Fay would have to go, but he had not expected the immediate signs of a complete demoralisation. Now that they were there, they disconcerted him. He went on till he was in view of the house. It gave him the blind stare with which empty houses respond to interrogation. He continued his way to the gate and into the yard. All was neglected and fantastically overgrown. Vetch, burdock and yarrow were in luxuriant riot with the planting and seeding of the spring. No living creature was in sight but a dappled mare, whose round body and heavy fetlocks spoke of a canoe strain, hitched in the shade of the magnolia tree. The mare wore a straw hat, to which was attached a bunch of artificial roses, and switched her tail to drive away the flies. Harnessed to a light form of dray, the animal suggested business, so that Claude put on a business air, going forward with the assurance of one who has a right to be on the spot. He had not advanced twenty paces before the hothouse door opened to allow the passage of a fern-tree in a giant wooden pot, behind which K. 
came the pleasant countenance of Jim Breen, red and perspiring from so much exertion under a July sun. Claude paused till the fern tree was deposited in the dray, when the two men stared at each other across the intervening space. For the first time, Lois's mention of the young Irishman's name returned to Claude as significant. What the young Irishman thought of him he had no means of knowing, for a sudden eclipse across the cheery face was followed by an equally sudden clearing. "'Hello, Claude.' Jim threw off the greeting guardedly, and yet with a certain challenge. His very use of the Christian name was meant to be a token of man-to-man -man equality. Having attended the public school with Claude, and taken part with him in ball games at an age too early for class distinctions, he was plainly disposed to use that fact as a basis of privilege. He attempted, however, no other advance, remaining sturdily at the tail of his dray, hatless and in his shirt-sleeves, but with head erect and grey eyes set fixedly. The only conciliating feature was his smile, which had come back, not with its native spontaneity, but daringly and aggressively, as a brave man smiles at a foe. Claude resented the attitude, he resented the smile, he resented the use of his Christian name, but he was resolved to be diplomatic. He went forward a few steps farther still, but in spite of himself his voice trembled when he spoke. M Mr. Fay around? Jim answered nonchalantly. No, gone to town. Want a good fern tree, Claude? Two or three caucus here. Look at that one now. Get it cheap, too. Dandy in the corner of a big room. Sickeningly aware of his feebleness in contrast with this easy, honest figure, Claude made an effort to be manly and matter-of-fact. Mr. Fay selling off? Oh, not exactly selling off. Fix things up with father. Father's taking the stock, and Mr. Fay's going in with him. Didn't want this old place any longer, Jim continued loftily. Kind of clung to it because he put money into it like. Money eater, that's what it was. Make more in a year with father than he would in this old rockery in ten. Had to be Hobson's bought the place. Know that, don't you? Come to think it was your old man who owned it. Well, it's Hadley B. Hobson's now. Or will be the day after tomorrow. Have a swell residence here. Good enough for that. Too small for a plant like Mr. Fay's. Claude did his best to digest such details in this information as were new to him, while he nerved himself to say, Is Miss Fay about? Jim nodded towards the blank windows of the house. Moved. Better take a fern tree, Claude. Won't get a bargain like this. Not if every florist in the town goes bankrupt. This one's a peach. You'll call it a scream compared to the one I've got inside. Bring it out so as you can get a squint at it. Can't wait, can you? Well, so long. Got to finish my job. Back, Maud, back. Any time you do want a fern tree, Claude. Claude was obliged to speak peremptorily in order to detain him. I want to know where the Fays have moved to. To town, was the ready answer. Well, so long. If I don't get on with my job. What part of town? Jim turned at the hothouse door. Oh, a very nice part. Well, that's not telling me. No, the young Irishman threw back with his peculiar smile. If you take my advice, you won't ask anybody else. If old man Fay was to see you within a mile of the place. Claude decided to be confidential. Old man Fay has no reason to be afraid any longer, Jim. Not as far as I'm concerned. Oh, it isn't as far as you're concerned. It's as far as he is. The boot's on that foot now. Claude loathed this discussion with a man so inferior to himself, but he was obliged to get his information somehow. If he thinks... It's not what he thinks, but what he knows. That's what's the matter with old man Fay. If I was you, I'd give him a darn wide berth from now on. Yes, but Jim, you don't understand. I understand what I'm telling you, Claude. If you don't clear out of this village for the next six months... Claude was beside himself with exasperation. But good God, man, I've come back to marry Rosie. Now, don't you see? Jim stalked forward from the hothouse door, standing over the smaller, slighter man with a tolerant kindliness which persisted in his sunny, steely smile. No, I don't see. You clear out. Take a friend's advice. Whether you come back to marry Rosie or whether you haven't won't make a sense worth a difference to old man Fay. Clear out, all the same. In his excitement, Claude screamed shrilly, "'Like hell I will!' "'Like hell you have to. Mind you, Claude, I'm telling you as a friend. And as for marrying Rosie, 
Well, you can't. Claude became aggressive. If that's because you think you can. Gee, me, what do you know about that? It's all I can do to get her to look at the same side of the road I'm on, so far. But if I can't, still less can you, and for a very good reason. What reason? Claude demanded with his best attempt to be stern. The other became solemn and dramatic. The reason that... that she's dead. Claude jumped. Dead? What in thunder are you talking about? She wasn't dead this afternoon. Oh, yes, she was, Claude. That, Rosie. She... she drowned herself. When I dived in after her, it was another Rosie altogether that I brought up. Do you get me? Claude broke in with smothered objurgations, but Jim, feeling the value of the vein he had started, persisted in going on with it. He did so not bitterly or reproachfully, but with a playful Celtic sadness, in which a misty blinking of the eyes struggled with the smile that continued to hover on his lips. The rosy you knew, Claude, was all limp and white as I held her in my arms, while Robbie Willett rowed us ashore. She was gone. The soul was out of her. She was as much in heaven as she'd been dead a week. Her eyes were shut and her eyelashes wet, just as you might see the fringe of a flower hung with dewdrops of a morning. And her mouth. You know the kind of mouth she's got, a little open when she looks at you, as if you'd taken her by surprise, like. Well, that's the way it was then, a, a wee little bit open, as if she was going to speak, but more as if she were going to cry. And her lips, that white. And not a beat to her heart, no matter how tight you held her. When Dr. Hill brought the breath into her again, it was a different Rosie that came back entirely. Claude wheeled away in order to hide the spasm that shot across his face. "'I'll oh, shut up, damn you!' was all he had the strength to say. But the tone moved Jim to compunction. The Irishman in him came out as he tried to make things easier for Claude, without at the same time desisting from his object. "'Sure, you couldn't tell that was the way she'd take it. You couldn't tell that at all. If you'd known it beforehand, you'd have acted quite different. You'll know that. Anyone else might have done the same thing that was... that was... He sought a consolatory phrase. That was like you. He plunged still further. I might have done it myself if I hadn't... hadn't been built the other way round. Only that won't matter to old man Fay. Nor to Matt, neither. Claude turned so suddenly pale at the mention of the brother that Jim followed up his advantage. The old fellow has to be out of this by tomorrow night, and Mac gets his walking ticket from Colcord the next morning. He laid his strong, earthy hand on the neat summer black-and-white check of Claude's shoulder, with the lightest hint of turning him in the direction of the gate. Now, if you make yourself scarce for a spell, I'll be able to manage them both and coax them back to their senses. Though he felt himself irresistibly impelled toward the road, Claude made an effort to recover his dignity. "'If you think I'm going to run away—' Jim slipped his arm through his companions, helping him along. "'Sure you're not going to run away. Lay low for a spell, that's all you'll be doing. Old man Fay is crazy. Stark, staring, roaring crazy. It isn't you, and it isn't Rosie. It's having to get out of here. It was bluff what I said a minute ago about the place being too small for his plant.' He's dotty on these three old hothouses. My lord, you think no one ever had hothouses before, and never would again. You think it was the end of the world to hear him talk. You'd die laughing. The fellow he'd like to put it over on is your old man. He gives me a mouthful about him three or four times a day. And it'd be a barrel full of buckshot in the back if he could get at him. Lucky he's in Europe. But I'll calm him down, don't you fret. And I'll calm down Matt once I get at him. Let me have two months. Let me have a month, and I'll have them coming to you like a grey squirrel comes for nuts. Out in the roadway, Claude made a last effort to react against his humiliation, doing it almost tearfully. But look here, Jim, I've got to marry Rosie. I've got to. The Irishman and the young man were still in the ascendant as he wagged his head sympathetically. Sure, you've got to, if she wants it. Well, she does want it, doesn't she? She must have told you so, or you wouldn't know so much about it. She told me all about it from seeding to sail, and it's God's truth I'm handing out to you. No bluff at all. This, Rosie, is another proposition. I'll marry her whatever she is. 
Lord declared bravely, and I've got to see her too. Jim looked thoughtful. It isn't so easy to see her because... Well, now, I'll tell you straight, Lord, because it makes her kind of sick to think of you. Oh, that's nothing, he hastened to add, on seeing a second convulsion pass across Lord's face. Sure, she'd feel the same about anyone she'd done the like of that to her. Now, wouldn't she? It isn't you at all, not any more than it'd be me or anybody else. If I could see her, Claude said weakly, I, I, I'd explain. Ah, but you couldn't explain quick enough. That's where the trouble about that would be. She'd be down on the floor in a faint before you'd be able to say knife. You couldn't get near her at all, at all, not this, Rosie. Not if it was to explain away the ground beneath her feet. She'd get over that, Claude began to plead. She'd get over if it didn't kill her first, but it's my belief it would. If you could have seen her the night she told me about you, it was like cutting out her own heart and picking it to pieces. She's never mentioned you before nor since, and I don't think ever will again. No, Lord, he continued in a reasoning tone, there's no two ways about it, but you've got to get out. For a spell, at any rate. If you don't, old man of Fay will be after you with a gun. And what Matt Fay will do may be worse. I can handle them if you'll keep from hanging yourself out like a red rag to a bull-like. But if you don't, then the Lord only knows what'll happen. What'll happen? Claude cried with a final upleaping of resistance. He said, you'll marry Rosie. I'll marry her if she'll have me. Don't you fret about that. But I won't try to marry her. Never do I see that she's got the least little bit of a wish to marry you, Claude. I'll play fair. If she changes her mind from the way she is now, and gets so as to be able to think of you again, and wants you, wants you of her own free will, then I'll put up the bands for you myself, and that's honest to God. He offered his hand on the compact, but Claude didn't take it. He didn't take it because he didn't see it, and he didn't see it because he looked over it and beyond it, as over and beyond the young Irishman himself. It was not that he had any doubt as to Jim's word being honest to God, or that he questioned Rosie's state of mind as Jim had sketched it. It was rather that he was seeing the Claude, who was a gentleman and a hero and a devil of a fellow, recede into the ether, while he was left eternally with the Claude who remained behind. Jim felt no resentment for the neglect of his proffered hand, but the long stare of those sick, unseeing eyes made him uneasy. Well, I guess I must beat it back to my job, he said, beginning to move away. So long, Claude, and good luck to you. He added, in order to return to a colloquial tone, If you ever want a fern tree, don't forget that we've got some daisies. But Claude was still staring at the great blue blank which the fading of his ideal had left behind it. End of chapter 31Chapter 32 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 32. Twenty four hours after Claude turned to take the way of humiliation down the hill, undeceived by Jim Breen's friendly tone and the hope of future possibilities held out to him, Thor Masterman found himself almost within sight of home. On arriving in the city late in the afternoon, he went to a hotel where he took a room and dined. When he devised the means of letting Lois know that he was camping outside her gates, she might be sufficiently touched to throw them open. She might never love him again, she might never have really loved him at all, but he would content himself with a benevolent toleration. Like her, he was afraid of love. The word meant too much or too little, he was not sure which. It was too explosive. Its dynamic force was at too high a pressure for the calm routine of married life. If Lois could find a substitute for love, he was willing to accept it, giving her his own substitute in return. All he asked was the privilege of seeing her, of being with her, of proving his devotion, of having her once more to share his life. It was not to force this issue, but to play lovingly with the hope in it, that when dusk had deepened into evening, he took the open electric car that would carry him to the village. He had no intention beyond that of enjoying the cool night air 
and loitering for a few minutes in sight of the house that sheltered her. She might be on the balcony outside her room, or beneath the portico of the garden door, so that he should catch the flutter of her dress. That would be enough for him, to-night. He might make it enough for the next night, and the next. After absence and distance, it seemed much. County Street was as he had known it on every warm summer night since he was a boy, and yet conveyed that impression which every summer night conveys, of being the first and only one of its kind. The sky was majestically high and clear and spangled, with the scorpion and the red light of Antares well above the city's amber glow. Along the streets and lanes dim trees rustled faintly, casting gigantic trembling shadows in the circles of the electric lights. The breeze being from the east and south, the tang of sea-salt mingled with the strong, dry scent of new-mown hay and the blended perfumes of a countryside of gardens. All doors were open as he passed along, and so were all windows. On all verandas and porches and steps, faint figures could be discerned, low-voiced for the most part, but sending out an occasional laugh or snatch of song. Thorne knew who the people were. Many of them were friends. To some of them he was related. There were few with whom he hadn't ties antedating birth. It was soothing to him, as he slipped along in the heavy shadow of the elms, to know that they were near. On approaching his father's house, which he expected to find dark, he was astonished to see a light. It was a light like a blurred star on one of the upper floors. From what window it shone he found it difficult to say, the mass of the house being lost in the general obscurity. The strange thing was that it should be there. He passed slowly within the gate and along the few yards of the driveway, pausing from time to time in order to place the quiet beacon in this room or in that, according to the angle from which it seemed to burn. He was not alarmed, he was only curious. It was no furtive light. Though the curtains were closed, it displayed itself boldly in the eyes of the neighbours and of the two or three ornamental constables who made their infrequent rounds in County Street. He could only attribute it to old Mags, who lived in the coachman's cottage at the far end of the property, though as to what old Mags could be doing in the house at this hour in the evening, at a time when the parents were abroad and clawed away on a holiday, he was obliged to be frankly inquisitive. An investigating spirit was further aroused by the fact that in one of his pauses, as he alternately advanced and halted, he was sure he heard a footstep. If it was not a footstep, it was a stirring in the shrubbery, as if something had either moved away or settled into hiding. He was still unalarmed. Night crimes were rare in the village, and relatively harmless even when they were committed. The sound he had heard might have been made by some roving dog, or by a cat or a startled bird. Had it not been for the light, he would have scarcely have noticed it. Taken in conjunction with the light, it suggested someone who had been watching and had slunk away. But even that thought was slightly melodramatic in so well-ordered a community. He went on till he was at the foot of the steps, at a point where he could no longer descry the glow in the upper window, but could perceive through the fanlight over the inner door that, though the lower hall was dark, the electrics were burning somewhere in the interior of the house. He verified this on mounting the steps and peering into the vestibule through the strip of window at the sides of the outer door. Turning the knob tentatively, he was surprised to find it yield. On entering, he stood in the porch and listened, but no sound reached him from within. Taking his bunch of keys from his pocket, he detached his latch key softly, and as softly inserted it in the lock. The door opened noiselessly, showing a light down the stairway from the hall above. He could now hear someone moving, probably on the topmost floor, with an opening and shutting of doors that might have been those of closets, followed by a swishing sound like that of the folding or packing of clothes. He entered, and closed the door with a distinctly audible bang. Listening again, he found that the sound ceased suspiciously. Whoever was there was listening too. It was easy by the light streaming from above to find the button and turn on the electricity in the lower hall, whereupon the movement upstairs began again. Someone came out of a room and peered downward. He himself went to the foot of the stairs, looking up. When the watcher on the third floor spoke at last, it was in a voice he didn't instantly recognise. 
he would have taken it for Claude's, only that it was so frightened and shrill. <coughs> "'Who's there?' "'Who are you?' Thor demanded, in tones that rolled and echoed through the house. There was a long, hesitating silence. Straining his eyes upward, Thor could dimly make out a white face leaning over the highest banister. When the question came at last, it was as if reluctantly and shrinkingly. "'Is that you, Thor?' Thor retreated from the stairs, backing away to the library, of which the door was the nearest open one. He distinctly recorded the words that passed through his mind. He might have uttered them audibly, so indelible was the impression with which they cut themselves in. "'By God, I've got him!' Out of the confused suffering of two months earlier, he heard himself saying, "'I swear to God that if I ever see Claude again, I'll kill him!' He hadn't meant on that occasion deliberately to register a great oath— the oath had registered itself. It was there in the archives of his mind, signed and sealed and waiting for the moment of putting it into execution. He had hardly thought of it since then, and now it urged itself for fulfilment like a vow. It was a vow to cover not merely one offence, but many, all the long years of nameless, unrecorded irritations, ignored but never allayed, culminating in the act by which this man had robbed him, robbed him uselessly, robbed him not to enjoy the spoil, but to fling it away. It was a moment of seeing red, similar to many others in his life. For the instant he could more easily have killed Claude than refrained from doing it. That he should so refrain was a matter of course. Naturally, he still kept a hold on common sense. He would not only refrain, but be civil. If Claude were in need of anything, or were short of cash, he would probably write him a cheque. It was the irony of this kind of rage that it was so impotent. It was impotent and absurd. It might shake him to the foundations of his being, but it would come to nothing in the end. It both relieved and embittered him to foresee this result. From the threshold of the library he called up to Claude, "'Come down!' The tone was imperious. It was even threatening. That degree of menace, at least, he was unable to suppress." Claude's steps could be heard on the stairs. They were slow and clanking, because the carpets were up and the house full of echoes. To Thor's fevered imagination it seemed as if Claude dragged his feet like a man wearing chains, going haltingly and clumsily before some ominous tribunal. The sensation, it was more that than anything else, caused the elder brother to withdraw into the depths of the library, where he turned on a light. The room, with its bare floors, its shrouded furniture, its screened bookcases, its blank pictures swaddled in linen bags, its long, gaunt shadows, and its deadened air, suggested itself horribly and ridiculously as a fitting scene for a crime. He might kill Claude with a blow, and if he turned out the lights and shut the door and stole back to his hotel, no one would ever suspect him as the murderer. The idea would be no more than grotesque, had it not acquired a certain terror from the mingling of affection and anger and pity in his heart, at the sound of Claude's shrinking, clanking advance. In proportion as Claude seemed to be afraid of him, he was the more aware that he was a man to be afraid of. The consciousness caught him to get deeper into the dimly lighted room, taking his stand at the remotest possible spot, with his back to the empty fireplace. But when Claude appeared coatless in the doorway, his head was thrown up defiantly in apparent effort to treat Thor's entrance as unwarranted. "'What the devil are you doing here?' Because of the semi-obscurity, his face was white with a whiteness that quickened Thor's sympathy into self-reproach. "'What are you doing here?' "'That's my business.' In making this reply, Claude seemed to take it for granted that, that they met on terms of hostility, though he added, less aggressively, "'If you want to know, I'm packing up taking the train for New York at one o'clock tonight. Thor endeavoured to speak with casual fraternal interest. What brought you back? Thor took time to light a cigarette, saying, as he blew out the match, You? Me? I thought it might be, might be someone else. Then you thought wrong. He walked to a metal ashtray which helped to keep the covering that protected one of the low bookcases in its place, and deposited the burnt match. He threw off with seeming carelessness as he did so. I know only one traitor to make me keep returning on my tracks. 
because the impulse to violence was so terrific, Thor braced himself against it, standing with his feet planted apart and his hands clenched behind him till the nails dug into the flesh. He could not, however, restrain a scornful little grunt which was meant for laughter. <laughs> you talk of craters. I keep quiet about that, Claude, if I were you. You make it too easy for an opponent. Oh, well, Claude returned airily. I'm used to doing that. I made it infernally easy for an opponent last winter. But then sneaking's always easy to a snake till you get your heel on him. And snarling's easy to a puppy till you've throttled him. And bluster's easy to a fool till you let him see you held him in contempt. As to holding in contempt, two can play at that game, Claude, and you might find the competition dangerous. Claude came nearer, the lighted cigarette between his fingers. Not on your life, that's one thing in which I'm not afraid to bet on myself. He came nearer still, planting himself within a few paces of his brother. His smile, his mirthless, dead man's smile, held Thor's eyes as it had held Lois's a day or two before. He made an effort to speak jauntily. Why, Thor, a volcano can't belch fire as fast as I can spit contempt on you. There, take that! With a rapid twist of the hand, he threw the lighted cigarette into Thor's face, where it struck with a little smarting burn below the eye. Thor held himself in check by clenching his fists more tightly and standing with bowed head. It was a minute or more before he was sufficiently master of himself to loosen the grip with which his fingers dug into one another and put up his hand to brush the spot of ash from his cheek. Being in so great fear of his passions, he felt the necessity for speaking peaceably. "'What did you do that for, Claude? It's beastly silly.' "'Oh, no, it isn't. Not the way I mean it. "'But why should you mean it that way? What have I ever done to you?' "'Good Lord, what haven't you done? You've, you've ruined me!' The chant was so unexpected that Thor looked more amazed than indignant. "'Ruined you?' "'Yes, ruined me. What else did you set out to do when you began your confounded interference?' "'I didn't mean to interfere.' Claude might have posed for some symbolical figure of accusation, as, with hands in his trousers' pockets and classic profile turned in a three-quarter light, he flung his words and directed his glances obliquely and disdainfully at the brother, who glowered with bent head. When you don't mean to go into a thing, you keep out. That was your place. Out! Do you get that? Out! But you're never satisfied till you've made as vile a mess of everyone else's affairs as you've made of your own. Feeling some justice in the charge, Thor began to excuse himself. If I've made a mess of my own, Claude, it's because— Because you can't help it. Oh, I know that. No one can be anything but a damn fool if he's born one. All the more reason, then, why you should keep away from where you're not wanted. By a great effort, Thor managed to speak meekly. How could I keep away when— When you're a rubberneck bred in the bone. No, I suppose you couldn't. But you hate a spy and a liar, even when he can't be anything else. And the worst of it is— Oh, is there anything worse than that? There's this that's worse, that your spying and your lying weren't bad enough till you got me into a fix where I'd have to look like a cad when— the protest in his soul against the role he was compelled to play expressed itself in a little gasp. When I'm... when I'm not one. The older brother found himself unable to resist the opportunity. If you look like a cad, I suppose it's because you've acted like a cad. It's the usual reason. Oh, there's cad and cad. There's a fellow who gets snarled up in the barbed wire because he runs into it. And there's another who deliberately lays the trap for him. The one can afford to crawl away with a grin on his face, while the other lies scratched and bleeding. It seemed to Thor that there was an opening here for a timorous attempt to cry quits. If it comes to the question of suffering, Claude, it, it isn't all on one side. You may be scratched and bleeding, as you say, and yet you can get over it, whereas I'm lamed for life. Ah, oh, don't come the hypocrite. If you're lame for life, as I hope to God you are, it's because you've got a bullet in the leg which is what any one hands out to a poacher. The relatively gentle tone was again the effect of a surprise stimulated to curiosity. When was I ever a poacher? You were a poacher when you went making love to a woman who belonged to another man, while you belonged to another woman. Very well, Thor said quietly, after a minute's thinking. I accept the explanation, but I never did it. 
Then you did something so infernally like it that to deny it is mere quibbling with words. All the same, I insist on making the denial. Claude shrugged his shoulders. Oh, I'm not surprised at that. It's exactly what your type of cur would do. Unfortunately for you, I've the proof. The proof of what? Of your torturing a poor girl into saying she was willing to marry you, and then throwing the words in her teeth. It was from the flame in Thor's eyes that Claude leaped back a half-pace, though he steadied himself against a small table covered up from the accumulation of summer's dust by a piece of common calico. Giving himself time enough to have deliberately counted twenty, Thor subdued the impulse of the muscles, as well as that of speech. "'Who told you that?' he asked at last, in the tone he might have used of some matter of no importance. "'Who do you think?' There's only one person who could have told you. Oh, you admit as much as that, do you? There is a person who could have told me. Yes, I admit as much as that, but you must have misunderstood her. Thor's dignity and self-restraint were not without an effect that might eventually have made for peace, had not the brother's conscience been screaming for a scapegoat on which to lay a portion of his sins. For him alone the entire weight had become intolerable. Thor had been known to accept such vicarious burdens before now. In the hope that he would do so again, Claude answered tauntingly, "'I don't misunderstand her when she said you were making me a cat's paw to do what you wouldn't do yourself. What kind of stuff are you made of, for? You go flaunting your money before a poor little girl who you know can't resist it, and then, when you get her willing to do God knows what, you push her off on me and want to pay me for the job of relieving you of your dirty work.' After you've dragged her in the dust, she's still considered good enough for me. Stop! The roar of the monosyllable echoed through the empty house, while Thor strode forward, the devil in him loose. With the skill of a torador in throwing his cloak into the eyes of an infuriated bull, Claude snatched the calico strip from the table beside which he stood and flung it in Thor's face. The result was to check the latter in his advance, giving Claude time to dart nimbly to the other side of the room. As Thor stared about him, dazed by his rage, he bore out still further the resemblance to a maddened animal in the bullring. Fear struggled in Claude's heart with the lust for retaliation. Like Thor himself, he knew the minute to be one in which he could work off a thousand unpaid scores that had been heaping themselves up since childhood. For the time being, it seemed as if he could not only make the scapegoat bear his sins, but stab him to the heart while he did it. Stop! He laughed shrilly. Like hell I'll stop. Did you stop when you went sneaking after Rosie Fay? Did you got her in a state where she wanted to kill herself? The red glare in Thor's eyes was an incentive to go on. Did you stop when you tried to father your beastly actions off on me and jiggle me into marrying the girl you've had enough of? Did you stop when you fooled Lois Willoughby into thinking you were saint and breaking her heart when she found you out? Look at her now. With the smothered oath, Thor charged as a wounded rhinoceros might charge, in a lunge that would have borne his brother down by sheer force of weight, had not Claude eluded him lightly. Once more Thor shook himself, stupefied by his passion, blinded by the blood in his eyes. He needed an instant to place his victim, who, with his white face and wild, terrified glances, had found temporary shelter behind the barricade of the heavy library table. But before renewing his rush, Thor marched to the door that led to the hall, the only door to the room, locking it and pocketing the key. The muttered, "'By God, I'll have you now!' reached Claude's ears, bringing to his lips a protest which had not burst into words before the huge figure charged again. Behind his fortification, Claude was alert, dancing now this way and now that, as Thor brought his strength to bear on the table to wrench it aside. But by the time that was done, Claude was already elsewhere, overturning tables and chairs in his flight. Behind a sofa, Claude entrenched himself again, a small chair raised above his head as a weapon of defence. Thor sprang on the sofa, only to receive the weight of the chair in his chest, staggering him backward, while Claw bounded off to another refuge. Both were cursing inarticulately, both were panting in broken grunts and sobs. From both the perspiration in that airless room and in the heat of the July night was streaming as rain. The pursuit was like that of a leopard by a lion, the one lithe, agile and desperate, the other heavy, tremendous and sure. In darting from point to point, Claude found himself near a window, where he fumbled with the fastening in the hope of throwing up the sash, 
though wooden shutters defended the outside. Driven from this attempt, he made for the locked door, pulling at it vainly on the chance that it would yield. Seeing Thor bearing down on him with redoubled fury, he obeyed the impulse of the moment and switched off the electricity as he crept swiftly along the wall. In the darkness he stumbled to a corner, where his laboured breathing could not but betray his hiding place. While he crouched in the corner, making himself small, he knew Thor was stalking him by the sound. He was stalking him, and yet in the inky blackness of the room, accurate hunting down was difficult. It was like a duel between blind men. Thor was moving uncertainly, pausing from second to second to fix the object of his search. In the mad hope of reaching the fireplace and creeping into the chimney, Claude wriggled from his corner along the floor, keeping close to the wainscot. As he did so, he touched the legs of a footstool, which suggested its use at once. Controlling the thumping of his heart and the pumping of his lungs as best he could, he got noiselessly to his feet. Inch by inch, slinging the footstool by a leg, he moved toward the spot from which Thor's panting breath seemed to proceed. If he could but batter in that long scowl, he would be acquitted of responsibility on the ground of self-defence. But he was afraid of anything that approached the hand to hand. When it seemed to him that he could vaguely make out the swaying of a figure in the darkness, he hurled the missile with all his might, only to hear it crash into one of the covered pitchers. Claude was disappointed, and yet in the din of the shattering glass he was able to escape again. He had lost all sense of direction. Even his touch on the furniture didn't help him, since everything was now displaced. Nevertheless, he continued to duck and dodge, to wriggle and creep and elude. Once Thor's clutch was actually upon him, but he managed to tear himself free with nothing worse than a long rent in his shirt-sleeve. Again Thor seized him, but only to tear his collar from the stud. A third time Thor's strong fingers were closing round his throat, and yet after a momentary choking groan he had been able to slip away. Never before had Claude supposed himself so strong. There was a minute where he had felt Thor's hot breath snorting in his face, and still was able to pick up a small round table on which his mother sometimes placed her tea tray, sending it hurtling towards his pursuer, checking him again. With a splutter of stifled oaths, Thor grasped the piece of furniture, throwing it violently back. Claude rejoiced as it crashed into a window and loosened the shutters outside. If he only knew which of the windows it was, there might be a chance of his getting out by it. With this possibility before him he took heart again. The sound of the breaking of the window enabling him to fix his whereabouts, he began feeling his way towards the unexpected hope of exit. It became the more urgent to reach it, as he guessed by the fumbling of Thor's hands along the wall that the latter was trying to find the electric button so as to turn on the light. He groped, therefore, between the tables and overturned chairs, getting as far from his enemy as possible. If only his heart wouldn't pound as though about to burst from his body, if only his breath wouldn't wheeze itself out with the gurgle of water through a bottleneck. He couldn't last much longer. He was so nearly spent that if Thor kept up the attack, he must wear him out. In the end, he must let those powerful hands close round his throat, as he had felt them close a few minutes before, while he strangled without further resistance. He felt oddly convinced that it would be by means of strangling that Thor's quiet, awful tenacity of revenge would wreak itself. During these horrible minutes, Thor had the same conviction. All the force of his excited nerves had seemed to be centering in his hands. If he could only tear out that tongue which had hardly ever addressed him except with a sneer since it had begun to lisp. Now that the amazing opportunity was at hand, he wondered how he could have put it off so long— that he should do the thing he was bent on might have been written like a fate. It was like something he had always known, like something toward which he had been always working. The tenderness with which he had yearned over Claude ever since the days when they were children seemed never to have any other end in view. So he stalked his prey while the minutes passed. Five minutes, ten minutes, perhaps more, perhaps less. He had lost all count of time. So he stalked him through the darkness, round and round, over tables and chairs, into corners and out of them. The room was sealed, the house was empty, the grounds were large. They might have been in some subterranean vault. When the right moment came, he would find the button by which to turn on the light, and then... Revulsion came from the fact that he had accidentally put his hand on the button and lit up the spectacle of the room. At sight of it he could have laughed. Nothing but the big library table and one of the heavy armchairs stood on its legs. One of the windows had a gash like a grin on its prim countenance, and one of the pictures sagged drunkenly from its hook, a mere bag of gilded wood and glass. Cowering in a corner, 
Claude was again arming himself with a chair. It was not his weapon, but his whiteness, that stirred Thor to a pity almost hysterical. One of his arms was bare where the shirt-sleeve had been torn from it. One side of his collar sprang loose from where it had been wrested from the stud. His lips were parted in terror, his eyes starting from his head. The thing Thor could have done more easily than anything else would have been to fling himself down and weep. As it was, he could only hold out his hands with a kind of shamed, broken-hearted appeal, saving, Claude, come here. Though his trembling hands dropped the raised chair, Claude shrank more desperately into his corner. When, to reassure him, Thor took a step forward, Claude moved along the wall, with his back to that protection, ready to spring and dodge again. If he understood Thor's advances, he either mistrusted or rejected them. "'Don't be afraid,' Thor tried to say encouragingly, but after the attacks of the past few minutes his voice sounded hollow and unconvincing to himself. In proportion, as he went nearer, Claude sidled away, always keeping his back to the wall, with gasps that were like groans. He spoke but once. "'Open that door!' It was all he could articulate, but it implied a test of the brother's sincerity. Thor accepted it, striding to the threshold, turning the key energetically, and flinging the door wide open. The quiet light burning in the quiet hall produced something in the nature of a shock. He stepped into the hall to wipe his brow and curse himself. He could never win his own pardon for the madness of the past quarter of an hour. Neither probably could he ever win Claude's, though he must go back and make the attempt. What happened as he turned again into the library he could never clearly explain, for the reason that he never clearly knew. The minute remained in his consciousness as one unrelated to the rest of life, with nothing to lead up to it and nothing to follow it. Even the savagery of their mutual onslaught had been no adequate preparation for what now took place so rapidly that the mind was unable to record it. As he re-entered the room, Claude was standing by one of the low bookcases. So much remained in the elder brother's memory as fact. The vision of Claude raising his arm in a quick, vicious movement was a vision and no more, since on Thor's part it was blurred, and then effaced in a sharp, sudden pain accompanied by a blinding light. Of his own act, which must have followed so promptly as to be nearly simultaneous, Thor had no recollection at all. By the time he was able to piece ideas together, Claude was senseless on the floor, while he was bending over him with blood streaming down his face. For the instant the brother was merged in the physician. To bring Claude back to life after the blow that had stunned and felt him was obviously the first thing to be done. Thor worked at the task madly, tearing open the shirt, chafing the hands and the brow, feeling the pulse, listening at the heart. Whether or not there was a response there, he couldn't tell. His own emotion was too overpowering. His fingers on Claude's wrist shook as with a palsy. His ear at Claude's heart was deafened by the pounding of his own. Meanwhile Claude lay limp and still, dead white, with eyes closed and mouth a little open. Thor had seen many a man in a state of syncope, but never one who looked so much like death. Was he dead? Could he be dead? Had the great oath been fulfilled? He worked frantically. Never till that instant had he known what terror was. Never had he beheld so clearly what was in his own soul. As he worked, he seemed to be looking in a mirror from which the passion-ridden fratricide whom he had always recognised dimly within himself was staring out. The physician disappeared again in the brother. "'Oh, God! Oh, God!' he could hear himself breathing the words. But of what use were they? As he knelt and chafed and rubbed and listened, they came out because he couldn't keep them back. And he was accomplishing nothing. Claude was as still and limp as ever. Not a breath, not a sign, not a throb at the pulse. And the minutes going by. He dropped the poor arm that fell lifeless to the side and threw back his head with a groan. "'Oh, God, if you're anywhere, give him back to me!' The broken utterance was the first prayer he had ever uttered in his life. But having said it, he went on with his work again. He went on with new vigour and perhaps a little hope. He fancied he saw a change. It was not much of a change, a little warmth, a little colour, but no more than might have been created by a fancy. He ran for water to the nearest tap. In returning to the library, his foot struck something on the floor. It was the metal ash tray which had helped to keep the covering in place on one of the bookcases, and into which Claude had thrown a match. 
the picture of a few minutes earlier reformed itself, Claude standing just there with the ashtray under his hand, the rapid motion of the arm, the paralysing pain, the dazzling light, and then the blow with which he must have hurled himself on Claude, striking him to the floor. There was no time to coordinate these memories now, or to attend to the wound in his own forehead. The explanation came of its own accord as he touched the ashtray with his foot, while dashing back to Claude's side. The change continued. There were positive signs of life. The mouth had closed. There was the faintest possible quiver of the lips. When he threw a little water into Claude's face, there was the twitching of the muscles and a slight protesting movement of the hand. "'Thank God!' He couldn't note the involuntary expression of his ingratitude, which had nevertheless been audible. Claude had need of air. Taking him in his arms, he lifted him like a baby and staggered to his feet. The body hung loosely over his shoulder as he crossed the room and laid it on the sofa. The broken window served its purpose now, for a little air was coming in by it through the spot where the wooden shutter had given way. Thor succeeded in forcing the shutter altogether, letting the light summer breeze play into the marble face. If he only had a little brandy! He summed up hurriedly the possibilities in the house, coming to the conclusion that nothing of the sort would have been left within reach. Even the telephone had been disconnected for the summer. It would be, however, an easy thing to run to his office. It would be easier still to run to his house, which was nearer. Claude was breathing freely now. He could be safely left for the few minutes which was all he needed to be away. With a simple restorative, the boy would soon be on his feet again. He pushed the sofa closer to the open window, kneeling once more beside it. Yes, the danger was past. Thank God! Thank God! The words were audible again. It was deliverance. It was salvation. There was a positive tinge of colour in the cheeks. The eyes opened wearily and closed again. Thor seized the two cold hands in his own and spoke. "'It's all right, old chap. Just lie still for a minute till I go and get you a taste of brandy. Be back like a shot. Don't move. You'll be all right. Fit as a fiddle when you've had something to brace you up.' No answer came, but Thor sought for none. The worst was past, the danger was averted. With the two cold hands still pressed in his own, he bent forward and kissed the pale lips with a life-giving kiss, such as Elijah gave to the Shunammite woman's son. Under the warmth of the imprint, Claude stirred again as if making a response. He ran, pantingly, like a spent dog, but he ran. He had no idea what time it was. It might have been midnight, it might have been near morning. He was amazed to hear the village clock strike ten, only ten, and he'd lived a lifetime since nine. He rejoiced to see a light in the house. Lois would be up. As he drew near, he saw it was the light streaming from her room to the upper balcony outside it. When nearer still, he caught the faint glimmer of a white dress. She was sitting there in the cool of the night, as they had so often sat together in the spring. He called out as soon as he thought he could make her hear him. Lois! Come down! The white figure remained motionless, so that as he ran he called again, Lois, come down! He could see her rise and peer outward. Still running, he called the third time, Lois, come down! I want something! There was a hurried, Oh, Thor, is it you? After which the figure disappeared in the light from the open window. She met him at the door as he ran up the steps. There was no greeting between them. He had just breath enough to speak. It's Claude. He's down there in the house. He's hurt. I, I want some brandy. He was in the hall by this time, while she followed. His own appearance, now that he was in the light, drew a cry from her. But, Thor, you're all cut and bleeding. He was now in the dining room, fumbling at a drawer of the sideboard. Never mind that now. It doesn't hurt. I'll attend to it by and by. I must get back to Claude. Is it here? No, here. She produced the bottle of cognac from a cupboard, thrusting it into his hands. "'Now come, I'm going with you.' They stopped for no further explanation. That could wait. Thor was out of the house, tearing down the empty street, while she followed scarcely less swiftly. At that time of night they were almost sure to have the roadway to themselves. She lost sight of him as he turned in at the avenue, but continued to press on. That there had been a struggle between the brothers, she could guess, though she let the matter pass without further mental comment. The fact that filled her consciousness was that in some strange way Thor was back, wild-eyed and bleeding. Whatever had happened, he would probably need her now, accepting the substitute for love. 
Halfway up the avenue she saw that both the inner and outer doors of the house were open, and that the electricity from the hall lit up the porch and steps. Thor was still running, but at the foot of the steps he surprised her by coming to a halt instead of leaping up them two or three at a time. Stopping abruptly, silhouetted in the spot of light, he threw his hands above his head as if he had been shot, and was staggering backward. He hadn't been shot because there was no sound. He hadn't even been wounded, because as she sped toward him she could see him stoop, spring away, return, and stoop again. She was about to call out, "'Oh, Thor, what is it?' when on hearing her footsteps he bounded to his feet and ran in her direction. "'Go back!' he cried hoarsely. "'Go back! Go back, Lois! Go back!' But she hurried on. If there was trouble or danger, she must be by his side. He wheeled around again to that over which he had been stooping, but with a repetition of the movement of flinging up the hands. After that he seemed to crawl away, to crawl away till he reached the steps, where, putting himself halfway up, he lay with his face hidden. The thing he had seen was something fatal and final, leaving no more to be done. The thought came to her that if there was no more for him to do, it was probable that her work was just beginning, and that she must keep herself calm and strong. She came to him at last and bent over his long, prostrate form. It was racked and heaving. The sobbing was of a kind she had never heard before, the violent, convulsive sobbing of a man. Raising herself, she looked about for the cause of this grief, for a second or two, seeing nothing. The respite enabled her to renew her sense of the necessity laid upon her to be helpful. Whatever was there, she must neither flinch nor cry out. She must take up the task where he had been forced to lay it down. It was a bare arm from which the shirt-sleeve had been torn away that caught her attention first. A bare arm with a spatter of blood on it. It lay extended along the grass just beside the driveway. She was obliged to take a step or two toward it before seeing that it was Claude's arm, and that he himself was lying on the sward of the lawn with a little trickle of blood from his heart. She was not frightened, she was not even appalled. She understood as readily what she ought to do, as if the accident had been part of every day's routine. But as her glance went first to the dead brother, and then to the living one, she knew that her substitute for love had been found. End of chapter 32《Chapter 33 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 33 When Jasper Fay was tried for the murder of Claude Masterman and acquitted of the charge, it was generally felt that the ends of justice had been served. No human being, whatever his secret opinion, could have desired the further punishment of that little old man whose sufferings might have expiated any possible crime in advance. The jury having found it improbable that at his age, and with his infirmities, he should have been lurking in the village at ten o'clock at night, and waiting in the neighbourhood of Colcourt Jail at dawn of the next morning, the verdict was accepted with relief, not only in the little courthouse of the county town, but by the outside public. To none was this absolution more nearly of the nature of a joy than to the unfortunate young man's family. That was in the winter of 1912, and in the meanwhile Lois had been led so successfully by her substitute for love as to be at times unaware of her lack of the divine original. For she was busy, so it seemed to her, every day of every week and every minute of every day. The first dreadful necessities on that night of the 9th of July having been attended to, her thought flew at once to the father and mother of the dead boy. Thor, dear, I know exactly what I am going to do about them, if you'll let me. It was early morning by the time she said that, and all that was immediately pressing was over. Claude was lying in one of the spare rooms that had been prepared for him, and Dr. Noonan, together with the four or five grave, burly men, Irish-Americans as far as she could judge, who had been in and about the house all night hunting for traces of the crime, had gone away. Those who were still beating the shrubbery and the grounds were not in view from the library windows. Mags and his wife were in the house, as well as Dearlove and Brightston, getting it ready for reoccupation, since it was but seemly that the dread guest who had come under its roof should be decently lodged. Thor, 
having spent some hours before the stupefied village authorities, was surprised and obscurely disappointed not to be put under arrest. Public disgrace would have appeased in a measure the clamour of self-accusation. To be treated with respect, and taken at his word in his account of what had happened between himself and Claude, was like an insult to a martyr's memory. When dismissed to his house, he found it hard to go. Having dragged himself back through the grey morning light, it was to discover strange wonders wrought in the immediate surroundings. Lois and her four assistants had whisked the coverings from the furniture and restored something like an air of life. Even the library, having been sufficiently noted and described, had been set in what was approximately order, the broken picture taken from its nail and the broken window hidden by a curtain. On the threshold of the room, Thor paused, shrinking from a spot which henceforth he must regard as cursed. But Lois insisted, "'Come in, Thor, dear, come in.' She felt it imperative that she should overcome on the instant anything in the way of terrible association. He must counteract remorse. He must not let himself be haunted. She herself sat still, therefore, with the restrained demeanour of one who has seen nothing in the circumstances with which she has not been able to cope. Pale, with dark rings under the eyes betraying the inner effect of the night of stress, she nevertheless carried herself as if equal to confronting developments graver still. The strength she inspired came from rising to the facts as to some tremendous matter of course. Now that there was a lull in the excitement, she had been quietly discussing the conditions with Uncle Sim and Dr. Hilary. The latter went forward as Thor, tall, gaunt, red-eyed, the wound in his forehead staunched with plaster, advanced into the room. "'You are face to face with the great moral test, me dear Thor,' he said, laying his hands on the young man's shoulders. "'But you'll rise to it.' Thor started back, less in indignation than in horror. "'Rise? Me?' "'Yes, you, my dear Thor. You'll climb up on it and get it under your feet. The best use we can make of mistake and calamity is to stand on them and be that much higher up. I don't care what your sin has been or what your self-reproach. Now that they're there, you'll utilise them for your spiritual growth. Neither do I say God help you, for I'm convinced in my soul that he's doing it.' Thor moved uneasily from under the weight of the benedictory hands. It was as part of his rejection of mercy that he muttered, "'I don't know anything about him.' "'Don't you now? Well, that's not so important. He knows all about you. "'It's not what we know about God, but what God knows about us that tells most in the long run.' He passed on into the hall, where he picked up his hat and went out. Uncle Sim, who, with more of Don Quixote in his face than ever, had been pacing up and down the room, threw over his shoulder, "'Always said you were on the side of the angels, Thor, and you are.' Thor found his way wearily to the chimney-piece, where he stood with his face buried in his hands and his back to his two companions. He groaned impatiently. "'Ah, don't talk about angels!' Uncle Sim continued his pacing. "'But I will. How's the time? What, after all, are they but the forces in life that make for the best, and who's ever been on their side more than you?' Thor groaned again. "'What good does that do me now?' This good that when you've been with them, they'll be with you, and don't you forget it. Life doesn't forsake the children who've been trying to serve it, not even when they lose control of themselves for a few minutes and do do what they're sorry for afterward. Thor writhed. I killed Claude. Oh, no, you didn't, Thor, dear, Lois said quietly. It's wrong for you to keep saying so. We can see perfectly well what has happened, can't we, Uncle Sim? If Claude revived while you were away and went out to get more air, and someone, as you think, was lurking in the shrubbery. But if it hadn't been for me, as far as that goes, I might as well say, if it hadn't been for me. I've told you how he came to me two days ago and how I discouraged him. We're all involved, you no more than the rest of us. If he is involved more than the rest of us, Uncle Sim declared, it's all the more reason why the good forces by which he stood should now stand by him. It's a matter of common experience to all who've ever made the test that they do. He turned more directly to Thor. There's a verse in one of those old songs I'm fond of quoting at you. I'll, I'll never trouble you with another, he promised hurriedly, in answer to a movement of protest on his nephew's part, if you'll only listen to this. It's right to the point, and runs this way. 
The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. They're camping round about you now, Thor, as I've always told you they would. Thor raised his head, just enough to say savagely over his shoulder, But when I never have feared him in the way you mean, and don't, Oh, but you have, and do. There's two types for that sort of thing, both sketched in graphic style by the master. There's the two sons sent to work in the vineyard, of whom one said to his father, I go, sir, and went not. The other said, I will not, but went. Whether of them twain, the master asked, to the will of his father. I leave it to yourself, Thor. Unable to escape from his ingenious pardon that caught and blessed him whether he would or no, Thor remained silent, while the uncle addressed himself to the niece. I'll be off now, Lois, but I'll come back before long and bring Amy. We'll stay here. The house will need to have people in it to make it look as if it was lived in, till Archie and Enid can be got at and brought home. They turned and looked from one to the other distressfully. Poor father and mother, what about them? It was then that Lois showed that the matter had already received her attention. Thor, dear, I know exactly what I'm going to do, if you'll let me. She had been so efficient throughout the night that both men listened expectantly while she sketched her plan. She would cable the facts as succinctly as she could put them to her own father and mother, who were in their petit trou par cher on the north coast of France. They would then cross to England and break the news to Mr. and Mrs. Masterman. The very fact of the breach between her parents on the one side and the bereaved couple on the other was an additional reason for charging the former with the errand of mercy. Where so much had been taken, it was the more necessary to rally what remained. Having expressed his approval of these suggestions, Uncle Sim took his departure. "'Where is he?' Thor asked at once. "'Come.' Though she rose, she lingered to say, with a manner purposely kept down to the simplest and most matter-of-fact plain, "'You'll come up to the house and have breakfast, won't you, Thor? It will be ready about eight. As he began to demur on the ground that he couldn't eat, she insisted, "'Oh, but you must. You know that yourself. You'll feel better, too, when you've had a bath. You can't take one here, because Mrs. Maggs hasn't put the towels out. Cousin Amy will attend to that when she comes down.' These and similar maternal counsels having been given and received, she led the way into the hall, only to pause again at the foot of the stairs. "'I shall go out now to send my cablegram to Mamma. The sooner I get it off, the better it will be, so that they can cross from Havre to Southampton to-night. I've got it all thought out and condensed, and I shall write it in French, so as to keep it from the people in her own office here. I suppose that everything will be in the papers by the afternoon, and we shall have to accept the publicity.' Seeing the pain in his face, she took the opportunity to say, "'Oh, we can do that well enough, Thor, dear. We mustn't be afraid of it. We mustn't flinch at anything. Whatever has to come out will get its significance only from the way we bear it. And we can bear it well.' Having advanced a few steps up the stairs, she turned again on the first landing, speaking down toward him as he mounted. "'If possible, I should like to tell Rosie myself. It would be a shock to her, of course.' "'but I want to be with her when she has to meet it. "'Don't you think I ought to be?' "'On his expressing some form of mute agreement, she continued, "'Then if you approve I shall telephone to Jim Breen, "'asking him to bring her to see me. "'Rosie will guess by my sending for her "'that something strange has happened. "'I shall word my message to her in that way.' "'Her last appeal was made to him "'as she stood with one hand on the knob of the door "'beyond which Claude was lying. "'For, dear,' I hope you get at the truth of the things Uncle Sam and Dr. Hillary have been saying. There's a great message to you there. You are on the side of the good things, you know. You always have been, and always will be. He shook his head. It's too late to say that to me now. Oh, no, it isn't. And what's also not too late to say is that you mustn't let yourself be ridden by remorse. His haggard eyes seeming to ask her how he could help it, she continued, "'Remorse is one of the most futile things we know anything about. "'It can't undo the past, while it destroys the present and poisons the future.' "'He was almost indignant. "'But when you've... when you've given way, as you say you gave way last night, "'you brace yourself against doing it again. "'You make it a new starting point. Isn't that it?' 
Yes, but if you're like me... With her free hand she brushed back the shock of dark hair from his forehead. It was the first touch of personal contact between them since his sudden reappearance. If one is like you, Thor, of course it's harder. You're a terrific creature. I begin to see that now. I never took it in before, because in general you're so restrained. I know it's the people who are most restrained who can be swept most terribly by passion, but I hadn't expected it of you. Even so, it's the sort of thing which only goes with something big in the soul. He put up a hand protestingly. Don't! But I must. It ought to be said. You should understand it. Fundamentally, I see it quite plainly now, you're the big primitive creature that's only partially tamed by the tenderest of tender hearts. Do you know what you remind me of? Of a great St. Bernard dog that asks nothing better than to love everyone and save life, but which, when it's roused... You see what I mean, she went on, with a kind of soothing, serious cajolery. Thor, dear, I was never so afraid of you as I've been this night, and I never... Loved, was what she was going to say, but as on the day in the winter woods she suppressed the word for another. I never admired you so much. I'm going to make a confession. What you say you felt toward Claude is what I've often felt myself in... in glimpses. God knows I don't say that to malign him. I shouldn't say it at all if it were not to point out that you wouldn't have done him any more harm, not that when it came to the act, than I myself. Would you now? He hung his head, murmuring brokenly. No. What we've got to see is that you're very human, isn't it? And that's what they mean, Uncle Sim and Dr. Hillary, when they say that you're face to face with a great moral test. They mean that after you've used what, what's happened with in the last few hours, as you can use it, as you can use it, Thor dear, you'll be a far stronger man than you were before, and you were a strong man already. With eyes downcast, he murmured words to the effect that it was difficult to see the way. Won't the way be to take each new thing as it comes? And there are some very hard things still to come, you know. As a step, to climb by, to get it under our feet as something that holds us up, instead of over our heads as something that crushes us down. Won't that be the way? It may be like climbing a calvary, but all the same we shall be there, up, instead of down. And, she added with a smile so faint that it was in her eyes rather than on her lips, and you know, Thor, darling, that no one is ever on a calvary alone. With these words she turned the handle of the door, leading him into a room from which the morning light was only partially excluded, and about which vases and bowls of roses had already been set. Claude was lying naturally, wearing a suit of his own pyjamas, white with a little pink stripe, his face turned slightly, and, as it were, expectantly, toward the two who approached. Having entered the room first, Lois kept to the background, leaving Thor to go to the bedside alone. The difference between the dead Claude and the sleeping one was in the expression. In the sleeping Claude the features were always as if chiselled in marble, and, like marble, cold. The dead Claude's face, on the contrary, radiated that which might have passed for warmth and life. The look was one he would have worn if mystified and pleased by something he was trying to understand. In any other case, Thor would have explained away this phenomenon on grounds purely physiological. But since it was Claude, he found himself swept by an invading wonder. He knew what people more credulous than himself would say. They would say that on the instant of the great change toward which he had been so suddenly impelled, even poor Claude, with his narrow, earthly vision, had been dowered with an increase of perception that bewildered and perhaps rejoiced him. Thor couldn't say this himself, but he could wonder. Was it possible that Claude, with this pleasing, puzzled dawn upon his face, could have entered into phases of life more vivid than any it had left behind? Thor found the question surging within his soul, but before he could silence it with any of his customary answers, he heard the counsel of wise old Hervieu of the Institut Pasteur, but his knee was emotional and not philosophical. Stooping, he kissed once more the lips on which there was this quiver of a new life that almost made them move, and sank on his knees beside the bed. Lois, who knew that beyond any subsequent moment this would be the one of last farewell, 
slipped softly from the room and closed the door behind her. She remembered as she did so that apart from her timid touch on his hair, there had been no greeting between her husband and herself since his cry to her as she sat on the balcony in the darkness. But perhaps the substitute for love didn't call for it. She went downstairs to carry out her intentions of ringing up Jim Breen and sending her cablegram to France. Since the necessity for doing the former would take her to her own house, she would have the chance of changing her dress before the relative publicity of the telegraph office in the square. She would need also to explain the circumstances to her servants, who by this hour would be moving about the house and might be alarmed on finding that her room had not been occupied. The door to the garden portico being that which would probably be unlocked, she turned into Willoughby's Lane, where her attention was caught by the sight of two men coming down the hill. What she saw was a young man helping an older one. The old man leaned heavily on his companion, hobbling with the weariness of one who can barely drag himself along. Lois was seized by sudden faintness, but a saving thought restored her. It was no more than the prompting to give this spent wayfarer a cup of coffee as he passed her door, but it met the instant's need. By a deliberate effort of the will, she banished every suggestion beyond this kindly impulse. If there were graver arguments to urge themselves, they were for others rather than for her. That she was not the only person within eight or ten hours to be startled by the sight of that little old man was abundantly evidenced later. John Stanchfield, Elias Palmer, Harold Ormthwaite, and Nathan Ridge, all farmers or market gardeners of the Colcord district, testified to frights and spooky feelings on being accosted by a dim grey figure plodding along the Colcord Road in the lonely interval between midnight and morning. The dim grey figure seemed to have recognised the different teams by the section of the road through which they jolted, or by their flickering lamps. "'That you, Lias? "'Why, yes. Who be you? "'Darn if it ain't Jasper Fay. "'What under the everlasting canopy be you doing this way so late at night? "'So early in the morning, as you might say. "'My poor boy, to be let out at five. Grunts of sympathy and inquiries concerning the nature of the truck being taken to market made up the rest of the conversation, which ended in a mutual, "'So long.' With John Stanchfield and Harold Ormthwaite, the exchange of salutations had been on similar lines. No one but old Nathan Ridge had had the curiosity to ask, "'What are you tramping the eight mile for? You could have took the train at Marchfield and got out at the jail door.' "'Well, the grace didn't just suit. Marchfield's three miles from my place, and if it comes to tramping three miles, you might as well make it eight. "'Guess you're pretty well I tuck it out, aren't you?' "'Well, I'm some tired. Been taking it easy, though.' Left home about eight o'clock last night and just strolled along. Fact is, Nathan, I had to be out of my little place last night, root and branch, and it's kind of eased my mind, like, to be footing it through the dark. Guess you feel pretty bad, don't you? Well, I did. Don't so much now. Got used to it? No, it ain't that so much. It's just that if I've suffered, others will... But according to Mr. Ridge, further explanation was withheld. The speaker going on disappointingly to say, but guess I'll be keeping along. Hope you get your price on them peas. Awful sight of them in the market off this last dry spell. So Jasper Fay trudged on. He trudged on patiently, with the ease of a man accustomed all his life to plodding through the soil, though now and then he paused. He paused for breath, or for a minute's repose, and sometimes to listen. He listened most frequently to sounds behind him, as if expecting pursuit. He listened to the barking of dogs, the gallop of grazing horses across the dark pastures, or to the occasional bray of a motorist's horn. When nothing happened, he went on again, though with each renewal of the effort his footsteps lagged more wearily. Dawn was grey by the time he had come face to face with the long, grim house of sorrow. It was grim unintentionally, grim in spite of well-meant efforts to cheer it up and make it alluring, at least to the passer-by. For him, Empelopsis had been allowed to clamber over the red brick walls. For him, a fine piece of lawn was kept neatly cut. For him, the national flag floated during daylight over a grotesque pinnacle. For him, a fountain plashed on feast days. Neither fountain, nor flag, nor sward, nor vine was visible except to the outsider, but it was for him the effect was planned. 
For him, too, a little common had been set apart on the other side of the roadway, and garnished with a wooden bench under a noble fan-shaped elm. Jasper Fay sat down on the bench, as he had sat down on it many a time before, hunched and weary. For the three years, or nearly, in which Matt had been shut up here, the father had spent with him as many as possible of the minutes allowed for intercourse, prolonging the sense of communion by sitting and staring at the walls. In times past, he had stared in patient longing for the moment of the boy's release. But this morning, he only stared. Behind the staring, thought was too inactive for either retrospect or forecast, and thought was inactive because both past and future now contained elements too big for the overtaxed mind to deal with. He could only sit wearily and expectantly on the bench, watching, at the end of one of those long wings, a small grey door on which he had been told to keep his eyes. After the first flicker of light the day came slowly. The lowlands around the prison were shrouded in a thin grey mist, through which Lombardy poplars and warders' cottages and prison walls loomed ghostly. When, a few minutes after the clock in the pinnacle had struck five, the grey door opened soundlessly and a shadowy form slipped out. The effect was like that of a departed spirit materialising within human ken. The shadowy form shook hands with someone who remained unseen, and after it had taken a step or two forward, the soundless door shut it out. It looked timorous and lone in the wide, ghostly landscape, advancing a few paces, stopping, searching, advancing again, but uncertainly. As it emerged more fully into view, it disclosed a bundle in the hand, a light grey suit, and a common round straw hat. It moved as though testing ground that might give way beneath it, or as trying the conditions of some new and awesome sphere of existence into which it had suddenly been thrust. With all his remaining forces concentrated into one sharp, eager look, Jasper Fay crept forward. The ground mist blurring his outlines, the two dim figures were face to face before the son perceived his father's presence or approach. On doing so, he started back. "'Why, father, what's the matter? You look—' His voice dropped to faintness. "'You look terrible!' But the father's faculties were already too exhausted to catch the movement and note of dismay. He was drained even of emotion. All he could do was to extend his hand with the casual greeting. "'Well, Matt, how are you? Come to meet you.' He explained, however, the immediate programme, which was to go by the 5.30 train to Marchfield, whence, by taking the short cut through Willoughby's Lane and County Street, they would reach home for breakfast by seven. Home, it had to be told, was no longer the little place on the north bank of the pond, but a three-family house on the Thorley estate, with a back piazza for the yard, and nothing at all in the way of garden. A home without a garden to an old man who had lived in gardens all his life, was more of an irony than a home without a roof-tree. But even this evoked from the sufferer only a mild statement of the fact. Mildness, resigned and apparently satisfied, marked all the turnings of the narrative unfolded as they plodded to the station, while the son took the opportunity to scan at his leisure those changes in the sunken face that had shocked him at the moment of encounter. It was no new tale that Matt heard, but it pieced together the isolated facts made known to him in the few letters he had received and the scattered bits of family news he'd been able to pick up on visiting days. For all of it, he was prepared. He would have been prepared for it even if he had received no hint in advance, since it was nothing but what the weak must expect from the strong and the poor from the rich. "'We'll change all that,' was his only comment, but he made it whenever he found an opening." Only once did he permit himself to go beyond the dogged repetition of this phrase. "'Got in with some fellows there,' he jerked his head backward in the direction from which they had come, "'who've thought the whole business out. Could always get together, as trustees. Internationals, them fellows were. The IIA. Heard of them, haven't you? No bread and treacle in their programme. Been handing out that too long.' The difference between the face Matt Fay had looked forward to seeing and the one which was now turned up to him, was that between a mirror and a pane of glass. In a mirror there would have been reflection and responsiveness. Here there was nothing but a blank, shiny stare, vitreous and unintelligent. Jasper Fay, it seemed to his son, 
have passed into some pitiful and premature stage of dotage. To the released prisoner, the change was but one more determining factor in his own state of mind. He was prepared to find his mother in worse case than his father, and Rosie in worse case still. Poor little Rosie! She was the traditional victim of the rich man's son. So be it. Since it was for him to see that she was avenged, he asked nothing better. The more wrongs there were besides his own, the more he was justified in joining the campaign of blood and fire, of eloquence and dynamite, to which he felt a call. He thought sullenly over these things, as the train jogged through the rich fields and market gardens on the way to Marchfield, and the quiet little man with the glassy stare and the gentle, satisfied, senile smile sat silent in the seat beside him. Matt Fay was glad of the silence. It left him the more free to gaze at the meadows and pastures, at the turnips and carrots and cabbages, of which the dewy glimpses fled by in successive visions of wonder. It was difficult not to believe that the sky had grown bluer, the earth greener, and the whole round of nature more productive during the years in which he had been put away. His surprise in this recognition of the beauty of the world gave a poignant, unexpected blend to his wrath at having been compelled to forfeit it. He got the same effect from every bird and bee and butterfly that crossed his path between Marchfield and the village. No yellowing spray of goldenrod, no blue-eyed ragged robin, but symbolised the blessings of which he had been cheated. In proportion, as the sun broke through the bank of cloud, burning away the mist and drawing jewelled rays from the dewdrops, the new recruit in revolution found his zeal more eager to begin. The very flagging and stumbling of the steps that tottered beside his own intensified his ardour. End of chapter 33「Chapter thirty four of the Side of Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter thirty four. It was more strange than I dare tell you, mother dear, Lois added to the letter of details which she wrote at odd minutes during the day, that that poor old man should have broken down just at our door. There was a kind of fatality in it, as if he had come to throw himself at our feet. The son would have gone on if his father had been able to drag himself another yard, but he wasn't. It was all we could do to get him up the portico steps and into the nearest seat. "'I wonder if you remember him, old Mr. Fay. If so, you wouldn't know him now. I can only compare him to a tree that's been attacked at the roots and shrivels and dries in a season. He seemed to have passed from sixty to ninety in the course of a few months, as if the very principle of life had failed him. It would be pitiful if it wasn't worse. I mean, that we're afraid it may be worse, though that is a matter which as yet I mustn't write about. The sun puzzles me, or rather he would if there was not something in him like all the other fays, desperate and yet attractive, appealing and yet hostile. He looks like his sister, which means that he's handsome, with those extraordinary eyes of the shade of the paler kinds of jade, and a finish to the features quite unusual in a man. The prison shows in his pallor, in his cropped hair, and in something furtive in the glance which, Thor says, will probably pass as he gets used again to freedom. I remember that Dr. Hillary once said of him that he's the stuff out of which they make revolutionaries and anarchists. In that case I should think he might be a valuable addition to the cause, for, as with the rosy, there's a quality in him that wins you at the very moment when you're most repelled. He makes you sorry for him. We're sorry for them all. Even now, with poor Claude lying there, we've no other feeling than that. We've had enough of retaliations and revenges. Nothing could prove their uselessness more thoroughly than what happened here last night. If we could let everything rest where it is, leaving the crime to be its own punishment, God knows we would do it gladly. Later in the day, she continued, I wish you could have seen the meeting between Thor and that poor fellow who has just come out of jail. Thor was superb, so gentle and kind and tender, and all with an air that tragic sorrow has made noble. There are things I cannot tell you about him, that Thor must tell to his father, if they are ever told at all. But this I can say, even now, that if any good is to come out of all this, it will be through Thor more than any one. He 
He doesn't see his way as yet, but he'll find it. He'll find it by the same impulse that made him march up to Matt Fay, putting his hand on his shoulder and looking him in the eyes with a simple man-to-man -man sympathy which no one could resist. The very fact that Thor feels so deeply that he's been to blame, very, very much to blame, gives intensity now to his kindness. As for Matt Fay, he coloured and stammered and shuffled, and though he tried to maintain his bravado, it was without much success. He was still more embarrassed when, after the old man had finished his coffee and was able to move again, Thor ordered Sims to bring round the car and drive the two of them home. We said nothing to them about Claude. I couldn't have borne its being mentioned to them here, or to have been obliged to watch the effect. It would be like having to look on at a vivisection. There are things I don't want to see or to know. All that is really imperative is that, whatever the outcome, they should consider us their friends. The letter was not finished till she was alone that night. She wrote carefully at first, choosing just the right words. Thor is sleeping at the other house, and may continue to do so for some time. He seems to want to be there, as you can understand. Not only does he make it more bearable for Uncle Sim and Cousin Amy, but he gets a kind of assuagement to his grief in being near Claude. You needn't be surprised, therefore, if he remains a little longer, perhaps longer than you might expect. Up to this point she had been cautious, but for a minute something less controlled escaped her. Oh, Mother Darling, I want to be a good wife to Thor, as you've been a good wife to Papa. He needs me, and yet in his inmost heart he is bearing this great trial alone. Don't misunderstand me. I haven't broken down. Perhaps as I could have broken down a little it would have brought me nearer to him. But I'm not near to him. There's the truth. I'm infinitely far away from him. In a sense I'm infinitely below him. For though I've been right in certain matters in which he has been wrong, I feel strangely his inferior. He has things on his conscience for which I know he finds it hard to see the waves of repentance. And I have nothing on mine. Nothing, that is, but a vague discomfort and a sense of not being wholly right. And yet I feel that he's, how shall I put it, that he's the nearer to God of us two. He needs me, and I ought to help him. But it's like helping someone who's on a tower, while I stand on the ground. Oh, Mother Darling, why can't I be to him what you've been to Papa? What is it that men get from women which saves them? Thor needs saving just as much as other men, though you mightn't suppose so. I know you think him perfect, and I used to think the same. But he's not. He has faults, grave ones. I even know that he's weak, where I'm strong that the thing he needs is the thing I can supply, only I don't supply it. Mother dear, you've given it to Papa, or he wouldn't be recovering as he is. Why can't I give it too? He's there in that house, and I'm here in this. His heart is aching for grief, and mine because I don't know how to comfort him. And all because the glimmer of light that leads me on isn't strong enough. It's better than nothing, I don't deny that. I can grope my way by it when I might expect to be utterly bewildered. But, oh, mother dear, it's not love. But having read this page in the morning, she suppressed and destroyed it. After the night's rest, she was more sure of herself. Since she had any clue at all, she felt it wise to possess her soul in patience, and to see to what issue it would lead her. For the passages she withdrew, she substituted, therefore, such an account of Rosie as would put her mother in touch with that portion of Claude's life. "'It's hard to know how the little thing feels just now,' she went on, when the main facts had been given, "'because she's so stunned by dread. "'It's the same dread that oppresses us all, but which is so much more terrible for them. "'For poor little Rosie, the things that have happened are secondary now to what may happen still. "'That almost blots Claude out of her mind. "'Luckily she has a great deal of pluck, of what in our old-fashioned New England phrase was called grit.' That she'll win in the end, and come out at last to a kind of happiness, I haven't the least doubt, especially as she has that fine fellow of Jim Breen to turn to. You remember him, don't you? It's touching to see his tenderness to Rosie, now that she has such a need of him. It's the more touching, because she doesn't give him anything but the most indirect encouragement. He knows perfectly well that whatever he gets from her now will be only her second best. 
but he's grateful even for that. She came to me yesterday morning of her own accord, before I could get word to her. William Sweetapple had heard the news and told her as he passed the house where they had just gone to live in Susan Street. Rosie had been early to the door to take in the milk, and Sweetapple was going by. She flew here at once. I had expected her to be crushed, but she wasn't. As I've just said, she seemed to be looking forward rather than looking back. She was looking forward to what I've hinted at, and dare not say, and setting her face as a flint. That is how I can best describe her. And yet it was as a flint with a wonderful shine on it, as if something had come to her in the way of inner illumination that used not to be in her at all. Jim Breen was fond of saying that this is not the rosy of a year or two ago. And it isn't. It's not even the rosy of the episode with Claude. Her face is now like a lighted lamp, as compared with the time when it was blank. I'm not enough in her confidence to know exactly what has wrought the change, so that I can only guess. It seems to me the same thing that has given the mother a new view of life, only that Rosie has probably come to it by another way. They're strangely alike, those two, each so tense, so strong, so demanding, each broken on the wheel, and each with that something firm and fine in the grain to which the wheel can do no more than impart a higher patina of polishing. They seem to me to bring down into our rather sugary life some of the old, narrow, splendidly austere New England qualities that had almost passed away, and to make them bloom. Bloom, that is, as the portulaca blooms, in a parched soil where any other plant would bake, and yet with an almost painfully vivid brilliancy. Doesn't George Meredith say in one of his books, Is it the egoist, that the light of the soul should burn upward? Well, that's what it seems to do in them, to burn up with a persistent glow, in spite of conditions that might reasonably put it out. The old man is a mystery to me, she wrote later, chiefly because it is so impossible to connect him with any of the things we fear. He seemed so small and shrunken and harmless as he sat on the portico yesterday morning, drinking his coffee and munching a slice of toast, that he appealed to me only as something to be taken care of. That sinister element which I have seen in him of late had gone altogether, leaving nothing but his old, faded, dreamy mildness, contented and appeased. That is the really uncanny thing, that he seems satisfied. He showed no fear of us at all, nor the slightest nervousness, not even when Thor came. Thor was startled to see him there at first, but I managed to whisper a word or two in French, so that he went straight up to Fay and shook hands. I was glad of that. It put us in the right attitude, that of not trying to find a victim, or looking for revenge. Before adding her next paragraph, she weighed its subject matter pensively. It was not necessary to her letter. It was nothing her mother was obliged to know. She decided to say it, however, from an instinct resembling that of self-preservation. If her mother were ever to hear anything. Thor saw Rosie, too. He was coming downstairs from taking a bath just as she was in the hall going away. It was the first time he'd seen her since before we were married. He was so lovely to her. I wish I could tell you. You know he used to be interested in her in the days when her mother was his only patient. It was through him, if you remember, that Rosie and I came to be friends in the first place. He asked me to go and see her, to be nice to her. He feels very strongly that we people of the old, simple American stock should have held together in a way we haven't done, and that we shouldn't have allowed money to dig the abyss between us, which I'm afraid is there now. I know that you personally are not interested in ideals of this kind, and yet Thor wouldn't be the Thor you love unless he had them. So he was lovely with Rosie, holding her hand and looking down at her with those kind eyes of his, and begging her, whatever happened, whatever happened, mind you, to throw everything on him in the way they would do if he was brother to them all. People talk about the brotherhood of man, but there will never be any such thing as the brotherhood of man till more men, and more women too, get the spirit that's in him. Claude had been a week or more in his grave when the letters began to arrive from Mrs. Willoughby. As to our sailing, she wrote from London, everything depends on Ina. 
My pig Abel Rams would have told you that she's better, but not exactly how. She's better mentally, and very sweet. I think it's surprising. Now that the first shock is past, she's calmer, too, and doesn't say so often that she's expected it. Why should you have expected it, I couldn't make out till last night, when Archie told me that there'd been something between Claude and a girl named Fay. I remember those Fays. Queer people they always were. Rather uppish. She was a big, handsome girl when I was a little one. Eliza Grimes was her name, and as long as goes that, she couldn't keep her place. I remember how she came for a while to Aunt Rachel's school, though not for long. Aunt Rachel couldn't draw too exclusively a line at first, but she did drop her in the end. I should never have thought that Claude would take up with a girl like that. Claude, of all people! You can't run counter to class distinctions without making trouble, I always say. And you see how it acts. You and Thor are far too Republican, or too Democratic, or whatever it is. But I never thought that of poor Claude. Not that Archie attributes this dreadful thing to the connection with the Fays. He won't hear of any such suggestion. Ida seems to look on it at first as a retribution. But Archie insists that there never was anything to retribute. There may be two opinions about that, though, mind you. I'm not saying so. To the best of my ability, I'm letting bygones be bygones, as I think I've shown. But Ina certainly thought so at first, and it's my belief she does still. She's told me herself that when they were motoring through Devon and Cornwall, they never reached their destination for the night without her being afraid of a cablegram awaiting their arrival. She was sure something terrible was going to happen, and knew it before they left home. I asked her in that case why in the name of goodness they should have come. But she couldn't answer me. Or rather, she did answer me, just the kind of answer you'd expect from her. It was to get some new things, and she's got them. Lovely some of them are, especially the dinner gowns from Marriott's, but with their money, and where it comes from, it's easy to dress. Retribution, indeed. It must be retribution enough for the poor thing just to look at them. She's already had a woman from Jay's to talk over her mourning. Seems heartless, doesn't it? But then, of course, she must have it. Jay's woman had to take her measurements from the grey travelling suit, for the doctor won't let her get up for another week, not even to be fitted. That will show you how we far we are from sailing, and poor Archie has changed the bookings twice. As for him, I can't tell for the life of me how he feels about being kept here. He's so frightfully the gentleman. I've always said that he wore good manners, not as his natural face, but as a mask, and I feel it now more than ever. It's a mask that hides even his tears, though I'm sure, poor man, they flow fast enough beneath it. All the same, I suspect that he finds it something of a relief to be held up here, for a while at any rate. He wishes he was home, and yet for some reason he's afraid to get there. Terrible as everything is, I know he feels that it will be more terrible still when he's on the spot. It was in a subsequent letter that Mrs. Willoughby wrote. I had to scrawl so hurriedly yesterday to catch the first mail that I couldn't begin at the beginning, or get to the point or anything. I'll try now, though. As for the beginning, it's like going back to the dark ages, it all seems so long ago. Your first cablegram giving us the news arrived at Les Dalles in the middle of the afternoon, and such a scramble as we had to get over to Havre in time for the night boat. I can't tell you how we felt, for it was one of those shocks so awful that you don't feel anything. At least I didn't feel anything, though I can't say the same of your father. He, poor lamb, has felt it terribly, so sensitive as he is, and so easily upset. Well, we managed to get to Havre in time, and had a fair crossing. We reached London about ten in the morning, and of course had no notion of where Archie and Ina were. So we drove to their bankers, and as luck would have it, found they were in London on their way between Cornwall and the North. Once we'd learned that, we came straight to this hotel and sent up our cards. After that we waited. Waited, I should say so. Your father got crosser and crosser, threatening to go away without breaking the news at all. We knew they thought we'd come to make trouble about old scores, and were discussing whether or not to see us. When word came at last that we were to be shown up, your father was in such a state that I had to leave him in the public parlour and go and face it alone. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of being ushered into a room where you could see you weren't wanted. I don't suppose so. I never had it before, and I hope I never shall again. It was one of those chintzy English sitting-rooms with flowers in every corner. I shall never see Shirley Poppies again without thinking of poor Claude. Archie was standing in the middle of the floor, looking more gentleman than ever, but no Ina. 
"'I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Bessie,' he said, with that frigid sympathy of his which to me is always like iced water down the spine. "'Is there anything I can do for you?' We were facing each other with a round table between us. "'No, Archie,' I said, "'I didn't come on my account, but on yours.' I can see him still, the way he stood, with a queer little upward flash of the eyebrows. Indeed? Yes, I had a cablegram yesterday afternoon, from Lois. I gave him time to take that in. We came over at once, Len and I. I had scarcely said this when my heart leaped into my mouth, for Ina cried out from behind the door leading into the bedroom, where I felt sure she was. It's about Claude. It was the strangest sound I ever heard, the kind of sound she might have made if she saw something falling on her that would kill her. Archie stood motionless, but he turned a kind of grey-white. "'Is it?' was all he asked. I waited again, waited long enough to let them see that what I had to tell was grave. "'It is Archie,' I said then. "'Is he?' Archie began, but I saw he couldn't finish. In fact, he didn't need to finish, because Ina cried out again, "'He's dead!' Archie could only question me with his eyes, so that I said, "'I'm sorry to have been the one to bring you the news.' I got no further than that when a kind of strangling moan came from Ina, and a sound as if she was falling. Archie ran into the bedroom, and the first thing I heard was, "'Bessie, for God's sake, come here!' When I got there, Ina was lying in a little tumbled heap beside the couch. She had on a lilac kimono, and could just as well have seen me as not, so I knew that what we had said downstairs had been true." They did want to give us the cold shoulder. Well, you can imagine that it was all over with that. We had everything we could do to bring Ina around and get her on the couch. It took the longest time, and while we were doing it, before she could follow anything we said, Archie asked me what I knew, and I told him. I was glad to be able to do it in just that way, because I could break it up and get it in by pieces, a fact at a time. There was so much for him to do, too, that he couldn't give his whole mind to it, which, which was another mercy. When I could leave Ina, I slipped into the sitting-room, shutting the door behind me, and letting Archie tell her what I had been able to tell him. While he was doing that, I scribbled a little note, saying that Len and I were going to Garland's, where they would find us in case we could do anything more to help them. Without waiting for him to come out of the bedroom, I left the note on the table and went away. In succeeding letters, Mrs. Willoughby told how Archie had come to them at Garland's, had insisted on their returning with him to the hotel in Brook Street, and had installed them in a suite of rooms contiguous to his own. Moreover, he clung to them, begging them not to leave him. It was the most extraordinary turning of the tables Bessie had ever known. He produced the impression of a man not only stunned, but terrified. If the hand that had smitten Claude had been stretched right out of heaven, he could not have seemed more overawed. He was afraid, that was what it amounted to. If Mrs. Willoughby read him aright, the tragic thing affected him like the first trumpet note of doom. It was as if he saw the house he had built with so much calculation beginning to tumble down, laid low by some dread power to which he was holding up his hands. He was holding up his hands not merely in petition, but in propitiation. She was not blind to the fact that there was a measure of propitiation in his boarding and lodging her husband and herself. He clung to them because his desolation needed something that stood for old friendship to cling to. But in addition to that, he had dim visions of the dread power that had smitten Claude looming up behind them and acting somehow on their behalf. "'It's all very well to insist that there's nothing to retribute,' ran a passage in one of the letters. "'But the poor fellow is saying one thing with his lips and another in his soul. What's the play in which the ghosts come back? Is it Hamlet or... Macbeth or one of Ibsen's? Well, it's like that. He's seeing ghosts. He wants us to be on hand because we persuade him that they're not there, that they can't be there, so long as we're all on friendly terms, and that we're not laying up anything against him. The very fact that he pays our bills makes him hope that the ghosts will keep away. We've promised to go back with them, she informed her daughter elsewhere. For one thing, Ina needs me. If I didn't go, she'd have to have a nurse, and I'd rather not leave her till she's safe in your hands. I must say, I can't make her out. She puzzles me more than Archie does. Now that a week has gone by and the first shock is over, she's like a person coming out of a trance. She's so sweet and gentle that it's positively weird. Of course, she's always been sweet, that's her style, but not in this way. Upon my word, I don't know whether she has a soul or not, whether she never had one, or whether one is being born in her. 
But she's patient, and you might even say resigned. There's no question about that. She's not a bit hard to take care of, making little or no demand, and just trying to get up strength enough to sail. She's grieving over Claude, and yet her grief has the touching quality in it that you get from a sweet old tune. I must say I don't understand it. Not in her. It was when she was able to announce that Mrs. Masterman was well enough to sail that Mrs. Willoughby acknowledged the first letters from her daughter. "'We go by the Rauritania on the third. Archie is simply furious at the hints you're all throwing out about that old man Fay. Perfectly preposterous is what he calls them. He seems to think that once he is on the spot he'll be able to show everyone that Fay had no possible reason to want to avenge himself and must therefore be beyond suspicion. I must say Archie doesn't strike me as vindictive, which is another surprise, if one could ever be surprised in a masterman. They're all queer, for as much as any of them, though he's queer in such lovable ways. I mean that you never can tell what freaks they'll take, whether for evil or for good. Nothing would astonish me less than to see Archie himself in sackcloth and ashes one of these days, and I do believe that it's the thing he's afraid of himself. What he's fighting in all this business about Fay is his own impulse to do penance. He's thinking of the figure he'll cut, wearing a shroud and carrying a lighted candle. Of course it interests us, because, well, because it may turn out to be a matter of dollars and cents. Not that I count on it. I put all that behind me, and I must say that your father and I have never been so happy together as during these last few months. We get along perfectly on what we have, and we don't lack for anything. Of course, the way in which your father, the sweet lamb, is improving makes all the difference in the world to me. So Archie needn't repent on our account. We've let all that go. It only strikes me as funny the way he can't do enough for us. Taxes at the door the minute we put our noses out, flowers in the sitting-room, and everything. I know perfectly well what it means. It isn't us. He's simply sacrificing to the hoodoo or the voodoo that he sees behind us just like any other masterman. She added in a postscript, You can read Thor as much or as little of my letters as you choose. I don't care, not a bit. I told him before you were married that I always intended to speak my mind about his father. Like it or lump it, who would? End of chapter 34「Chapter thirty five of the Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter thirty five. The rest of that year became to Archie Masterman a period of popularity and triumph, in so far as such terms could be used of a man so sorely bereaved. Nothing ever sat on him with finer effect than the air of dignity, charity, and sorrow with which he returned from Europe while his stand toward poor old Just Buffet brought him a degree of sympathy new even to one whose personality had been sympathetic at all times. The letter he wrote to Eliza Fay when her husband was put under arrest, dissociating himself from the act of the guardians of the law and protesting his belief in his former tenant's innocence, was conceived in a spirit so noble as to raise the estimate of human nature in the minds of all who knew its contents. Whatever the inner convictions of the much-tried woman to whom it was addressed, the document was too precious to her husband's cause not to be exhibited. "'I wouldn't put it beyond him, not a mite,' Mrs. Fay had confessed, with tragic matter-of-fact. "'Not after the way he's talked, I wouldn't. And Matt don't either.' "'Has your son said so?' "'Oh, he said worse. He said that if he didn't do it, he ought to have. That's the way he talks. Oh, he's no comfort to me. I knew he wouldn't be after that awful place.' "'but I didn't look for him to be quite what he is, "'wanting to kill and blow up everything. "'An IIA is what he calls himself, "'and the Lord only knows what that is. "'I blame myself,' she went on, "'with dry, unrelenting statement of the case. "'I didn't bring him up right. "'I was discontented.' "'Oh, but there's a discontent that's divine,' "'Lois broke in consolingly. "'Well, this wasn't it. "'It was hateful and hating one another, as Paul says. "'I put it into their heads.' I mean, Faye's and the children's. Matt would commit murder now as quick as a kitten'll lap milk. Or well, he says he would. And as for Fay, Lois interrupted hurriedly, we shouldn't do him the injustice of condemning him in advance, should we? The woman held herself erect, her hard, uncompromising eyes, in which there was nevertheless an odd suffusion of softness, looked straight over her companion's head. I can't help what I know. 
and I can't help what I know, which is that you and I have nothing to do with judgment, still less with condemnation. There are others to attend to that, while we try to bring— she uttered the word with diffidence— try to bring love. Oh, love! The tone was that of one who had long ago given up anything so illusory. Then whatever we can find that will take the place of love, Lois replied, with a relief at getting back to ground of which she was more sure. Let us call it goodwill. Goodwill was, in fact, what Reuben Hillary had called it, and it was from him she was quoting. Having gone to him for the analysis of her own state of mind, she had been comforted to learn that she placed no impediment in the way of public justice through being privately merciful. "'The mission of Christ, my dear Mrs. Thor, was salvation. And what do we mean by salvation? Isn't it the state of being saved? And what do we want to be saved from? Isn't it from trouble and evil of all kinds? And where and when do we want to be saved from them? Isn't it right here and right now?' And who are the people that need most to be saved? Isn't it those that are threatened with danger? And who is to save them? Isn't it you and I? What more do you ask? So that when it comes to justice— Ah, now, I'm not bothering about justice. Justice has her sword and her scales. Let her look after her own affairs. What you and I are out after is good will. So Lois got further light upon her way, and followed it. She followed it the more easily, because her father-in-law seemed willing to follow it too. He could do this with a touching grace, since, more fully than by letter, she assured him that Claude had come back to redeem his word. "'Oh, thank God!' Ina had exclaimed, on hearing this information emphasised. "'The darling boy was always the soul of honour. An ethereal vision in black, she was having a cup of tea in the library before going upstairs to take off her travelling dress. Thor, who had met the party at the dock, had accompanied Mr. and Mrs. Willoughby to their own house, so that Lois was able to get a few words with the sorrowing parents alone, giving them in fuller detail that which her letters had only sketched. She had assumed the privilege of the daughter of the house to sit at the tea-table, while for the minute the returned voyagers took their place as guests. There were reasons now why Archie was able to echo his wife's rejoicing in Claude's change of heart. In this new turn to the situation, which he had but imperfectly seized from what had been written, he could get the same kind of consolation that a father draws from the death of a son in a war with which he has no sympathy. It was the death of a brave man, when all was said and done. It was also death in conditions that made his own position the stronger, since it was an aid to the clearing of his conscience. It detracted nothing from his grief that he should use Claude's yearning for redemption as a fresh proof that Jasper Fay had not even a shadowy motive for revenge. And, with the elimination of Fay's motive for revenge, he, Archie Masterman, was more amply acquitted at the bar before which the hereditary Masterman impulse summoned him. Lois had the greater confidence, therefore, in making her appeals. "'If they do imprison him, you see, the family will be left without means. One of these days I think Rosie will marry Jim Breen.' Ina gave a little cry of disapproval. "'What? After Claude?' "'Oh, it won't be for a long time yet, and while this trouble is hanging over her father, "'she won't listen to any suggestion of the kind, little as she would before. "'Still, in the end, it will be only natural.' "'She left Rosie there. "'And Thor's been so good about the son, only, well, the IIA, whatever that is, has got hold of him, "'so that we can't count on him to do anything for the poor mother, if she's left alone, or for Rosie.' "'I'll take care of him. It was probably that Archie Masterman had never in his life said anything that gave him so complete a satisfaction. Before Lois could respond to his generosity, he went on to add, "'I needn't appear in the matter. I'll leave it to your ingenuity to find the way to take care of them without mentioning me at all, unless you think it would be a comfort to them as a sign of my confidence in poor old Fay. That I should have liked to have generally known, but I absolve him entirely.' If she had nothing to do with condemnation in the case of Jasper Fay— she had nothing to do with it, she reminded herself, in that of Archie Masterman. Her part in life was to accept everyone at his nominal face value, for only so could she put good will into effective operation. Tea was over, and they were on their feet when she felt her own need demanding consideration. It was not without nervousness that she said, 
You know Thor has been staying here with a cousin Amy and Uncle Sim? So we understood. Well, I think he might like to stay a little longer. That's not necessary on our account, Masterman said promptly. It wouldn't be on your account, but on his own. That is, she explained, he might think it was on your account, but in reality to feel that he was comforting you would be a comfort to him. Claude's mother gave way to the first little sob since entering the house, while the father's face settled to the stoniness that masked his suffering. Wouldn't it look very queer, was all he said. People might not understand it. Oh, they haven't understood it as it is. But does that matter? I know there's been talk in the village during the past few weeks, but surely we're in a position to ignore it. In the hope of opening up the way for Thor in what he had to make clear, she decided to go further. While speaking, she kept her eyes on Masterman. You may not need him, but he may need you. As a matter of fact, he has still something to explain to you, which I may as well tell you now. On that night, the night of the ninth of July, Thor and Claude were here in the house together. There was trouble between them. Mrs. Masterman gasped. Her husband breathed hard, saying merely, Go on. I don't know what the quarrel was exactly, but but there were blows. Not the blow, Masterman began with horror in his tone. Oh, oh no, not that, Lois interposed hastily, going on to explain briefly the incidents of the struggle between the brothers as far as she knew them. That part of it was all over, she continued eagerly, before either of the parents could comment on this new phase of the event. Claude wasn't much hurt. You can see that from the way he was able to get up and come out into the air, while Thor was running up to our house for brandy. If there hadn't been someone lurking in the shrubbery— He's been a terrible son to me, Masterman broke in wrathfully. When it isn't in one way, it's in another. What have I done to deserve— He is terrible, Lois admitted soothingly. But, oh, Mr. Marsman, he's terrible in such splendid ways. He hasn't found himself yet, but he will if you'll give him time. Whatever he's done wrong, he'll atone for nobly. You'll see. The mother's intervention came to Lois as a new surprise. Whatever he's done wrong, he's sorry for. We can be sure of that. She turned to her husband. Archie, Claude was my son, and I want to tell you now, before we go any further, that no matter what happened between Thor and him, I forgive it if there's anything to forgive. I know Thor feels there was something to forgive, Lois confessed on her husband's behalf, whether there was or not. Then tell him to come to me, Ina commanded, in a tone such as Lois had never heard from her. I'll tell him to go to you if you'll ask him to stay here with you a little longer. I shan't ask him. Archie will, won't you, Archie? She laid her hand on his arm pleadingly. If you do, it will mean that you and I are not trying to judge our two boys or take sides between them. <laughs> Gave a little sob. Now, when it's no use, they quarrelled as brothers will, but they were fond of each other for all that. Thor adored Claude, Lois said simply. I think he cared for him more than anyone in the world that, that I know of. Masterman wheeled suddenly and walked away, while his wife made signs to Lois that they had won. But it was in another frame of mind that Thor's wife said to herself, as she saw him coming toward her along County Street, "'Now I shall see. I shall see if he will.' She meant that now he might return to her, that he might return as a matter of course. If he came of his own accord, something within her would leap to greet him. So much she knew, but beyond it she would not trust herself to go. "'I shall see if he will,' she repeated, with emphasis, throwing the responsibility of taking the first step on him. It was on him she felt that it lay. She had asked him to leave her until she was prepared to call him back, and she was not prepared. If he were to ask to be taken back, her attitude could lawfully be different. Since it was he who had made void the union she had supposed to be based on love, it was for him to suggest another built on whatever they could find as a substitute. Great as her pity for him was, she could not by so much as a glance or a smile relieve him from that necessity. As they drew near each other, she recognised the minute as one that would be decisive, if not for the rest of life, yet for a long time to come. She could look ahead and select the very tree under which they would meet. As a result of the few words that would be then exchanged, 
their lives would blend again, or he would go to the one house and she to the other, and they would be further apart than they had ever been before. He might not think it or see it, because men were so dense, but she would be as quick to read the signs of which he would remain unconscious as a bird to scent a storm. For this very reason she reduced her manner, when they came face to face, to the simplest and most casual. It was a matter of pride with her to exert no influence, to leave him free. Not that she found it necessary to take pains, for she saw from the first minutes of encounter that his mind was far away from that part of their interests which she put first. Into her comments on the wonderful courage displayed by Mr. and Mrs. Masterman, he broke abruptly. "'They've arrested Fay." What came next was as nearly of the nature of a vow as a man could venture on without melodramatic eloquence. All his energies, all his money, all his time, were to be dedicated to securing Fay's acquittal. For Claude's death, one man and one man only was to blame. It was probable enough that Fay had actually struck the blow. It was probable, too, that he had done it not to avenge himself primarily on Claude, but on Claude's father. To Thor, that was secondary, almost of no importance. Had he not allowed himself to become a prey to whatever was most ferocious and malignant in human nature, the crime would never have been committed. Granted that Fay would have lain in wait for Claude in any case, an agile young man would have been more than a match for so enfeebled an antagonist, even when armed with a knife, had not some preceding struggle exhausted him. To Thor it was so clear that he was beyond the reach of argument. He was likewise beyond the reach of anything that would be called a purpose or a wish, but that of seeing that another man shouldn't suffer in his stead. From the region into which this absorption and consecration carried him, Lois found herself and her claims on him thrust out. Whether he went back to her or whether he did not was, for the time being at any rate, of so little moment in his eyes that apparently no thought of this aspect of their situation had occurred to him. It was more stinging to her pride that he should not consider it than that he should consider it and refuse. She was fully aware that her irony was thrown away when she said, in a tone kept down to the matter of fact and colloquial, "'And, Thor, dear, if they ask you to stay on at the other house, don't think of me. I've got Papa and Mamma again. They'll keep me company as long as—' She was obliged to think of an expression that would imply a term. "'As long as I may need them.' In response to these words, he merely nodded. Very well. The assent was given as if, whatever the arrangement, it would be a matter of indifference to them both. So he went his way, and she went hers. Monstrous as it was, monstrous as she found him, as she found herself, she could hardly conceive of their doing anything else. If she was unhappy, her unhappiness lay too deep in subliminal abysses to struggle to the surface of her consciousness. That he should go to the one house, and she to the other, was as right as it had been ten years before. It was so right that she was stupefied by its rightness. It was so right that the rightness acted on her like an opiate. It was a minute in which sheer helplessness might have relaxed her hold on her substitute for love, had she not had such pressing need to make use of it there and then. She made use of it as, on occasions requiring a show of lavishness, People eke out a meagre supply of silver with plenty of plausible electroplate. In installing her parents in their old rooms, in bidding them take their place as masters and forget that they were the guests, she simulated the pleasure not only of a happy daughter, but of a happy wife. While the circumstances of the homecoming tempered anything in the nature of exuberance, they couldn't forbid all joy, and of joy of just the right sparkle she was as prodigal as if her treasure chest had been stocked with it. Moreover, she was sure that except for the protest, if we take these rooms, what are you going to do with Thor? The worthy couple didn't know the difference between what she placed before them and the sterling metal with the hallmark. If there was a suspicion in her mother's mind, it reserved itself till, on kissing them good night, Lois fled to the room she had occupied as a girl. Though she closed the door behind her, the mother pushed it open. Look here, Lois. Bessie said, not quite with anxiety, and yet not quite without it. "'There's nothing between you and Thor, is there?' Lois felt that the form of the question saved her. It enabled her to answer so much more truthfully than her mother knew. "'No, Mamma dear, there's nothing at all between us.' 
She went so far as to make the declaration emphatic and indulge in a tone of faint bitterness. Absolutely nothing at all. And I doubt if there ever will be, now. Though the mother retired before she could catch the concluding syllable, Lois regretted the bitterness as soon as she felt it escape her. There was no bitterness in her substitute for love, for the substitute for love was... She had always admitted that she didn't know what it was. But there came back to her mind the words she had been acting upon for a fortnight and more. The mission of Christ, my dear Mrs. Thor, was salvation. And there was no bitterness in that. End of chapter 35Chapter 36 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 36 Funny thing the way people talk about salvation, Uncle Sim observed to Lois on an evening in the autumn when his legs were extended before her fire. To hear him, you'd think there was no salvation except for sin, and not even for that but what is post mortem. Post mortem salvation may be all very well. "'But if there's anything blessed, I want it right now.' "'Of course, with a good man like you. "'Good? Good's got nothing to do with it. or oh, not much. "'The man who is called the saviour above everyone else "'didn't wait for people to be good before he saved them. "'He saved them first and said, "'Sin no more to them afterward.' "'Oh, but with his extraordinary means. "'He had no means that you haven't got yourself, in essence. The "'Difference between you and him is not in kind, but in degree.' If he could save all men, you and I can at least save one or two, or a dozen, or do something toward it. You mean, save them here? Save them here is saving them anywhere, isn't it? And you don't mean saving them only in the theological sense of saving their souls. Mean saving them anyhow. Save a man from hanging, or a child from tumbling in the mud, or an old woman from having her best bonnet spoiled by rain. It's all salvation. It all meets the human need. It's all part of the same principle. It all works to the same end. And what is the end? The same as the middle, and the same as the beginning, and the same as it is all through. He rose and stretched himself. I leave you to find your own name for it. I call it by a word of four letters, he laughed, and it begins with an L. You can't have too much of it. You know what it is, which is just what many people don't know. She stood before him, colouring, smiling a little, but with eyes lowered. "'I wonder if I know what it is, Uncle Sim.' "'If you don't,' he smiled down at her, "'you're taking a good way to learn.' This view of the principle she was using as a guide was not new to her. It was only illuminating and corroborative. It was spectrum analysis, where she had seen a star. It was the kingdom of heaven reduced from a noble phrase to such terms of simple, kindly living as she knew herself able to fulfil. It was the ideal become practical— and the present rendered one with the eternal, with the fruits of righteousness sown in peace of them that made peace beyond anything she had ever expected. On the winter afternoon when Jasper Fay was acquitted, she could look back over the preceding seven or eight months and see how relatively easy all had been. She said relatively easy, for the reason that much had of necessity been hard. The distinction she made was that what had been hard would have been overwhelming, had she not taken the principle of immediate salvation, where it could be brought about as law. By meeting each minute's lead with the utmost of her strength, she found the next minute's need less terrible. By allowing no one to suffer a shade more, or an instant longer than she could help, she perceived a lessening of the strain all round. With the lessening of the strain it was easier to calm passions and disarm antipathies. If she could say nothing else for her substitute for love, she was obliged to admit that it worked. She was thinking so with a great thankfulness when Thor came to tell her of the rendering of the verdict. Though he had telephoned the fact, he was eager to give her the details face to face. He did this while they stood in the tapestried square hall, avoiding each other's eyes. It had not been picturesque, he explained to her, but it had been satisfactory. Though an hour had sufficed the jury to reach their decision, the farmers and market gardeners who had formed the mass of the spectators had forestalled it and scattered to their homes. The dramatic interest was over. It was generally felt that no more than a formality remained. 
When, for the last time, Jasper Fay was led in to confront his peers, it was before a comparatively empty court. Because he had suddenly become self-conscious, Thor went on with his account stammeringly and with curious hesitations. Still wearing his fur motoring coat, he held his cap in his hand like a man in a hurry to get away. "'I couldn't see even then, at the very end, that, that the old fellow knew what it was all about. He looked round him with the same glassy stare that he's had ever since, ever since that morning when we gave him the coffee. Mind all gone, poor old chap. Perhaps it's just as well.' He smiled a bit when it was all over, and they pushed him from one group to another to shake his hand, but he didn't realise what he had escaped. Lois, too, was self-conscious. In this lifting of the burden from Thor's mind, something had changed in their mutual relation. It was as if a faculty arrested on the night Claude died had suddenly resumed its function, taking them by surprise. Not in this way had she expected the thing that seemed dead to come to life again, so that she was unprepared for the signs of its rebirth. Absorbed as she would otherwise have been in Thor's narration, she could now follow him but absently. "'How did they get home from Colcord?' She asked the question to keep him going, lest he should say the thing she was so strangely afraid to hear. He answered like a man who talks about what is not his mind, in order to conceal what is. "'I drove them in. The old fellow sat in the tonneau with Rosie and Jim Breen.' Matt Fay refused the lift and took the train to Marchfield. A little crowd at the courthouse door, he recounted further, had called, Three cheers for Dr. Thor! Another little crowd had greeted them with a similar welcome on their arrival in Susan Street. A third had gathered in the grounds of Thor's father's house, shouting, Three cheers for Mr. Masterman! till the object of this goodwill responded by coming out to the porch and making a brief, kindly speech. He was delivering it as Thor drove up, just as the winter twilight necessitated the turning on of the electric lights, his slender, well-dressed figure distinct in the illuminated doorway. Thor could hear the strains of, for he's a jolly good fellow, as, to avoid further demonstration, he backed his machine from the avenue and turned toward the other house. She seized the opportunity to say something she had at heart, which would also help to tide over a minute she found so embarrassing. "'Oh, Thor, I hope you'll not have to suffer any more. "'He's paid his penalty by this time.' "'You mean... "'I mean that I hope you'll never have to be any more definite with himself "'than he's been already. "'You can easily see how it is with him. "'It's as if he was two men, one accusing and the other defending. "'I don't want to have the defence break down altogether, "'or to see him driven to the wall. "'I couldn't bear it.' "'He waited a long minute before speaking. "'If you're thinking of the real responsibility for Claude's death,' She nodded. Yes, I am. Again he waited. He puts that on me. He puts it on you so as not to take it on himself, she said quickly, because to take it on himself would be beyond human nature to bear. Don't you see, Thor? We know, and he knows, that if Jasper Fay did it, it was not to avenge himself on Claude, but on someone else. But now that the law says that Fay didn't do it... He interrupted quietly. "'I've talked it out with father, and we understand each other perfectly. "'You needn't be afraid on his account. "'I've taken everything on myself, as I ought to take it.' "'Oh, Thor! "'The only thing that matters about the law is that it shouldn't condemn anyone but me. "'Now that that danger is out of the way, I can begin.' "'She forgot her embarrassment in looking up at him with streaming eyes. "'Begin how, Thor?' "'Begin doing what you told me from the first, begin to start again, to, to get it under my feet, to, to stand on it, to, to be that much higher up, and not be—' He fumbled with his cap, his head hung guiltily. "'Not be ridden by remorse, any more than, than I can help.' "'You'll do it, Thor. You'll do it nobly.' What she had to say, however, got no further, for the front door was flung open to allow of Mrs. Willoughby's excited entrance, with Len puffing heavily behind her. "'Oh, so you're here, Thor!' Bessie cried in the tone of a woman at the limit of her strength. "'Well, I'm glad. You, you may as well know it first as last.' Breathless, she dropped into one of the hall chairs, endeavouring to get air by agitating an enormous pillow muff. "'Len's been having—' "'No, it's too extraordinary, and I predicted it, didn't I? "'If you've kept my letters, you've got it down in black and white. "'Len's been having—' "'Just as I said, it's the shroud and the lighted candle. "'Len's been having the strangest, the very strangest talk with Archie.' Lois crept near to her mother, bending down toward her. 
"'But, dear mother, what about?' Bessie answered wildly. "'Oh, I don't know what about. I wasn't there. I was in the drawing-room with Ina. I knew something was going on from Ina's manner. What's come over Ina I can't imagine. I've heard of trial turning human beings into angels, but I never believed it, and I can hardly believe it now. Archie began it himself, I mean with your father. He beckoned him into the library in the solemnest way. That was after he'd finished his speech and the crowd had stopped cheering. If it is the shroud and the taper— "'Well, all I can say is that he carries them off just in the way you would expect. "'No one could do it better, as far as that goes.' "'As far as what goes, mother, I wish you'd tell us. "'It's exactly what I said when I wrote to you from London last year. "'If you kept my letters, you've got it all down in black and white. "'He wants us, and Ina wants us, all to come to dinner. "'I'm not a bit surprised, not a bit, though I never counted on it, never.' "'Thor also bent over, standing before her, "'with his hand stretched out to the back of her chair.' "'Is it about money, Mrs. Willoughby?' "'But she was too far beyond coherence to explain. "'He says he wants to talk to us both after dinner, to Len and me. "'He's been going over the accounts again. "'He finds... he finds... "'But she beat with her high heels on the floor "'and buried her face in her muff. "'Oh, t tell them, Len, for goodness' sake, tell them "'that they'll never believe it, not any more than me!' "'But her emotion was too much for the big man's shattered nerves. "'As he stood just within the doorway... "'looking with his snowy beard and bushy white hair "'like some spectral, aureoled apostle, "'he began to cry. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 37 Thor and Lois were glad of this interruption, they were glad of the new and exciting topic. They were glad of the family dinner at the other house, where they could be together and yet apart. Taking refuge from each other in any society they could find, they kept close to Mrs. Masterman when, after dinner, Thor's father retained his two old friends in the dining-room for the promised explanations. Later in the evening it was with an emotion like alarm that Lois heard that her parents had gone home without waiting to bear her company. Secretly, she began to plan methods for stealing away alone. Her shyness of Thor was like nothing she had known in the days of courtship and marriage, or during the months in which they had been holding off from each other for scrutiny and reflection. It was a shyness which, when they were at last side by side in the avenue, drove her to effect an over-elaboration of ease. She talked, not merely because there were so many things to say, but also for the sake of talking. She talked because he did not, because he towered above her in the moonlight, dumb, mysterious, waiting. It was that sense of his waiting that thrilled and terrified her most. It was a large waiting, patient and deep, the waiting for something predestined and inevitable that could take its time. It was like the waiting of the ocean for the streams, of sleep for the day's activities, or of death for all. It seemed to brood over her like the violet sky, and to quiver with radiance as the crisp air quivered with the moonlight. It was wide and restful and bracing. She was walking toward it, she was walking into it, as she walked over this virginal carpet of snow. She talked with a kind of desperation, of Thor's father and mother, first of all, of how good they were, each with a special variety of goodness. It was wonderful what sorrow had done for Mrs. Masterman, "'I never see her now, Thor, dear, without thinking of that look in Claude's face "'that seemed to us like dawn. "'I see it in her, don't you?' "'Without waiting for an answer, she hurried on. "'And your father, Thor, he is good. "'No one but a good man could have been so noble toward poor old Fay, "'when he knows, when everyone knows, "'no matter what was proved or wasn't proved in court, "'when he knows the truth.' "'She seemed to be answering some unspoken argument on his side,' as she continued. "'Oh, yes, I remember what Mamma wrote about it, about the hoodoo or the voodoo. Mamma's so amusing. But you and I have nothing to do with that, have we, Thor? We can only take what we see and judge by what is best. And so with this wonderful new thing for Papa and Mamma, that they're to have some of their money back, we can't go behind it, can we? If he says it was a mistake, we must accept it as that and never, never let any other thought come into our minds.' I know that Papa and Mamma, dear, innocent things, 
They are dear and innocent, you know, in spite of everything. I know they'll only be too glad to take it in the same way. Except for an occasional word, he had hardly spoken by the time he had reached the corner of Willoughby's Lane and County Street. Lois had a renewal of the terror from which her own conversation had distracted her. The crucial minute was at hand. The door was but a few yards away. He would either go in with her, or he would go back. She hardly knew which would be the more insupportable, the joy or the dismay. She caught at the first possibility of postponing both. "'Oh, it's so lovely. Let us walk on a little farther. It isn't half-past nine yet. I looked at the clock as we were coming out. Papa and Mamma ran off so early. Don't you adore these windless winter nights, when the air is as if it had been distilled?' She paused in the middle of the road and looked around. "'What's that star, Thor, over there, the one like a great white diamond?' He told her it was serious, adding that its light took eight years to travel to the earth, and going on to trace with his finger the constellation of the dog. The minutes return to the old habits took some of the feverishness from her sense of tension as they continued their walk up the hill. Up the hill there were only two directions in which to go, along the prosaic road to Marchfield, or into the quiet winter woods, where masses of shadow lay interspersed with patches of white moonlight, while on this soundless night there was not a murmur in the treetops. By instinct, rather than intention, they followed a faint, familiar path running under pines. Lois was now speaking of the Fays. "'Mrs. Fay knows. The others don't. Not certainly. Rosie has brought herself round to thinking him innocent, and Matt and Jim only suspect what happened. But Mrs. Fay knows. It must be a tragic thing to spend your life with a man who's done a thing like that. Poor soul. We must do what we can to help her, mustn't we?' She pursued the theme, not for its interest alone, but for the sake of the objective point to which it was leading her. By speaking freely, first of Matt and then of Jim Breen, she came at last to Rosie. She spoke freely of her, too, at the risk of opening up old wounds, at the risk of lacerating that which was probably still sensitive. Her main purpose was to speak, and if possible to make him speak, so that this name should no longer be kept as an inviolable symbol between them. Since the day when it had begun to have significances for them both, it had scarcely been pronounced by either, otherwise than elusively, or of necessity. She was resolute to make it as little to be shunned as his or her own. Not that she was successful, for the minute at any rate. His responses continued to be brief, so brief that they were hardly responses at all. They were not grudged or ungracious, they were only like those first little flashes of lightning which hint that the heavens will soon be alive. As a frightened boy whistles from bravado, she talked to conceal her trembling at this coming of celestial wonders. "'Oh, Thor, there'll be so much now to do. It's really only beginning, isn't it? And it brings in so many elements of our life, I mean, of our whole national life. I like that. I like getting out of our own little groove, so futile and narrow as it generally is, and being in touch with what is stronger, even if it's terrific. That's what I feel about Matt Fay, that he's terrific. He represents a terrific movement, doesn't he, and one we can't ignore. When I say terrific, I don't mean that I'm afraid of it, I'm not. It seems to me too strengthening to be afraid of. With all you can say against it, it strikes me as a tonic in our rather flaccid life, like iron in the blood. I've sympathy with it, too, to some extent. I've sympathy with him. You know, I do belong to the people. I'm glad we know him, and that in a way we've a right to get near to him. It puts us in touch with our own national realities, as perhaps otherwise we shouldn't be. Oh, Thor, there's so much to work out. Isn't it a splendid thing that we can help even to the slightest degree in doing it? To this there was no response whatever. She was not sure that he had listened. Beside her the tall form strode on, dumb and dark, crunching the frozen snow with a creaking sound that roused the winged and furry things of the wood and silenced her half-hysterical efforts to fight against that which awaited her like a glory or a doom. Growing suddenly aware of the uselessness of speaking, she said no more. After an interval in which her mind seemed to stop working, that of which she became conscious next was a world of extraordinary purity. Nothing was ever so white as this snow or this moonlight, 
Nothing was ever so like the ether beyond the atmosphere as this air. Nothing was ever so golden as the stars in this purple sky, or so mystically solemn as these pines. As they climbed upward, it was like mounting into some crystal sphere, where evil was not an element. They came out on that spot in which all the wood paths converged, that treeless ridge that rose like a great white altar. It was an end which neither had foreseen, when a half-hour earlier they had prolonged their walk, otherwise they might have shrunk from it. As it was, the association of the past with the present startled them, startled them into pausing long enough to become conscious, to seeing each in the eyes of the other such things as could not pass into words, before renewing the ascent. As they continued the way upward, it was as if in fulfilment of some symbolic ceremonial. They had stood for some minutes silent on the summit, looking out over the wide, white radiance at their feet, when Thor spoke. "'I'm not thinking about the things you've been talking of. I'm not primarily interested in them any more.' "'You mean?' "'I mean the helping of others, in the way I've tried it. I see the mistake in that.' She was faintly surprised. Indeed. Through the things that have been happening, I've worked out, I'm, I may say I've stumbled out, to a great truth. There was not any surprise in her tone, but curiosity. Yes, Thor, dear, what is it? It's that a man's first occupation is not with others, but with himself. It's not to put them right, it's to be right on his own account. As for the moment she was too disconcerted to comment on this, he continued, "'If reaching this conclusion seems to you like discovering the obvious, I can only say that it hasn't been obvious to me. It's just beginning to come to me that I was so busy casting out other people's devils that I've forgotten all about my own.' "'You've been so generous in all you've thought about other people, Thor.' He interrupted with decision. "'The most effective way in which to be generous to other people is to be strict with oneself. But it never occurred to me till lately. I've been so eager that my neighbour's garden should be trim and productive that mine has been overrun with weeds. Against this self-condemnation she felt it her duty to protest. But Uncle Sim says you've always been on the side of the— Yes, I know, he broke in, with what was nearly a laugh. But it's just where the dear old fellow has been wrong about me. I've wanted everyone else to be there, on the side of the good things, I admit that, but I was to have plenty of rope. Now I'm coming to understand, and it's taken all this trouble to drive it home to my stupidity, that if I want to see anyone else on the side of the angels, I must get there first. That's where the axe must go, to the root of the tree. In the main, other people will take care of themselves if I take care of myself, and I'm going to try." She was hurt on his behalf. "'Oh, Thor, please don't say such things when you're so—so so noble. "'I'm only saying them, Lois, to show you that I see what's been wrong with me from the start. "'You've tried to say it yourself at times, only I couldn't take it in. "'Do you remember the day in my office when you came to tell me that—' "'He nerved himself to approach the subject with the simple directness he knew she desired. "'That Rosie had—' "'She hastened to come to his aid.' "'Yes, but I didn't mean it in just that way.' "'No, but I do. "'I mean it because I can look back and trace it "'as the cause of all our disasters from— "'Oh, Thor!' she pleaded. "'He went on steadily. "'From the way in which I asked you to marry me "'right up to what, to what happened about Claude.' "'He was obliged to, to draw a long, hard breath "'before saying more. "'I was so determined that everyone else should be right "'that I didn't care how wrong I was.' which is like handing out water from a poisoned well. She wished she could touch him or slip her hand into his by way of comfort, but the distance between them was still too great. She could only say, "'That's putting it unjustly to yourself, Thor. "'If you made mistakes, they've been splendid ones. "'They've been finer than the ways in which most of us have been right.' She thought he smiled. Oh, I don't ask to be defended or explained. I only want to say that from tonight onward I shall be starting on a new plan of life. I shall be working from the inside and not from the outside. If I'm to do anything in this world, something must first be accomplished in me, and I've got to begin. He 
he turned from his contemplation of the dim white landscape to look down at her. "'Will you help me? Will you show me how?' It seemed to her that without having moved she was somehow nearer to his breast. She couldn't so much as glance up at him, she could hardly speak. The words only trembled out as she said, "'If I can, for dear?' "'You can,' he said simply, "'because you know.' She barely lifted her eyes. "'Oh, do you think I do?' "'You've got the secret of it. There is a secret. I see that now, a secret, just as there is to everything else that's worth learning.' "'Oh, for you make me afraid. Through all these dreadful months,' he pursued tranquilly, "'you've kept us straight, and led us out, and raised us higher. Not because you're specially strong, Lois, or specially wise, but because—because because you've got some other quality.' I want you to show me what it is, so that I may have it, too. If I could get it, just a little of it, it would seem as if Claude hadn't hadn't died in vain. She was now so near his breast that he was obliged to bend his head in order to speak down to her. You wrote me last year that you were looking for a substitute for love. Couldn't you find it in that? She was so close to him that her cheek brushed the fur collar of his coat, yet she managed to keep her mind clear and to control her voice so as to ask the thing she most vitally needed to know. And if I did, Thor, if I could, what should you find it in? In adoration, for one thing, he said simply. It was such happiness that she tore herself away from it. Advancing swiftly over the light snow to a higher point of the summit, she stood for a minute poised alone against the dark sky, crowned to his eyes with a diadem of stars. Very slowly he strode after her, but even when he reached her side it was only to slip his hand into hers and gaze outward with her into the far, dim, restful spaces. It was she who spoke at last, timidly and against rising tears. "'Shall we go home, Thor?' "'I'm at home.' he said quietly. But the quietness gave way suddenly to fierceness, as little lightning flashes yield in a few seconds to the violent magnificence of storm. Seizing her in his arms with a clasp that would have been brutal if it had not been so sweet, he whispered, "'You're home to me, Lois. You're home to me. "'And you're the whole wide world to me, Thor, dear,' she answered, drawing his face downward. End of chapter 37 End of The Side of the Angels by Basil King